first place, taking the whole point of the exercise away from what your client needs from you. And the last point on here is sampling. So if you think about M&A due diligence, which is where Luminance started out, the practice of M&A due diligence has changed radically in the last 25 years. There's just too much documentation for a group of lawyers to review. So you take a small sample and then make a massive assumption that all of the risk and all of the opportunity that's represented by that organization can be found within that sample, which clearly is counterintuitive. So what we're doing is really taking the whole legal thought process and going back to basics and really thinking about why are you here? Why do we have lawyers? What are they here to do? What does the client need? And how can the technology work with the lawyer to deliver on those needs in a much more rigorous and confident way than ever before? So when we talk about Luminance and we talk about Luminance being a useful piece of technology and how you decide whether this is the right technology for you, we don't talk about accuracy scores. And this is kind of controversial. Um, and we get into arguments about this all the time. The reason I don't like to talk about accuracy scores is because I think as a lawyer, the moment that you're dealing in accuracy scores and you're telling your client, I'm using technology which gives me 95%, 98%, 98%, 99% accuracy, the first thing that goes through their mind is what about the 1%? <laughs> the second thing I think which has kind of become buried over the years is that tells me that you're relinquishing control to the machine. You're asking the machine to do the job and you're trusting that the machine is right. And that percentage accuracy score is based on what? It's what the vendor's told you. The vendor's told you that that's 95% accurate. How does the vendor know? What we see all the time with Luminance is within one firm, and we work with some very prestigious law firms, within one firm, one lawyer will label some data within a set as one thing, and another lawyer will contradict them. Because it's opinion, it's judgment. What you're paying for as a client is the trusted advisor. You want your lawyer to give you the best advice that they can give based on the evidence that's in front of them. The moment you start to talk about an accuracy score, what you're actually getting is some vendor's interpretation of what those contracts mean filtered through your lawyer and them essentially telling you, well, this is 99% accurate, so there's a risk that the 1% isn't right. So what we talk about with Luminance is we'll make you faster. We'll make you faster from day one. We've measured ever since 2016. We've found every time any law firm uses Luminance for the first time, they're 100% faster on day one. And then the more that you work with Luminance, the more it learns from you how you treat your contracts. And then that accelerates to 85%, 95% as you go forward. That's, those speed improvements are no good without confidence. There's no point saying, I'm a fast lawyer. Nobody wants a fast lawyer. If you're getting those accelerations in speed and you have at least the same level of confidence in the advice that you're giving that you would do any other way, you've lost nothing. And your client has much more confidence in the advice that you could give because you've been able to look at a much more complete picture. So in order to understand how Luminance works, you really need to see it in action. And Freddie and Marcus will be on the stand outside all day today. So please go and see them and get them to give you a demo. I'm not going to do one now, so we won't have time. Um, but basically what Luminance does is you upload your documentation, Luminance finds the patterns in the language, regardless of what language that is, and then clusters in multiple different dimensions, an infinite number of dimensions actually. So at the document level, at the clause level, at, you know, at the sentence level, finding all of the patterns in language, comparing them, piling them up. These look like this, these look like this, these are a bit different over here, without knowing necessarily what they mean at that point. When the lawyer starts to interact with those contracts, that gets really powerful because, as you can imagine, if you're looking at a set of 250,000 documents and you look at one that's problematic and Luminance already knows that that language exists across the data set in various different forms in various different ways, that explains the acceleration that you get in the review that you do and the increased confidence that you have in that review. As you then label that data to interpret it in the way that's meaningful for you, Luminance learns from that and then applies that learning in future to every data set that you show it in future, which is why that process accelerates as time goes on. Uh, we can prove this. Um, we can do a two-week pilot. We do this for free. This upsets a lot of other technology vendors because they can't do it. They've been quite vocal about that. The reason we're able to do that is because this is too, true machine learning. There is no setup time. There is no configuration. So the fact that we can do that really demonstrates to you the value that you'd get once you're live. I just want to give you, though, the real-life case studies because I think it's all very well me telling you all of this, but actually increasingly our customers are coming out and telling these stories for themselves. So let's take, first of all, this case study here. Um, group of lawyers in Germany. 
they are part of a firm who have practices all around the world and they started to review this huge set of employment documentation manually. They got about 10% of the way through, it took them 900 hours, they weren't comfortable with sampling, they felt the risks were too great, and so they started to worry about the resources that they had available on the project, at which point the London office stepped up and said, um, you do realise we have an app for that, don't you? <laughs> and they said, but these are German documents, surely Luminance only knows English? And we said, no, it's fine, you can put your German documents into Luminance. So, Having, this was a very helpful comparison, because having done 10% of the documents that way, they then put the documents into Luminance and started to work with them. At that point, Luminance had no idea what any of the concepts in these documents meant. But actually, cut a long story short, it got very interesting as we went through this process. They ended up reviewing all of the documents, 100% of the documents. They accelerated from get, getting through, thank you, from getting through something like 70 documents a day manually to getting through thousands of documents. I think one of the lawyers measured 3,600 documents a day once they started to apply machine learning because Luminance was identifying all the things that are the same. So you're right, all of these are the same, fine, so I know what those mean. It's a very simple concept. It's very difficult to deliver, deliver technically. Um, but actually for you, as a user of the technology, it's there instantly, straight away. And I like the fact that the opportunity for that law firm is not to get rid of all the lawyers. The opportunity for that law firm is to take on more work and do it more rigorously and stop sampling. A slightly different take on this, this was a London law firm. Um, so really looking at a high stakes M&A due diligence exercise where their client was buying a competitor. So actually, the data room, super aggressive timescales. The data room was opened at something like midnight. They had a couple of days of time left to look at the data. Two very senior people who really understood their client's business looking at that data. As they started to sift through that, that information, they identified that actually a much smaller proportion of their cus the customers of this competitor had um, auto renewal in their contract than had been originally assumed. The entire basis of business case for buying that, that, that competitor was that you would be able to keep those customers in the long term. So effectively it killed the deal before lunchtime. It took them only a couple of hours to realise that actually this wasn't viable at all. So is that a good outcome? And I think uh, here you've got a law firm who typically charges by the hour, doing a lot less hours of work for their client but achieving an outcome that actually not only saves them a lot of money in the short term, but saves them the in monumental hassle of buying an organization accidentally that you find out in a year's time doesn't have any customers left. And, you know, that is the outcome. This is what I talk about going back to first principles. This is what you need from your trusted advisor as a client of a law firm, and Luminance will enable you to deliver that in a much more meaningful way. So, uh, we started out with M&A due diligence in 2016. We now have a number of different propositions. Excitingly, at Clock a couple of weeks ago, we unveiled our in-house proposition, so contract negotiation. Um, so your in-house legal teams might be interested in that. Uh, please have a word with Marcus and Freddie on the stand if you want to see how any of these propositions work in anger. Um, and that's us. So uh, we only just got started. This is really the beginning of our journey. Um, we are expecting to deal with a much larger addressable market over the next few years. And I think my prediction for AI and law, I think pretty much um, as you were describing earlier, is that using AI and using machine learning to understand legal language is just going to become very normal very, very quickly. I think we're already getting to that point. Um, you wouldn't hire an accountant who said that they weren't going to use Excel because they preferred to use a pencil and a piece of paper. On the other hand, you wouldn't make that accountant and take that accountant and re replace them with Excel. You still need that expert, you need that trusted advisor, but they need to be using the best possible technology to support them in the work that they're doing. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think your productivity point about Excel is that, that's the killer point, isn't it? You know, human society has not progressed by smashing up spinning jennies and refusing to use calculators instead of pens and paper and AI and other technologies should be no different. Um, we can continue the discussion now. Um, Mark Collins, are you with us? Mark was uh, Head of Knowledge Management at Herbert Smith Freehills. We have Robin Chesterman of Justice and Johannes Stieler of AFI. And I'm going to leave them to introduce themselves, use the microphones and do whatever they wish. So. Let's look forward to a good discussion. Morning, Mark. Morning. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. Is Mark going to sit down? Is he going to think of it? It's interesting that the only item on the agenda for knowledge management for the three days is this one. 
and I'm really interested to get your sense of where knowledge management fits in the innovative AI technology world that we now inhabit in law firms. I've got lots of experience as a, a head of knowledge management at HSF and other, other law firms. And I've got Johannes and uh, Robin with me today to give you a sense of the new world, possibly, of knowledge management and how technology can help. Knowledge management, historically, I think, has been know-how, precedence, training, possibly. And I think this needs to, needs to change. I've often said that knowledge management is, is really just good business management in a law firm that's selling knowledge. But I think it needs to change because, and the two uh, experts today will show their uh, technology, is trying to address the wealth of information and knowledge that we need to keep up to date with. And I don't know how law firms, you may be able to tell me, how many law firms keep their precedent databases up to date? How many law firms keep their expert profiles up to date? How can we do this? How can the technology help to enable some of the, 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 the content and the, um, the know-how and the insight uh, that people need to do their job, lawyers need to do their job? How can we get that to them quickly as part of their world? Um, so we're going to talk today about improving knowledge management through advanced legal search and innovative research. So they're going to talk about search and research. I think, interestingly, from what Emily has just been talking about, the fundamental element of a lot of AI is search. Finding things. It may not be extracting things. It may not be um, sorting them or, or using um, machine learning, but it's an initially, at least, for due diligence, as we've just seen with Luminance and Kira and other, other AI technologies, it's finding something in a document. It's digitizing that, that document first so that you can search it and then finding it and then doing something with it. And that, Emily has been saying, is, is the lawyer who still needs to do something with it. And I think that's still very, very fundamental. But we need to think about how search can be enhanced search. I think search needs to take that next step to be, I think what uh, Johannes is talking about is actionable insight. So doing something with it. Is that helping somebody draft a document? Is it helping somebody um, analyze a trend? Is it annotating the document or annotating the, the know-how? Or is it just connecting people with know-how and people uh, know-how with people. Who's the expert? So for the next sort of 40 minutes or 30 minutes, we're going to, uh, each of them are going to give you a, a five minute presentation about their particular technology. I'm going to ask some questions that hopefully will illuminate their technology a little bit more. And then there will be some time for you to ask questions of them or of me. So I'm going to hand over to Johannes uh, Stieler, who is the uh, CTO of AFI, for five minutes. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm just going to talk about, really quickly, about two use cases that we solve with our technology that should give you sort of a little bit of a background of what we are uh, going to talk about from, from my perspective. And as was mentioned, it's all about knowledge management. It's about getting access to your knowledge. And if you're like any of our clients, um, you'll be spending most of your time doing two things, essentially. One is kind of researching a problem, so getting the knowledge in place um, for a specific matter. And the second is preparing actual advice for a client. And that is kind of the two sides to that coin, is consuming information, then producing new information. That is hopefully an improvement upon what's, what was there before. And our technology is basically built to help you go through that process in a quicker and more efficient way. So the first use case that, that we're dealing with and that we're um, implementing in our technology is how can I surface internal insights and fast? And uh, that, is, that is, seems like a very simple question, seems like an obvious thing, um, but it's still surprisingly difficult because it might, your, your internal insights might reside in emails and documents and um, different repositories. They might be spread across the organization. And it's very hard to just get all of that into one place and into one accessible tool, which is why we talk a lot about knowledge discovery as opposed to knowledge management, um, which is just about finding where your stuff is as opposed to actually putting it neatly in, on, on the shelf so, so you, you can reference it later. So, and that doesn't only um, 
relate to uh, curated knowledge. When, when we talk about knowledge management, we often mean curated knowledge, which means a template somebody prepared, a best practice document, a process that is in place. It's, but it's just as much or more knowledge is hidden in the implementation of those templates, in the implementation of those processes, in documents somebody actually wrote, in emails somebody actually sent. So our software tries to help you deal with that fact and access both the templates, both the precedents, and also a lot of kind of informal conversation about matters that might actually relate to what you're currently researching. And in order to do that, it basically needs to do um, the job of, of a person who kind of tries to file things into a neat shelf uh, by pulling everything together from all the disparate sources that you have, Google Drive, Dropbox, if you use that, um, Exchange Server, eDocs, some other document management system, making it accessible and then, as, as Mark said, linking documents, connecting the dots, finding the relations, finding the commonalities so that when you actually research a topic, you not only find results as in a kind of a classic search, and we do provide that Google-like search interface, but the results also help you go further and find related documents, find um, additional information about something, find background information, find a template, both a template and an actual contract that was written based on it, so you can uh, find some way deeper knowledge about a specific problem. And if that doesn't help, if the expertise is not um, reflected in the documents in the way that you need, then the tool will also help you find the expert who, who's actually able to help you with a specific topic. And finding an expert, I mean a lot of large companies try to maintain an expert database that is very, very hard. And it's a sad fact that the person actually mentioned in that database, they might be the one who kind of update their profile the most. They might not necessarily be the one most knowledgeable about a topic. So um, we are kind of going back from the documents that you're looking at, from the matters that you're investigating in, your, in our tool, to the people who actually inter, in, interacted with those problems the most. So the search helps you not only find documents, not only find information, but also find people who interacted with that information in a meaningful way. That might be uh, by means of an email conversation that went back and forth between several people. It might be in the way of somebody actually writing a document about um, a topic you're currently researching. Um, and then you can use our software to go back to that person and say, okay, um, this helps me already, but I need some more expertise and can, can we discuss this? So it's both connecting documents in-house that you have with, um, with each other through common properties, but it's also connecting you when you do research to people who are, might actually be able to help you out and get your work done in a more efficient and also more kind of pleasurable way without the repetitive task of kind of sifting through a knowledge management system. Should, have, should be under five minutes. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Robin. I'm head of product at Justice. Uh, Justice is um, a legal research software company, so our background is in providing access to um, legal authorities, that's case law and legislation, primary authorities, and Justice has been doing that for a very long time, I think actually since 1986, Justice has been doing that. Um, and we actually have um, now what would be uh, probably the largest collection of uh, common law and legislation that's available anywhere online, you know, from we've got Australia and Canada and UK and Ireland and the Caribbean and <clears throat> all sorts of countries. And Justice was recently acquired by VLEX, which expanded these collections enormously to South America and Europe and <clears throat> the United States. So we've kind of been in the content gathering business for a very, very long time. And, uh, we, and we, um, so we've been in the content gathering business for a very long time. And then up until recently, we were what you might call a document delivery service. So you come on to Justice and you search for what you're looking for and we present a document. And usually if you print it off and read it, that's kind of what services like Justice used to be for, for, um, for a decade or so, for the past decade. But in the past few years, we decided that we wanted to do something totally different. We wanted to take all of this material that we have, that you know, we've been gathering for such a long time, and treat this as you know, kind of the raw material of the law. This is sort of the letter of the law, this primary content. And then we wanted to build an intelligent layer on top of that <clears throat> and build tools that actually 
help you do legal research, so help you, you know, navigate this enormous information space. So we started doing um, various machine learning exercises and technologies and concept extraction, and we were building search engines, and we started building what this suite of core capabilities to extract knowledge from legal content. Um, and what came out the other side, and what we have now, is something that we call the justice legal graph. So we've been extracting judges and organizations and citations and all of these things that were in this content and building them into this very, very structured database. Um, it's got, at the moment, 1.3 million cases, soon to have about 40 million cases once we um, increase that to the US content. Um, statutes and courts and subject terms, and another, a key part of the justice legal graph is the justice legal taxonomy, which is, this is something that we spent the past five years building, and it was a combination of our engineers and our legal editors. Um, the justice legal taxonomy has, it's about one and a half million legal terms. It starts at like 46 top level categories, and it goes nine levels deep, and it's probably the largest and most comprehensive classification taxonomy for the law that's ever been produced. And one of the really, really key things is that we are now able to consistently classify 1.3 million cases against this taxonomy, which is something that I don't think has ever been done before. Now, I talked about these core capabilities that we've been working on, you know, the search and indexing, the classification, reference recognition, concept extraction, all of these things that we spent working on our data, so working on the case law, working on the legislation. But then we realized that these core capabilities are actually, can be enormously useful for you and your data. We've been working on case law and legislation for such a long time, but these tools are can do hu hugely useful things for your data. So we're providing um, sets of APIs and other integrations and things for law firms and end users to use our tools on their data and connect it to the justice legal graph to create what I'm calling the hybrid legal graph. Um, so this is about using, where your data meets, out, meets our data, then we can um, apply a lot more knowledge to what you have and integrate what the precedents and the know-how that you have with the primary authority content which we've, we've had for a very long time. Is that five? Brilliant, Robin, thank you. <laughs> It strikes me is that there's a, com a common theme, that there's, there's a theme of too much information, too much unstructured data, and these people and others are structuring it for us and enabling us to find things and to utilise them much more quickly. At H HSF, we've been piloting a, um, an iManage Raven Insight um, uh, instance, which is very similar to, to AFI, where we've combined the document management system content with the practice management client and matter data and credentials and profiles online to create an, uh, an enterprise search, but also a, a know-who in, in many ways. And that's enormously powerful. It's connecting things that people didn't know were there. I think that's, that's a key thing. It's not only just doing things that you have done in the past more quickly, it's actually making some tacit connections very explicit. It's making the connection that the real person who's got some expertise in a particular sector or a particular practice is actually doing the work. That may have remained hidden, and that is, we're actually opening that up to be an actionable insight that you can move on. Taking the content out of, of documents and finding trends and themes and market practice is something that it has often been a manual task. So to have some of, of these tools, which are increasingly available and increasingly uh, um, accessible and usable very quickly, um, I think will make an enormous difference to knowledge management. And I think as I started from, knowledge management will change um, and need to, need to respond to that. Let me ask some direct questions, which we have had notice of. <laughs> so. Can you, can you each of you please give me an example of use of your particular technology in a, in a particular use case, in a live use of the product that can show this nature of its, of its enhanced search? It's not just a search it's, or a research, it's got some added, added value. Robin, can you? <clears throat> um, 
So we provide you know, access to case law judgments, and judges are not known for their brevity. It's quite, uh, it's quite common for um, a judgment to be, say, 10,000 words long. Um, and if you had to read that, or read many of those judgments, it's going to take you a really, really, really long time. But one of the features that we, uh, we produced in our recent platform, Justice One, was something that we call key passages, which was, it's a very simple concept. It's simply mining all of the data to find out which passages in a case actually get used most often. Um, and you, when we started doing that, you start to see some really interesting things like how this 10,000 word judgment has actually sort of over time been distilled down to actually, actually only that sentence that anyone ever talks about anymore. Um, so that, that's a really interesting use case where um, the, all of that information was already in the data itself. Nobody had to do anything. You know, no one had to summarize, <laughs> summarize this stuff. Um, it was just there. You know, these cases have been citing each other for decades, hundreds of years. And what's interesting is that that also changes over time. So um, when a case gets reported by a law reporter, you know, they have a summary of what, you know, the case is about and you know, what was held and things like that. But that's very much then sort of stamped on the judgment at the time that it happened. Uh, what we found with this key passages feature is that it changes as new cases come along and they cite other ones. Those older ones actually come to be recognized as authorities in different ways because obviously in judgments they talk about all kinds of different things and you know, many, many different points. So um, a case that was originally about tax, you know, that's what the bulk of the head note is about, was something to do with tax, actually came to be about um, parliamentary privilege or um, Hansard and access to parliamentary discussions. Um, and this is something that w we were able to uncover in the data automatically, like without a person having to look at that. So it's almost like a retrospective headnote on how the cases come to be applied. Interesting. So it's live data in many ways. It's not, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's no, no longer it's the, yeah. the report on the wall. Yeah. Super. Johannes. Right. Um, so maybe the best example is a, is a project we have with a large law firm in, in Norway at this point. Um, and the, the purpose of that project is to bridge a gap that I believe exists in many uh, law firms, which is the gap between the knowledge base and the, the managed knowledge, the curated knowledge, and the actual life work that people are doing. So the situation there is that um, there is a curated knowledge base. It has categories. It's very nicely filed in SharePoint. It's all prepared uh, to be used, templates processes, best practices. Um, but then there's a huge body of work that lies somewhere, I think, at this point in, in, in I manage worksite um, that is not categorized. It's not kind of related to that knowledge base at all, but it contains the more recent information, obviously, because it's the live data that, that people produce, the pro documents they write. Um, and th there's basically two challenges with that. One is that people will rarely go back to the knowledge base to find out how to, to do, how to do something. They will rather go into the kind of a live document store because that's what they work with more. Um, and that data is pretty much unstructured. And the second challenge is that the more senior the lawyers are in that company, the less they even go there, the more they just look at their own stuff. Think, okay, did I do the, something like that five, ten years ago? Well, maybe, so I'll use that which of course is neither the most recent nor the most relevant knowledge to use in that, um, in that case. So we, we used the technology to bridge both these gaps by first of all taking the knowledge base and using it as training material for automated classifiers to classify everything else into the same categories. So when you do a search and you say, okay, what do you have in terms of this topic, you get the knowledge base articles obviously ranked relatively high because they're kind of the canonical knowledge. But you also get all the live data that relates to that and overlaps with that and connects with that in, in many different ways. And the second problem with the kind of the island, the personal knowledge island that people like to create, um, we solve by creating a component that when you look at a document um, in your own store, surfaces all the most recent stuff from all over the company that actually is similar to that. So without you even searching and accessing the tool you know, expressively or intentionally, it kind of plays um, or goes, goes uh, inside the company knowledge base and brings in all the knowledge that relates to your own prior work that you're currently reviewing, thereby increasing the chance that even a senior lawyer will be, a be able to access the most recent knowledge because he will never open that search tool. Right? 
just struck me, Johannes, when you were talking like that. It's very, very similar to the sort of work that we've been doing. Do you, do you get any sense that there is a, a tension between that access to all of that content and the security requirement to keep confidential particular matters and particular practice or, or have a sort of pessimistic security where every matter is closed? There, there is a tension, of course, and it's always a large part of any of these projects to figure out what the permission levels should be. Um, so by default, the software just replicates the permissions level, uh, permission level that people have to the actual content. So if you have access to a document in Worksite, you can see it in, in our tool that sometimes is too much and sometimes it's not enough. So um, we, we try and figure out what part of this content can actually go into the, um, let's say, broader knowledge base, the non-curated knowledge base, and what content needs to be sealed off. And in this particular case, I think the, so the balance that we, that we achieved was maintaining all the access privileges as they were in the source systems, which were pretty open, um, but then excluding current cases from certain features of the, of the tool so that you would kind of restrict most deep research tasks to actual closed matters from the past. Right. Interesting. That seemed like a balance that worked for that particular company. Super. So ne next question. I'm really interested in how we can show for some form of uh, profitability or return on investment. So I'm curious to know if you have any metrics or any examples of some return on investment for each of your um, <coughs> tools. Robin. Um, well, something that, about legal research is it's kind of the uh, it's kind of the redheaded stepchild in the legal industry. <laughs> um, it doesn't it, legal research software doesn't really get a lot of a lot of res I'm, I was going to say respect, but I think what what I mean is that people don't really th recognize legal research as an area in which you could make savings. Um, it's just kind of a necessary evil. So um, nobody actually wants to do legal research, and nobody wants to pay for legal research either. <laughs> so. Um, if you ever ask a lawyer, you know, do you do legal research? How often do you do legal research? The answer will be, you know, not if I can help it or as little as possible. I and it ends up. Need to do it. Yeah. Um, and because of that, it's usually delegated to sort of more junior members yeah. of staff that could be newly qualified or, um, you know, or trainees. You know, go away and do this research for me. Um, but just because you're getting someone cheaper to do it doesn't mean that it's cheap. You're still talking about you know qualified lawyers' time, and it's a really really time consuming activity. So we did a, a business case study with um, a sort of medium to large law firm in the west of England, where we just looked at who they were getting to do their legal research, the amount of time that they were spending doing it, and adding up the time and you know how much it cost. And we we found, and they were really surprised to realise that they were spending. It was probably about a million pounds a year on legal research for the salary bill alone, um, which is not a small amount of money, but it's especially not a small amount of money for something that nobody wants to pay for. Yeah. Um, it's becoming increasingly hard to have to bill for legal research time for no other reason that people you know people don't want to. You're, what do you mean you, you spent time? looking up the law, you're the lawyer, you're meant to know what it is. You know, mm -hmm. people don't want to pay for it. So um, almost any return on that is a, is a, is a really good thing. Um, the, an interesting thing about legal research software, which is where we've gone, you know, from a content provider to a technology provider, is it's, it's in this kind of weird space in between for who's responsible for um, uh, procuring this software. Um, Traditionally, in you know the knowledge management side of things, where it might be you know knowledge professionals or librarians, the main concern was: Do I have my content bases covered? Do I have this series of law reports access to this legislation? All of those things that my lawyers are going to need. Mm. Um, that I would say was probably the number one priority. If we were talking about software that was more um, sort of say workflow software, collaboration software, or even something closer to the, you know, the client service delivery end of the spectrum, you probably would have had you know a business services team or business analysts looking at the viability and the return that you were going to get. So it's it's sort of lost a little bit in who owns this problem. Yeah. If you're providing intelligent legal research software to save time, who's who is now looking at the costs the the, the the benefits that that can bring to the firm, whose job is that? Might be one of those instances where the knowledge management function or the knowledge center we'll or the change. information manager yeah. needs to evolve yeah. to 
um, to respond to that and to, to procure in a different way. Yeah, interesting. Johannes. Right. So, I mean, it's relatively easy to figure out ROIs on very specific use cases that you try and, and solve with the software. It's very hard to find a general uh, number on that. <coughs> and that is mainly because people are not that keen on measuring their processes to a granularity where you could actually tell or quantify the savings in a way that um, that you could call an actually a basis for an RI. And, um, for, for specific use cases, it's relatively easy. If you think about a data subject access request and how long that takes you to, um, to fulfill um, over time and how quick uh, a software such as ours can make that process, then it becomes obvious. If you're thinking about legal research, as you mentioned, I mean, it's much more um, undefined how much time you actually spend on that and how much time you spend on not finding stuff because that's the time you want to measure. Of course, I can measure your overall time you spend on, on doing research today and then I measure the overall time after the introduction of the tool and then hopefully you will see a reduction but you might just as well see an increase because your, your, your business just increased. Um, so you would have to measure that on a case by case level on specific process steps in order to really be able to tell that um, in a good way. So that's sometimes the hard part of figuring that out. Um, so when we talk about ROI we try and limit that discussion to very specific processes and very specific workflows where it becomes very apparent. Um, and then it's as simple as saying, well, it's not going to make everything else slower, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so just focus on, on those, like these are like um, doing specific legal research, like just opening a document. If you think about opening a document in inside a knowledge discovery tool as, such as ours, versus going into SharePoint, doing all the kind of login dance and kind of going to that folder level, you, you already get an ROI right there. Interesting. So there are two elements there. One was the sort of very defined use case, which was a, a data access request yep. of so an employee or ex-employee who says, I'd, I'd like to know, I'd like to receive all of the data you hold about me. And your tool would search the whole universe of w within the firm to find that. And that is increasingly prevalent. It's also very time consuming for lots of people, usually within HR, to go and find those things and in, in IT. So interesting. So that's one use. The other was to actually change the, the process or, or to actually map the current process to, 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 to see what the difference might be in the way that you change it. Yeah. So we were doing, as part of our pilot, lots of different tasks, research tasks. I need to go find a precedent. I need to go find an example. I need to go and find something or somebody and seeing how long it took in our current SharePoint system and how long it might take in a, with an enterprise search um, tool. Interesting. So you can see a before and after and get some return. Last question. Um, or last planned question. I've got a couple of others that might surprise you with, if that's all right. Um, do you think that, that your tools are going to change the way that legal services are delivered? No longer is it a, a, a resource possibly that just sits there waiting reactively for a lawyer to use it. Do you think either of your tools will change fundamentally the way uh, a law firm or a law company delivers its services to customers, I think you'd like to call it, Daniel, rather than clients? <coughs> well, I certainly hope so. Um, in, the, in the past, justice was very much um, what we call a destination website. You, you kind of have to you have to go there to use it. Yeah. And before you can go there to use it, you have to know that it's available to you <laughs> to use. And that's a problem that we've seen across many law firms is um, the, the lawyers don't know what they have access to. They often don't know what's available to them. And uh, despite knowledge managers' best efforts to convey this to them, they don't listen. So they don't know that they have access to this service, this service, and this service to get all of these different things. Um, and so if they don't know they have it, they're never going to go and use it. Um, and they're never going to discover how useful it might be for them. Um, so what I was talking about in my intro about how th these sort of core capabilities that we've used on our data, how we wanted to use that on your data, the idea is that we can surface these in, an, in many new contexts. And um, there's, a whole, there's a whole range, a whole array of... Um, places in which you might do that. It could be you know, word plugins, browser plugins, sort of integration servers with all of your content integrations with your content management system or your knowledge management system. Um, uh, it could be you know, 
external APIs or data as a service and all of these things. What does that mean in reality? Does that mean that when I'm, I'm actually in a Word document or I'm browsing or I'm looking for something, yes, so, so the, the justice content will be fed into that without me realizing it? Yes, yeah, so you know, if you're drafting, if you're drafting a document and you need access to, you know, some legal information or some, you want, you know, related authorities or you, or maybe you're reading, you know, opposing counsel's um, skeleton argument, something like yeah. that. You know, a word plugin brings all of that stuff directly into into the document. So you didn't even need to know that. You don't actually care whether it's coming from justice or any anywhere else. Yeah. yeah. Or it's so. Um, you don't care whether it's coming from our database or from your own internal databases. Yeah. You know, this is just this is knowledge. This is all knowledge. You know that that helps with with the job. Um, so you know, it, yes, bringing it into Word. You know, bringing it into whatever environment that you're working in, without you having to go looking for it, is something. So it could tell me that opposing counsel's citations are out of date, or they've been yeah, overruled. Opposing counsel's citations some other, are some out of date. Another case that I should quote in opposition. Yeah. Um, Scan all of scan the document, find all of the authorities immediately, and tell you which ones are possibly have been treated negatively, which ones are you know um, have been treated recently. You know all of that stuff without having to go away and search for this one, yeah. search for this one, look that up. You know bringing that stuff immediately, and it's the hybrid of um, those citations with what we can already tell the document is about means that we can start presenting useful information right right where you are. Yeah. But something else I would mention is that there is an array of ways in which we can do this. We're only starting to do that, and we are not going to, we, we don't want to produce an end product and say, that's it. We want to collaborate with law firms and you know, knowledge professionals and you know, the end users to figure out what's going to be useful for them, because actually people have totally different requirements. So we're not interested in producing one off-the-shelf hmm. product and say, that's what it does. I hope it works for you. We think it will. Um, that's not really what we want to do. So we're at the moment in you know, ongoing discussions with a whole range of big law firms and smaller law firms um, to see what would work for them, right. to see what their data looks like and what we can provide to them. Something else that we don't want to do is work in a space where we're not the experts. You know, we are primary authority experts. That's what we want to do. And people who provide um, sort of secondary content or, or do other things, we want to work with them and um, say, that's not justice's area of expertise. You do that and we do this bit and hopefully we can, we can make it work together. Cool. Johannes, are you going to change the, the legal service delivery model? Uh, of course we do. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, th there's, there's two steps I see happening. One is, um, obviously, the goal is to produce something, right? The eventual outcome is some product that you deliver your customers, as I learned just now. Um, and the, the hopefully have a defined process how to get there. And the more interaction points in that process you can support with technology, obviously, the more exhaustive and what I consider very important, the more consistent the outcome is going to be. I think it's important to get consistent outcome ir irrespective of who does the actual work, under what circumstances is the work done, and, and what other factors um, come into it. So that's the, the first step. The second step is going to be the more, you, the more interaction points you have in your process uh, with the software, um, you will then think about changing the process to be more efficient, to be more um, less repetitive, um, less maybe even less human-centered. I mean, expertise is always the, the key value in this process, but uh, technology can certainly help offload the people who execute it from tasks that they need, don't need to be doing. Yes. I'm conscious of time. We've got five minutes left. That's why I stopped talking. No, that's all right. <laughs> that's great. Really fascinating. Can I ask if there are any questions from the floor? We do have some mics, I think, roaming around if you want to ask some questions. Hi, uh, Hi. it's Vicky Abberton at From Council. Um, it was just a quick question about countering what's possibly a slightly older co culture within law firms now, or slight culture and slightly more senior people there. Some people can be a bit hoarding of information. You know, there's quite a kind of this is my info, um, this is my expertise, this is my route to um, my remuneration, and how you counter that culture 
um, in a lot of the, the legal tech which requires everything to be pulled together. I think that's uh, Yeah, that's, that's promo for me. Um, so technology can change culture to a certain extent, of course, but I, I think we should not kid ourselves. It will not change it fundamentally from day one. So the, the problem will, will remain. Um, you have to basically have a parallel effort to change that attitude as well as bringing in technology to make that knowledge silo or that, that island available to, to everybody else. Sometimes that happens automatically if people are just very protective of their knowledge, but they still put it in the document management system or the surface, and suddenly everybody else will be super surprised as to what's there. But sometimes it goes so far that people actually have that knowledge on their kind of internal hard drives or on USB stick and don't even put it into accessible sources. And then you really have to uh, have a parallel effort to counteract that attitude, pretty much. Technology will not be able to offload you of that task, unfortunately. I think from the experience that I've had with an enterprise search engine, it's, it often finds things that people are not supposed to find, they're not supposed to see, and it, and it shocks people. And, the, and you then have a step back thinking, well, we can't, we can't roll this out because it's actually going to reveal things. Um, I, I think that's a, almost part of the testing and the piloting and the, and the reality of the culture of the organisation before you go live with something. I think the two need to go very closely together. I think it's a, an interesting one. I don't think... I don't know, from my own experience in, in sort of larger law firms, I don't think there's a lot of um, people who are hiding things in their, in their bottom drawer and not sharing at all. They're, a lot of them are having to put the document onto the document management system, and that is probably the, the, the live repository of, of good know-how and content. And I think being able to access that, and as long as it's securely and not breaking any confidentiality, I think getting access to the document management system is probably key. I think also um, <clears throat> if people are being protective of their own knowledge because this is, as you say, their route to their remuneration, it, that's not beneficial to the business. You know that that doesn't help. That doesn't help the business go forward. So um, the technology can't change the culture, but we should all be working to to try and make sure that that kind of you know that kind of practice doesn't go on too much. Time out. I was going to ask one more difficult question. Has anybody else got any other questions? Now let's go time out. Robin, Johannes, thank you both very much. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. So Johannes, I think you uh, you get to speak to us for a further fifteen minutes now. Exactly. I'm just going to stay here. So if you can unpack whatever you want to unpack, I I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so you have to bear with me for another 15 minutes. Um, so I'm trying to be quick and entertaining. Um, talking about something completely different now. We're no longer talking about knowledge discovery. We're not talking about external knowledge sources. We're, I actually want to take this opportunity to, to take a step back and look at the broader picture of AI and technology and why we're actually bothering to sit here and listen to this stuff or why we are bothering to implement it. Um, and maybe even give you some hints as to how to go about judging what technology does for you at this point and what, what it can do for you in the future. I know with all of these conferences, when you talk about future technology or, or advanced technology or AI, there's always this one talk, uh, talk about, will a robot take my job? Or when will the robot take my job? The more pessimistic variant of that. So this is not it. That's not that talk. This is about why should we bother with robots at all? And if you, if you think about it, a lot of people immediately jump to cost savings, and that's, of course, true. You want to save cost. But I think, in general, when you, when you deal with experts, when you deal with humans who do very difficult work, there's actually a resource that is, I believe, more valuable than money. Um, and that has to do with this little fellow. That's a goldfish, apparently. Um, so what we share with that goldfish is the attention, average attention span. A human, just as a fish, has an attention span of 8 to 10 seconds, which is involuntary attention, so some, something grabs my uh, attention, and then after 10 seconds, I move on to the next thing. So I'm obviously on a budget, but it's not a money budget, it's an attention budget. And I extend that 
by exercising willpower and turning attention into concentration. And that's actually the difference between those two things. Um, so I direct my concentration on, uh, to a task. But even that concentration will wear out after, I don't know, for, for a young kid today, it's probably 3.5 minutes. For most of us, we're going to be 35. Um, so we are on a very tight budget that is, pos in some res respects, tighter than the money budget. And I believe that this attention budget, this concentration budget that we all have to deal with is actually the reason why we want to bother with technology, why we want to bother with software. If you think about self-driving cars, I don't believe anyone is actually long, well, some people might, but very few people are longing for the advent of the self-driving car in order to get rid of those beautiful mountain drives and curvy roads, right? You still want to do those, potentially. Uh, what you want to get rid of is your super boring commute. You don't want to spend two hours driving between two white lines when that's just highly repetitive and uninteresting. You don't want to spend your concentration budget, the, the small budget that you have during that day to exercise willpower onto a given task on get, just getting to work and just getting that done. And that is really the reason, I believe, why we're so fond of technology is that we feel that this tight budget that we have can be spent more effectively, can be spent at the right time and can be spent in the right way, on the right tasks. And I, I really urge you, if you kind of stop listening now and go get a coffee, just take away that the attention budget is really what we want to be thinking about when dealing with technology. And I'm now going to talk about um, three different levels of dealing with that attention budget or that concentration budget with software, two of which have nothing to do with AI, um, one of which doesn't even have anything to do with robots, so I'm kind of cheating on the title a little bit. Um, but there are several ways that technology can help us focus, direct, and budget that attention when, when we're working with uh, our day-to-day -day tasks. The first level that people tend to underestimate and often forget is workflow and UI. So user experience, the user interface of a tool, it's not about beauty, it's not about hipness, it's not about, well, fun in a, in a certain way, it's about directing attention to the right things at the right time and spending as, as little concentration on grasping some concepts as you possibly can. And I, I always get very scared when I see people um, in, in companies or, or in government organizations that actually do important things, work with tools that look like they kind of dropped out from the 90s. Because you need workflow and UI to help direct your attention as, uh, to what's important. And I actually have an example of that from, from our own software, so it's a negative example. People will probably hate me for showing that. Um, so this is a list of people. When you think about an e-discovery process, you look at a lot of millions of documents, emails, and so on. And our software gives you a way, just as a side note, gives you a way to kind of aggregate that and, and understand, okay, these are the people that are interacting, these are locations, organizations, key terms, These, this is PRI that hovers around that document set. And, and that's one visualization that we offer to, to do that. And it's basically just a list of people's names and it's a, um, a frequency on the right-hand side. So there's 102 documents uh, mentioning Ron Washington, whoever that is. Um, and there's uh, pretty much an order to that depending on the prominence in the document set based on frequency. And that is that requires a lot of concentration. You have to direct your attention to that. You have to read into it to draw conclusions and understand what it's actually telling you. And at the same time, it punishes you by not telling you all that much. It just tells you like five items on top and five items on bottom, and then you have to show more or interact with it, with it in some other way. If what you're interested in is who is actually doing what to whom in this document set, this is actually much better. Because this actually grabs your attention right away. I'm pretty sure everybody who didn't watch the screen before now watches it because it looks funky. Um, it conveys the same information. Nobody cares about the absolute numbers. Who, who cares that it's 102 Barack Obamas or 591 Washingtons? What you're interested in is the relative size of these people in that document collection. So who's talking to whom about what with what frequency you can totally grasp that. So it's more interesting, it's more captivating, it conveys more mass information at the same time. It allows you to go deeper into uh, this kind of smaller areas of this, of this uh, picture. And it gives you some kind of, uh, some affordances that invite you to play with the data. It gives you a slider that helps you kind of scroll back and forth through time. 
um, like a time machine, how did conversations change over time in that document set, um, and it invites you to, 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 to interact with the data visualization, which means it actually grabs your attention so you don't have to effort, put effort into focusing on it, which is great. So that's workflow and UI, first level of uh, attention budgeting. The second level is um, what, what we call simple automation. Or some, some tools are called pro robotic process automation. It's pretty much uh, in the same area. But what I mean by simple automation, this is software that just does repetitive tasks that require no intelligence. And it's super sad to see how often humans are actually still doing those tasks. They should not. That's not what we want to put our attention budget into. So this is, again, a tool from, um, from my company. It analyzes on the right-hand side. It analyzes loan applications in, in the US. So you have this 800-page monster that you throw into the software. And it will then tell you, OK, these are the 20 document types that I found here. These are the actual most recent versions of each of those document types. And uh, it will later help you process those documents. Very nice thing. But what I, what I found is that people still, when they use that software, they often do this. They go to SharePoint, download a loan application, upload the loan application, and then let the tool do its job. And if you do that once, that's fine. If you do it as they do, 340,000 times over time, it's not fine. It's stupid. It's a repetitive test that you should not direct your attention to. And that's, don't forget about these pieces of software that can help you do that. There, there's software there for doing that, which will basically take that task away. So that's simple automation. And I love simple automation, although we are an AI company, um, because it's binary. It either works or not. So that it downloads stuff, it uploads stuff. If it's broken, it doesn't. If it's not broken, it does a perfect job pretty much all the time. So there's no uncertainty with this. It's automating a repetitive test that you do day to day. And it's, it's, the outcome is predictable. Right? If you go back to work tomorrow or uh, on Monday, just watch yourself how often you do these sorts of things. Downloading, uploading, moving files left and right. It's, it's, it's not where you want to put your uh, attention budget. And the third level, that's now intelligent automation. It's AI. And that's AI um, having intelligence in the name sounds grand and sounds lovely. But the problem with intelligence is that um, it has opinions. Every intelligence kind of also means that you, you're bringing an uncertainty factor into it. And AI will have opinions just as a coworker that you bring into a process. It has certain biases because it's been trained, um, no matter if you trained it or if it comes pre-trained. Um, and it has certain properties that mean it's good at some jobs and bad at others. So intelligent automation means that you're now, again, an example from that application I showed before, you now go into this residential loan application and you have the software figure out what it's about. You have software analyze, OK, this part is actually the borrower's name. This part is the property address. This part is the um, interest rate, whatever. And then put that into a representation that can be consumed by other software tools or put it into visual representation that can be consumed by a human. This is, this is AI to my definition because it exercises judgment. It has opinions. Right. So it, it identifies a borrower's name, and now the outcome is no longer binary. It's not identifying a borrower or not identifying a borrower. The outcome is actually opinionated, which means the borrower's name might be identified but wrong. It might be incomplete. It might be misspelled. It might be misextracted. It might be the OCR has gone wrong. It might, it might actually extract the, um, the, the application ID as the borrower's name or something like that. Of course, this being our software, we'll never do that, I'm sure. But there's a possibility, right? Now we have software that actually exercises judgment on, on your documents. So you have to be aware of that. And I think what we love about AI is that it gives us a much broader level or much higher level, much broader way to optimize our attention budget. It can now do much more than what simple automation can do. It can offload us of even more repetitive and boring and menial tasks. It will never offload us of everything. So um, no robot will ever take your job. But it will help us kind of go back to what is actually important. It will help us spend that limited amount of attention that we have on the tasks that are actually 
um, relevant to the, to the success of the project. And it will put, for instance, if you think about e-discovery, it's simple as putting those 20 documents that actually are important in the first slots of the review queue so that people actually review those documents when they come in in the morning are still fresh and are less likely to overlook things. Um, so that's where AI can really excel and help us optimize the detention budget if we manage to treat it as a coworker. It has, a, it has opinions, it has bad days, depending on um, whatever uh, factors may, might, might play into it. And it has, um, it has a, a margin of error that we have to deal with. So it needs to be embedded in a process that is still governed by humans. And that, that process should be big enough that you catch all the errors, but small enough that you actually optimize your attention budget. And that's one of the things you should take away from this. You should treat it like a coworker in all aspects. You should interview it. So before bringing in an AI, find out what its opinions are, how it's usually dealing with stuff. Um, it will annoy you eventually, that is for sure. Uh, with some bad habits, and if it do continuously doesn't perform, you should fire it. Simple as that. There shouldn't be a reason to kind of try and make a software work for years if it just doesn't function for the problem that you're trying to solve. Don't bring in the technology first and then find the problem later. Try and find the problem in your, in your process that you want to solve with technology. So three takeaways from this. Remember the goal, optimize attention. That's the goal of all software, I believe. Um, beyond optimizing cost, it's that much more valuable resource of human concentration that we can exercise and that's very, very limited. Don't underestimate the lower levels, which means don't underestimate the impact of UX, don't underestimate the possibility to automate a lot of stupid things that you do every day. There's tools for that on a personal level, there's tools for that on a corporate level. And treat AI like a colleague, interview it, let it, let it work, control what it's doing and fire it if it doesn't perform. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Okay, so it's 10.15. You have got two options for spending your attention budget for the next hour. Uh, option one is to attend the innovation stage out of the door, turn left. It's a bit awkward, but it's kind of that way. Um, CRMCS are delivering a session there. The second alternative is to continue the theme of the morning, and that is to grab someone that you don't know or that you have not seen for a while and go and have a cup of coffee with them. Okay, see you all in an hour. 11.15 prompt. Thank you. I'm not going to speak until the door's shut. Okay, here we go. A few last scuttlers. Come on in, guys. The air conditioning works pretty well in here, doesn't it? Okay, so your panel are ready to engage you. Andrew Haslam is sitting in the middle. He's chairing it. We've got Erica Albertson, Stuart Craft, and Justin Reynolds. I will leave you to take it away. Thanks, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Andrew Haslam. Uh, I'm the uh, e-disclosure manager over at Squire Patton Boggs, which means I now have to say that anything that follows is personal comment and does not reflect anything that the law firm believes in. Well, it might be what they believe in. Uh, we're going to hear today to talk about... Um, Three things. What are the new ways of analysing data before putting it into e-disclosure systems? Uh, are the current technology-assisted review, computer-assisted review, continuous active learning, uh, which is an intro to TAR, CAR and CAL, meeting contemporary review needs? Uh, and are there any new interesting technologies on the market and who are they? 
Uh, with me, I've got a great panel that's actually going to do most of the work, which is always great being chairman. Uh, I just get to introduce them. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, uh, starting, of course, with ladies first. Erica. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Erica Albertson. I'm the head of e-discovery at Simmons & Simmons here in London. I've been with Simmons for about three years. Um, Simmons was the first law firm outside of the United States to bring relativity in-house. We did that at over 10 years ago now. I think we were Relativity's sixth client. So we've had technology embedded in our practice for a really long time and, and we've been using Cal and Tart and things like that for a good six, six or five or six years now. Stu? Hi, my name is Stuart Craft. I'm the head of software engineering at Annexus. Annexus is an e-discovery company and I've been there for about the last five years. But I run the software development team and I've always had a passion for sort of developing software, solving data problems. And uh, over the last five years, I've enjoyed bringing that into the e-discovery space. Uh, I have been lucky enough to run some e-discovery projects as well as part of the company. So I know a little bit about, about that side of it as well. Lucky running an e-disclosure project <laughs> is not words you normally hear in the same sentence. Justin. Uh, hi, good morning. Justin Reynolds from Concilio. Um, I run our data analytics practice and we are a uh, global e-discovery technology enabled consulting firm. First, looking at what's the, the new ways, well, maybe not that new ways around for looking at data. Uh, and I'm going to go to Erica because you, you were involved in the disclosure pilot that's sort of going on at the moment, started in January. What was the discussions there about technology and how much mention you should meant to make of it? Sure. Is everybody kind of familiar with the disclosure pilot that started in January? Is anybody not familiar? Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background, we've we so Ed Cross, who's one of the partners at Simmons and Simmons, along with um, Lady Justice Gloucester and a few other individuals, decided that we needed to change the way that we approach disclosure in the UK. Um, there was too much "give me everything in the kitchen sink," data dumping, document dumping on other sides. So they have written, with the assistance of of myself and a few other individuals, written the disclosure pilot, which us gives you kind of five different models for disclosure. Um, as sort of brief as give me the documents that are relevant to this dispute and all the way up to model E, which is like everything in the kitchen sink. So the plan between models A, B, C, D, and E is that as you increase the model, it sort of increases the amount of documents you would produce and it tries to kind of avoid everyone dumping data um, on each other. And part of that process kind of involved more explanation about technology and how are you using technology and disclosure and things like that. And, and I think to me, one of the most important bits is that when it comes to analytics, it's, it's asking everyone to consider analytics for every single <coughs> disclosure. And analytics would be things like email threading, near duplicate identification, things like that. And then it's also saying if you have more than you know 50,000 documents, you should be considering the use of TAR or CAL. Um, and if you're not, you need to explain why not. So I think it's it's an interesting pilot. It's been it started in January. It'll, it will run for two years. Um, and I think it sort of puts technology to the forefront of, of disclosure as as it should. Justin, the three-letter acronyms have been banded around there: TAR, CAR, CAL. What they all mean? Yeah. Um, so th this is the point where I decide whether or not I've got the two-day version, the <laughs> two-hour version, or the two-minute version. I'll try less than two minutes, but mm. essentially lots of technologies out there. When we say TAR, Technology Assisted Review, so any technology that is used during the disclosure <coughs> process in the UK to assist the review of documents. So this can be things, as, as Andrew mentioned, like email threading, um, a very common technology used these days to bundle together the inclusive threads and hopefully save time and therefore money. So one acronym there. We can go on to say there's CAR, Computer Assisted Review, essentially the same thing as TAR. If you're a relativity person, they say RA, Relativity Assisted Review. So we're all talking about the same ra, ra. thing. Exactly, RA, TAR, blah, etc. Then, um, what else did you mention? CAL, Continuous Active Learning. I, I so we are going to talk more about that. Yeah, I think it is. It's, it's just explaining a bit about the, the concept of, of training. Okay. Yeah. So the, the two different um, models, if you like, you may, some of you in this room may have heard the difference between TAR 1.0, TAR 2.0. Essentially, today we're hopefully talking about TAR 2.0. 
there are people that I heard this morning saying that training systems and old models are out and it's more about looking at your daily work products and retraining the system on everything that you do using subject matter experts and all of their input into document review to train the sisters that train the system on a continuous basis so this is where we get continuous active learning and for that to work what do you need who does the training is what i'm angling for because I think there's people in this room, if there's any lawyers in the room, this is where you get the bullseye on the back. No, this is good because we're not talking about uh, robots at this point. This is where you keep the job and it's absolutely subject matter experts that we want at the forefront who know um, the case inside out, um, the, the, the protocol for review, whatever it might be. They know their clients, they know what they're looking for, or they know what the regulator is after. They are the ones doing the training. So we very, very much rely on good human input because without that, computers are useless. Ish. <laughs> so, Stu, I want to bring together, Erica mentioned the word analytics. Mm. We've heard about CAR and TAL and all the rest of the other three letters I'm mingling up. Slightly dyslexic, what can I say? What, are, what other tools have we got in our armory? So, as soon as I say, so TAR for me is one of my favourite acronyms as a technologist. So, it's anything to do with technology that assists with the review. So, uh, sort of recently been looking at things like entity extraction. So, we're used to metadata extraction. We're used to getting our documents ready for a platform and pulling out sort of key bits like the emails and the dates. But looking into the content of that document and finding uh, people, places, locations. I know some of you that were here earlier, Johannes in his talk mentioned uh, some of that and you saw some of the graphs on the screen. But it's looking into the content of the document and seeing what extra things you can pull out. Sentiment analysis, so positive or negative documents. Um, whether you're doing contract review, actually looking at clauses, so not a whole level of the document, but digging in a little bit deeper. Looking at different data types, so you might have images, you might have videos, and there's now technology out there that lets you actually sort of parse those and detect things in the photo. As some of you may have heard of things like AWS or, or Google, and these are in the cloud and that can be a bit scary, but they do show some very interesting demos about where some of the technology is going. So you can feed in a photo and suddenly it will tag people or faces or buildings or I think the, the one on the AWS has a skateboarder in it and it detects that there was a skateboard. So suddenly you're trying to make this data more accessible based on the content of the document. Um, and I think for me, that's really where the future of this technology is going. I think now we all have the ability to search large data sets. We have the ability to extract metadata. We have the ability to run some conceptual searching across the data. But what we don't have is what, or what we're just kind of now getting into is what Stu's talking about, where you have the ability to extract categories of, docu of things that are in your document set. So dates, companies, locations, um, value amounts, yeah. dollar values, things like that. We've gone a little bit fast forward in on the accelerator <laughs> then into future. I mean, you, you said a little about concept analysis, Erica. I think you know, what, what's that? Is that so this clustering thing? Yeah. Uh, so how does that work? So it used to be that we would really just look for words and documents, and based on the words that you were looking for, that's how you would start a review. Well, now we're looking more for conceptual things in, in your data set. So if you think about like the concept of breakfast, when you when you used to do keyword searches, you would run a search for the word breakfast. And now, um, with concepts, it doesn't just find anything that has the word breakfast in it. It's going to find anything that talks about morning or coffee or, um, I don't know, bacon, eggs, pancakes, things like that. So it's not just looking for the word that you're searching for. It's looking for any sort of concepts that, that relate to, to the bigger picture. You uh, mentioned that, and because and personally on a day-to-day -day basis what we do is spend a lot of time lawyers exchanging letters about keywords and boolean searches why aren't you mentioning those <laughs> yeah so i hope no one falls out of their chair when i say this but i think keywords are rubbish like personally yeah if you um, didn't hear that <laughs> keywords are rubbish <laughs> yeah. so and i think sue you had a really good point about this as well like yeah. why so don't like keywords it's sort of an interesting one if you take the word orange is it a color or a fruit or a um, diamond, is it a diamond or is it a baseball diamond? Exactly. So when you're just searching for keywords, you're looking for a word in a document. What, what you really want to look at is the content or the context of that word. So not just the word itself, but where is it used, how is it used, what does it really mean to try and bring back your document. And that's where some of these technologies take your searching. Um, the other thing uh, is, I guess, on document cleanup as well. Quite often we see cases where keywords are mentioned and they're in email footers. And then you run them and you get really high hit counts because all of your emails come back. So it's either 
look at your data before you pick your keywords or think about how you can clean up your data. And I think that's a really good point. Like for being at the law firm, we sit really closely with the legal team. So we're involved in kind of the scoping and the strategy of the matter. And a lot of times we're coming up with keywords and agreeing those with the other side before anyone's seen any of the data. Mm. So how do you know if these keywords are any good? Um, so if we are going to use keywords, we, we typically will sample. So we'll maybe collect one custodian, uh, run the keywords across that custodian, see how they're coming out, and then maybe adjust those keywords and go back and collect the other custodian's data. But that's that a, all those wonderful billable hours are going out the door. You can argue theoretically for ages on keywords if you don't know what I mean. I mean, Justin, yeah, as, as you're... Are you sure about that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sure. Well, I am sure that we yeah. argue th about yes, theoretical it, yeah, keywords it, it, it for a long happens. time. It definitely happens. And I think that certainly advice that we give is if we are um, instructed and included as early as possible, we don't even have to have all the data yet. We can have a sample of documents and we can sample the keywords that you have. Maybe just one custodian you haven't even collected, you're not even sure if there's, a, there's an action or, or a real uh, you know, legitimate uh, litigation potentially brewing here. Um, we will have a look at those and analyze them for you to discover noise, because that is something that exists uh, a lot in keywords, whether it's in an email footer or whether we've inadvertently included somebody's name um, but then we'll expand on those keywords and say, well, do you know what? When you're talking about breakfast, um, the word doesn't come up that often, but we see eggs, we see pancakes, I like a star, <laughs> and all of these other um, concepts around it, and then we can, we can just grow uh, from there and cluster the documents, give you more ideas, find sometimes project names and secret code language being used on a particular matter or mm -hmm. a transaction that nobody's even thought of. But because we cluster these documents and we see a prevalence of a certain word, you're all familiar now, hopefully, with all of these you know, word clouds and heat maps and all that kind of stuff. All of the technologies out there now are giving you the ability to see the bigger picture, not just the things you thought you were initially looking yeah. for. And, and we're tending to do continuous active learning on pretty much all of our projects now. And one of my favorite things to do at the end of the continuous active learning is go and show the lawyers all of the documents that were relevant that didn't hit on a keyword. And the last case I did, I think we produced like 15,500 documents and I think 2,000 of them never hit on a keyword and some of them were super relevant. How does that I told you so process go? <laughs> yeah. It's great when you're at the law firm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'm keeping one eye on the time. So, so looking at the uh, the next question is: Are the um, current T A R C A R Cal meeting contemporary review needs? And, and really, I suppose that comes out from the the last bit of, uh, of of legal precedent that we had, which was Primus Triumph v, v Primus, uh, which is actually for, as I am now summarising as a non-lawyer, it was where computer-assisted learning went wrong, horribly wrong, uh, and there was a, some actual precedent where the judge was sort of criticising what went on. Knowing the law firm involved, it was nothing to do with the technology and the person, the litigation support. Uh, I think it was how the project was, was being run. But Erica, so what, 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 what went wrong from the outside, or, and wh why can we still use CAL? And yeah, I think when people initially saw the Triumph ruling, they were sort of like, Cal doesn't work, TAR doesn't work, none of this works, oh my god, and everyone kind of freaked out. But I think as you dug into a little bit more, I don't think it was really anything about the technology. Yeah. I think it was a couple of factors. I think the first factor was the law firm didn't explain to the other side that they were going to use technology-assisted review, and they didn't put it in their EDQ. This is kind of back in the day when we were still doing EDQs. Um, I think the other issue was that they had kind of a wonky data set that had a really low relevance rate. So when you you have, and I think it was like 0.3% was, was the relevant rate they were thinking they were seeing. Um, so I think a lot, a lot of the issues came from communication between the two parties and communication from the law firm that was running the TAR about their ability to explain what they were doing. They couldn't explain any confidence levels um, or margin of errors. They couldn't explain anything about their sample set. So I think the big takeaway from that for me is to make sure if you are going to use this technology that you have people running it that really understand how to do it and that you have a protocol in place and that you kind of track your protocol throughout the process so that if it ever does get questioned, um, you, you have kind of everything in place. Which, which is a fundamental tenant of the, the new disclosure project, yeah. which is a fundamental tenant of what we've been doing for 20 odd years. Yeah. You should always have an audit trail. Yeah. J Justin, sort of has. Well, I think building on what Erica just said, I, I tend to roll out a quick analogy here of um, 
Formula One racing. Essentially, the, the technology that is around today in Formula One is phenomenal, as, as we all know. But you have a driver, is one person, and they get all the champagne spray and that whole thing going on at the end of the event. But as we all know, it's a huge circus of um, the team behind the driver um, that actually make a success. And we all know that the technology, frankly, is pretty much the same. We have a combustion engine. We have technologies out there. There are differences, but like in Formula One, they're split second, you know, differences in, in most cases. It's how you apply the technology. Do you do your, um, you know, your, your tire change to wet to flat to whatever you're doing and, and, and all that kind of stuff. At what point in the race? It's all about the strategy and the, the consulting advice around how to use the technology. Uh, makes it or breaks it. But occasionally, someone stalls on the start line. It's not their fault. Do we blame the driver? Do we blame the team? It's just unfortunate. It happens. That is maybe a, an example where Triumph and uh, Primus would uh, come to play. But how much information you share on your technology with the other side? Well, the Formula One would say what exactly what it is you need to share about your aerodynamics and your you know, fuel mix and everything else, but in e-discovery e and disclosure, it's slightly different and it's still ambiguous, but my advice would be share as much as you're comfortable with and that your legal team are happy to share with the other side. It's very much, I think, it's, yeah, the, the, I, I, I always prefer the, the acronym CAR because it's a car because you can have a Formula One car okay. and, and the lawyer is the guy in the pits or the lady in the pits that is directing it. Uh, and what Justin's talking about is you, you might be directing the car, but unless you've agreed with your opponent what the race course is like and, and when you're going to stop and you know, how many laps you're going to do, you know, it, it could all go horribly wrong. And that, you know, to quote great Vince, is you know, with cooperation is not collaboration talking to the other side, you know, exchanging information, going backwards and forwards, saying we, we've tried your keywords and your concepts on our data and actually they're 100% noise or 0% hits, so let, let's have another conversation. Uh, I am a great advocate, I think Justin as well, get in a room. Don't do it via letters, you know, actually physically sit in a room with the other side, with their two technology people. And it's amazing how often the geeks will go geek to geek in the corner, <laughs> come back and say, yeah, we sorted it, no problems. You know, and, and you haven't had to write the angry letters. Um, Stuart, well, what else? Challenging Cal and sort of, yeah, what's the challenge of this lot? Yeah, so I think uh, Cal for me is a really interesting one. And just to echo what everyone said on the panel, like you really do need people that understand how Cal works, but more like how the algorithm that your chosen tool actually works, because different algorithms work in different ways. Um, and I, I do think they are working well for the use cases that they're, they're being used for at the moment. So um, a system I'm familiar with, you can tag a document, and based on the content of that document, it will try and tell you the next document that you might be interested to look at. Um, I think from a technology side, there's some interesting pieces there about being able to actually sort of control what controls Cal. So what is it that's going to tell you that next document? What if I've got a data set that I don't know much about uh, and I don't want to see a document that's interesting based on the content, but more about the sentiment on it? I basically want to find all the angry documents in my data set. I want the sentiment of a document to drive the next document that I'm going to see, not the content of that document? Or what if I now want to say, I actually need to find all the people in this email set who were angry about something. So now I want to sort of plug in the emails only and the sentiment to try and build these things up. So I think Cal is in a very strong place. Technology is, is sort of coming along, but I'm quite excited for sort of future steps. And I have a habit of jumping ahead in technology here. So this is maybe a little way off. But, um, but I do think stepping back slightly, it's important that you understand your sort of setup. And I know there are different systems that can do different things. Um, Just to build on what Stu's saying about sentiment analysis, there's also um, other work that's done that a lot of people use now, which is gap analysis, which is looking mm. for anomalies. Um, people that communicate out of hours generally are, unless they're extremely passionate about their job, may be up to something um, unusual. And as or their lawyers. Or <laughs> Uh, all the people supporting it's in lawyers, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and everybody in, in the room will have seen that, you know, with these document disclosures, that all sorts of unusual relationships between employees tend to tend to come to the front, which is unfortunate for some people. But uh, it's better to know about it than not. 
Um, back to the gap analysis point, the uh, you know, date ranges, when are people talking about things, you can look at the heat map of when particular words um, are, are, are being used close close to a deal date or a new product being launched or whatever it might be, you can find out this information. And let's also decide that mass mails to 50 people aren't necessarily going to have interesting um, information in. So let's look at some key custodians and their communications off hours at the weekend talking about these words and then prioritize those for the review, mm -hmm. then teach the system, can you show me more like these? and go from there. That, that brings up a really good point kind of about communications analysis as well, which we haven't really touched on. So communications analysis shows you kind of a web of all of the people that are in your data set. And kind of the bigger the bubbles in that web, the more communications those people are having. And then it draws lines between the bubbles about who's communicating with who. And not only is this a great way to see kind of who the key people are in your data set, but it's also a great way to find other people that you might not have thought of that you might then need to go back and collect more data from. Uh, talking about sort of Carl and so on, I think Eric, you're saying about the, the one issue with Rello at the mo relativity at the moment is it, it's a bit of a one horse race in terms of in learning. Well, what, what's, what, what do other things do, or what's, what's a better way of being? Yeah, so I mean, I think relativity has some great technology under the hood. I think where we're kind of moving is sort of the ability to use multiple different types of machine learning, different types of algorithm, different models under the hood, as opposed to just sort of one or two models. And there are platforms out there now that are offering nine, ten models within their one. Um, sort of interface that allows you to kind of pick and choose what works best for what. So if you need sentiment analysis, um, we use that a lot in employment investigations where you're looking to find all the bad stuff that everyone said about this person who's now suing the company. Um, it, it's also really great for things like emojis and identifying, you know, what does the sad face emoji mean and things like that. Do you really, really search on emojis? Yeah, we really do in employment investigations quite a bit. Yeah. Don't put that angry face in your little text message. Yeah. I mean, what on, what do emojis show? Well, I think it shows that lawyers can fight about what the emoji shows. Because ah, right. okay. <laughs> some people will say, you know, the sad face emoji meant that they were sad about this, or the sad face emoji meant they were mad. You know, it can kind or, of be... Or the happy face emoji meant that was a joke, not a Or they were hiding something, yeah. 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 It was yeah. sort of like a wink wink. Yeah, yeah. Confuse the system, say something mean but with a smiley face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Confusing systems happens a lot. I mean, I, as a, as a customer um, of many different online portals, right, for just shopping, for mm -hmm. example, I still get offered products that I don't want. For some reason, there's a glitch. So algorithms, technology is fantastic. It's not always the best. If you can say, I don't want that, I don't know why, I still get offered cat food every time I buy something related to the garden, like a hose pipe certain vendor decides to try and sell me cat food. I've never had a cat. I don't like pets particularly, but it's, it's confusing. But at least with other things, you can now say, I enjoyed this show on Netflix, for example, therefore give me more like this. And that's essentially, you know, we're, we're happy with that in, 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 in our everyday lives. So trusting that same technology and those underlying algorithms to service up similar documents, uh, preferably not about cats, then we're, uh, we're in a good place. Okay. I, I'm jumping around a little bit, but in terms of, I have to say at Squires, 99% of what I do is still email. You know, it's, it's Word documents, stuff like that. You know, uh, but that might just be the litigation we're involved in. And litigation is always a little bit behind because it's always in the past. It's never about what's happened today. It's always what happened five years ago. But are you really seeing some of this new technologies, Justin? Yeah, a lot. I mean, we, we, as a global firm, you know, we collect data from all sorts of different devices now. And um, in the Far East, in APAC region, you have WeChat, which has a huge amount of um, challenges just collecting it. So imagine WhatsApp and SMS and Skype and Slack on steroids, <laughs> that's WeChat, and there's business going on there. Uh, financial transactions, uh, Bloomberg chat, the equivalent of everything in a platform on a secure device. So, you know, we look out to uh, generally for lots of new technologies that are out there in the marketplace um, before coming up here, having spoken to you <laughs> about the content, I just double checked my 
facts on something and I looked up top 10 um, intelligence agencies. So Mossad up here is number one, believe it or not. And in fact, it wouldn't surprise many of you in the room, um, those of you that have been doing this for a while, to know that a lot of technologies have come out of military um, intelligence and uh, the, the vast amounts of data that they have to go through in counterterrorism mm -hmm. operations, um, the likes of the Equivio from the past, you know, acquired by Microsoft to do all of their threading and clustering. Um, Israeli well, yeah. military and come back to that. I mean, <laughs> I, I, so to come back before we, and that's a great yeah. point. We're going to pick that. But you know, as a, as another law firm, I mean, I think because you're in house, you are you seeing a lot more. I think you're more yeah. Advancing. I think gone are the days of the Enron data set where everyone's <laughs> sending like funny emails around in their work email and talking about personal stuff in work email. I think people kind of know now. Don't put that stuff in your work email. But instead of not putting it anywhere, they're now putting it in WhatsApp or they're putting it in Bloomberg chat. So. I don't think like it's it's like the you know 10 15 years ago we would find all the juicy stuff in email. I think now we're finding all the juicy stuff in WhatsApp. So we're finding it in Slack messages. We're finding it in these other chat platforms. I, and you are uh, running projects where yeah, you're getting absolutely. data. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of my favorite things to do is just search for the word Skype or WhatsApp or whatever and you'll find an email from one key custodian to another saying, "Let's take this online, I'll WhatsApp you." And now we're going to go collect your WhatsApp because yeah. obviously you were doing something in there that you didn't want to put an email. Yeah. So as as a Nexus, as as, as like a bit like Concilia, what's what's your view? Of, what's your experience rather? Than yeah. So we're, we're especially recently we're starting to see a lot more sort of non-standard type light chat messages from different platforms. Bloomberg's a big one. Slack's getting bigger. But more and more companies are putting these like technologies out there as well. You've got Microsoft Teams, Skype for business, Facebook for work. So all of these sort of well-known companies for social media and, and areas like that are now building in like sort of government and uh, corporate systems and I think that's going to get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. Which I think leads into us so in terms of the, the newer technologies we talked a bit about this stuff I think we're going to come back to yourself Justin just expand a bit sort of you know, uh, about where these new technologies come from where I think in some ways, we talked about the future. But we talked about the future in view in, in terms of things we've got now and know about. Let's really go future. Well, what, what sort of what's what the military people got in their little black box that they'd like to flog to us? Well, I, 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 basically, my point before was getting to the fact that these technologies um, find commercial outlets later on in their life after their. Mm. Um, key development resources have been Can used. Can you think of about, it was 9-11, you know, in the data sets they built and, and analyzed for 9-11. Yeah, for well, I mean, you go back. It's a different way of looking at information. Uh, absolutely. Um, so the likes of uh, people who are familiar with Relativity will know that Content Analyst was yeah. a business that was acquired by R Relativity and, and, and their, um, you know, data scientists in basements in, in, in DC and very other, uh, other places in the States. Yeah. Um, other acronyms that you can work out for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that technology was used and now there's commercial outputs um, for it. That is happening and that continues to happen and it continues to develop and the challenges and the things that we talked about earlier. How do you make sense from people who are discussing information in essentially in code? Talked about emojis but we're talking about keywords wouldn't find mm -hmm. uh, a terror cell, you know, they are they are speaking in code, but putting that into an algorithm that can cluster the documents, mm -hmm. you can classify a few and say, okay, now with the communications analysis, let's look at these two people who are on other sides of the world, but they're communicating mm -hmm. in a in an online cloud-based platform using a language that we don't understand. And you may have heard this morning that most of these tools even NLP things are language agnostic, so it doesn't matter what characters are being used. We can group the documents together and start getting some uh, sort of coherence of which, which people are talking more and uh, how often they're communicating, what time of day they're communicating, and then putting that puzzle together to give the subject matter experts a sniff of, okay, let's have a look at, as Erica says, the juicy stuff, we feed that up and then they say, yeah, we like that, give, give us more. The apocryphal story I had, I thought it was with the Enron data, was that when they did the content analysis and the grouping and so on, they realized that the, the key players, uh, 
there was the phrase, let's go to the shack. And actually going to the shack wasn't, you know, go away for the weekend and so on. It's actually, let's go down the bar and have the talk about the, the pricing and all the rest of it. Raptor. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was, there, there was you know, no keyword, no, you know, nothing like it would, would you know, but once they spotted that, it was like, and that was from, you know, people and time and clustering and all those other kinds of things. Mm. Yeah. And um, Stu, sort of what sorts of sort of data science stuff going? Where, where are we going to go with that? Yeah, so I, I think it's a very exciting time. We're, we're collecting data. We have a lot of information. And sort of the start of this talk was what do you do with your data before you put it into a platform? And in a way, from the technology side, I'd like to flip that around and just say get your data into a platform because then you can do things with it. Um, we've talked about lots of different things you can do, but unless you get it in one place and you get that content there, you can't even make a start. And I think the data science space is, is very interesting with companies like the social media companies, uh, people holding onto a lot of data. There are algorithms in those spaces that are making their way across. Uh, spam filtering, as an example, is really a classification system. You train it on spam emails and it will find spam emails. So it's the same sort of technology that's being used in our space and I think it's an exciting time to see that move across so you have lots of cases and obviously you have to keep your data siloed but if you have multiple cases with the same firm how can you join that together how can you almost have a data lake of all of that information and, and then reuse that on sort of consistent cases which I think for sort of law firms and people with repeat clients can be very very useful uh, to speed things along there. I think no. natural language processing is another thing that mm -hmm. you could probably explain a lot better than me but Well I, I was going to hold you there because actually Eric I was I'm sorry this is <laughs> slightly their field because I, I can totally agree with Stuart, yeah. always have done, about get your data into a system as soon as possible. Was one of the, I'm, really I'm putting you on the spot here, so you don't have to answer here. Was one of the objectives of the disclosure pilot to try and push law firms to get data into some kind of disclosure system before the first case management conference, earlier on in the system? It might cost a bit more, it might cost the client some more money up front, but you are so much more able mm. to answer the questions. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was to push push the data into a platform, but it was to push both sides to consider the data earlier. Yeah. So what kind of data do we have? Where is that data going to be? Because a lot of times we would come to the CMC and we've had, we would have had already looked at our client's data, but the other side hadn't even considered it. Um, they were sort of like, well, let's have the CMC and then we'll deal with data later. Mm -hmm. And I think asking the law firms to just start considering what data might be involved in the case much earlier is the right move, I think. But I mean, that is bringing costs forward, but it's front loading. I think all of which have been slight accusations thrown at the disclosure pilot, but it's, I think it's the way to go. And uh, it's not just us as techies saying, you know, it, it's if you've got the stuff in these systems, you know, you've got a much better grasp for the facts about what you know, what things to worry about, what what to spend your time and energy writing angry letters about, and what actually you, know, you can really work yeah, on. Yeah, and it might bring the cost forward in terms of you might be incurring those costs slightly earlier in the case, but I don't think it's necessarily going to be more expensive. No, Potentially, no, it will be, I think in theory, yeah. should be less because yeah. instead of doing, we need to collect everyone's data for a 10-year date range, we're saying, okay, based on these issues in the case and you know, based on these requests that the other side has asked for, we're gonna do some really targeted searches to identify the stuff we really need to produce because no one's gonna use 500,000 documents at, at trial. It's just not gonna happen. Of those 500,000, there might be really five to 6,000 that you really care about. And so what we're saying is instead of producing those 500,000 that are you know, tangentially relevant, let's really focus on the five to 6,000 that really everyone cares about. We're into our last five minutes, uh, at which point we, we have got, I should have said at the front, at the start rather, uh, we're open for a couple of questions. Um, don't know whether there's a roving mic or it's speak loudly. Oh, there is, there's a, there's a, a, a lady with a microphone. Uh, if you'd like to put your hand up, has anyone got any questions? Uh, heart stopping moment, there is indeed one second. It's always the person furthest away from the microphone. <laughs> Yeah, Justin, it was your comment on, on WeChat, which is something that um, I've come across and been using with a, a certain Asian client over the last three months or so. Um, can you say a little bit more about how that's being used in terms of a, a collection platform for e-disclosure? A 
collection platform, I think when the devices are available, uh, the, the key to it right now is that there aren't many enterprise licenses. They're mainly personal licenses that people use for business, which means that the using the terminology of, uh, of e-disclosure here, um, the, the custodian has to give their password in order for that chat to be able to be extracted from the device. Without the password, you don't have the data. So uh, depending on the, the jurisdiction, uh, because it is generally, it's an APAC thing, but we're talking really from India all the way through uh, the, the Far East, uh, over a billion user, user accounts right now, and, and growing every day. Um, it's not impossible to collect it. It is difficult, it is challenging. It's not like we just plug in um, Cellbrite, for example, which some people might be familiar with for forensic collection of iPads and phones and everything else. Um, there are some challenges there, but the data does exist. The transactions are there, but even, um, if you like, the central government doesn't have a hold on being able to go in and strip all of that data out. So there are, um, and I'm not uh, legally trained, there are issues with getting people to uh, give their passwords and to give access to what could be considered a device that's personal versus corporate, I'm talking to my family on this device, yeah. not doing banking transactions potentially illegally on it as well. And when it's used um, for, for t telephonic, you know, telephone purposes for conference calls and stuff, I mean, are companies having... Having um, is it downloadable as sound files as well? For conference calls, yeah, I wouldn't like to answer that one. Um, there are more and more now enterprise licenses that are available for these tools. Where it might be that there's an option to record, as there is with your WebEx or your Zoom or any other conference system. Yeah. So I th it's normally um, again that probably is server based rather than device based, but. As you know, many, many things can be yeah. recorded. Thank you. Time for one more? I'm looking at a man with the clock. OK, one more question. Does uh, any other? OK, in that case, I'm going to put a panel on the spot and say uh, takeaway, key takeaway, looking to the future. Uh, what, what's a sort of prediction? If you could tell me the winner of the 5.30 at Kempton at the same time, that would be great. <laughs> um, I mean, mine, I think, and the key takeaway is just that Practical feet on the ground, uh, it, what we've been talking about, it, it's programs like Relativity, as they announced last week, now being able to take all short messaging formats, sort of the, the, the Bloomberg chat and things like that, plug it into, uh, it, you can just sort of plug that straight into Relativity. That was one of Concilio's USPs. They had a wonderful program that did that with Bloomberg. Now the mainstream still bloggers do. are gone and, yeah, and still, <laughs> and, still just checking. and probably do it better than, you know, but it's now that's becoming a mainstream kind of thing that if, if rel Relativity are doing it, there'll be one or two other companies very soon will be doing that kind of thing. So on, that's the sort of tone about what's the the next thing you think is going to be coming mainstream. Uh, and Justin's had a, a little bit of time to think about it. Um, I'd like to s steal two words from um, a, a chap this morning, Johannes from AFI. I, I love this concept of at attention budget. Um, I think that's a great phrase. Um, mm. I don't know if that's his or mm. if he got it from somebody else, but for me and, and for lawyers that are in the room here, it's about trusting uh, the robots. <laughs> they're, 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 are, they're not robots, they're just machines that do a lot of crunching of, of data, but essentially we train it and um, you train it yeah. as lawyers and it yeah. learns that way. Okay, 30 seconds, Stu. Uh, so I saw a time outside, so I'll try and talk very, very quickly. Um, I think the, the key takeaway I'd like to leave is like the, we're talking about the future, but the future really is now. Like technology is out there and it's available to use. And I think the big thing is just finding a partner. If you're not technical yourself, yeah. find someone that can help you with that in-house, out-of-house, mm. uh, and sort of get them and to help you along It's a partner, that. not yeah. a supplier. They're partners. Erica? Yeah, and just to kind of piggyback off the back of that, I think for me, the technology is there, and what we really need is a shift in the mindset of the lawyers and the technologists who are out there. Um, we're not doing, you know, linear reviews anymore with keywords where you start at the oldest document and work your way to the newest document. I think it really takes, takes a shift of sort of the mindset to move away from that and really just accept that these newer technologies are, are the best way to go. And with that, I'd like you to join me in thanking our panel.
that was a superb session. Uh, one, one little thought. Do you think that if people, you used, if people, if people used to be in Word and email and then realised, oh, that's all going to get found, and then they started going to WeChat and WhatsApp and now they're going to realise that that's going to be found, where are they going after that? Because there are places to go, aren't there? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of like audio calls. Hmm. So like, you know when yeah. people use WhatsApp and they just talk into it? Yeah. That's an audio file, which isn't text searchable. Mm. So that's kind the of The return of speech. People Good are going for WeChat. So now we're going to start yeah. searching audio files. Yeah, paper. <laughs> yeah. Write it. it on paper and then burn it when uh, you get uh, it. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm told that the Coca-Cola recipe is on a piece of paper in a safe somewhere and yeah. no one else. Okay, um, that really was a superb and thought-provoking session. Thank you. So our next session, I have no doubt, will be equally. Ilya Kolachenko is leading the talk. He's here. Uh, he is the CEO of ImmuniWeb. And if you'd like to take the stage and do as you wish, sir. I know that I'm standing between you and the lunch, so I'll try to be short, and I'll also try to explore some fun during this talk. Uh, briefly about myself, I have mostly technical background. I started my first job in application security testing when I was 17 years old. It was uh, quite a long time ago. I have a modest legal background, uh, but it's mostly related to investigation of cybercrime. Today, what I'm doing on a daily basis involves machine learning and application security testing. And I also continue from time to time investigating cybercrime. So before we start, I'd like to bring some facts and some numbers about where do we stand today with cybersecurity and cybercrime. Let's start with some good news and some inspiring numbers. So, the government of UK plans to invest almost two billion pounds into the national cyber security program. How many of you believe that this is a big amount of money? No one? I see some hands. All right, great. So, uh, I agree that this is a considerable amount of money. However, I suggest to compare it, you know, to benchmark, to juxtapose with uh, some other numbers just to see whether it's big or small. So in the United States, we've spent almost $10 billion on Halloween goodies in 2017. So this is just to compare whether $2 billion is enough or not. All right. An independent review, I purposely didn't take uh, any cybersecurity numbers because when we talk about losses caused by cybercrime, we're usually talking about trillions of dollars. So I purposely talk and I'm, I'm biased numbers. Think that small and medium business enterprises in the UK lost about 18 billion pounds in uh, 2018. And this is very reasonable, very modest number. All right. Uh, even more eye-catching statistics from the National Cyber Security Center saying that 60% of UK law firms reported a cybersecurity incident or data breach uh, in uh, 2017. And I'd like to highlight reported. Uh, you can also guess how many detected and did not report for a reason, as well as how many did not, did not detect and consequently did not report. All right. City of London police say that cybercrime is the biggest harm to British economy today. And uh, a cherry on the cake, just to, uh, to say that we're not doing so bad as it may appear. In the United States, cyber criminals are purposely targeting police stations with ransomware. Why? Because they pay. They pay. 
They have no choice because obviously you can hire a professional cybersecurity consultancy who will investigate, who will try to decrypt. And I'm not encouraging you to pay zero ransom, don't get me wrong. But sometimes when you have an ongoing investigation and you have valuable evidence that you've been gathering, that you've been gleaning, you know, during the last five years, it's much easier and it's much more secure to pay $300 than trying to decrypt, trying to negotiate and put all the case at risk, okay? So let's have a look at what is behind cybercrime today. So we have organizations or we can also call them potential victims, all right? So, one of the biggest problems, I would probably say the root problem is lack of holistic, up-to-date asset inventory. We have cloud today. We have mobile applications. We have suppliers. We have partners. We have clients. They all have our data. And uh, at my experience, 90% of organizations have no idea how many suppliers have access to their crown jewels. They may estimate, they may guess, they may predict, they may have report from the last year, but if you ask them for an up-to-date numbers, probably they'll say, well, you know, we are uncertain how many uh, external parties uh, have access to our data, all right? So I, uh, I'm not even talking about shadow IT when employees are creating their own systems within the organization without telling IT and security people about it and nobody cares about these systems. I'm not even talking about legacy IT. Some of the systems that have been designed decades ago and today nobody dares touching them because if they crash, everything will go down and someone will probably be accountable for this, right? So today I'd say the root problem is that we have too many systems, too many mobile devices, cloud uh, suppliers, external contractors who have access to our data and we have no clue who they are, what they do. All right. Lack of accountability. This is another major problem. Uh, your company is hacked. So what? Likely nothing. You will probably not lose your job. Even if you will, you'll probably find another job without much problem, right? So employees, they usually say, okay, my employer will get hacked. So what? I don't really care. I'm not paid to do cyber security in this company. It's not my duty, right? Obviously, we do have some precautions, some uh, awareness that we should not click on a particular malicious phishing link, but in general, Employees, even technical teams, they don't care because at the end of the day, it's not their money, okay? Yeah, their stock may go down, but so what? Lack of security skills. It's very challenging to find qualified, competent people who are keen to protect your crown jewels, okay? So this is exactly why we have a lack of accountability because you can hire people who will be doing their jobs, but they don't truly care about, you know, the sustainable wealth being of your company, okay? Unfortunately. And last but not least, lack of liability. Uh, how many uh, GDPR lawsuits we uh, saw in uh, 2019? A lot. However, the impact is very small, and if we'll make an analysis, probably vast majority of European companies are still not compliant and will probably not be compliant within the next decade, all right? Because we've been scared with multi-billions uh, fines going up to 4%, but so far what we saw is very reasonable, very modest numbers, okay? On the other side, Let's have a look on the opponents, cyber criminals. They are usually backed by organized crime or what we call them nation states, okay? We can talk about China, we can talk about Russia, North Korea, and the issue is that they have very considerable resources to conduct their hacking activities, human, technical, and financial. They are very well organized group. A decade ago, we had several cyber crime gangs that were conducting their business, let's call it like this, from A to Z. 
So they've been chasing, they've been hacking, they've been exfiltrating the data. Today we have very well structured black market where we have teams or gangs, however you prefer, that are specialized in different areas from searching for uh, low hanging fruits ideal victims to exfiltrating data, to developing malware, to exfiltrating data, to doing many different things. So today we see a well organized market where cyber gangs are doing business with each other, all right? Uh, a very important one, a result is a key in cyber crime. Uh, what will happen if a cybersecurity startup will fail after, let's say, successfully announcing that they have secured Series A funding. Nothing. They will announce Series B. And what will happen? Once they'll say, again, we failed, right? They will say, we will announce Series C because it's very uh, good these days to invest into cybersecurity. It's a flourishing market. So it's not a big deal to fail, okay? You fail, you search for new cash, and it's very easy. However, in cybercrime business, you cannot afford to fail. You have to think about profitability since day zero, all right? So they're very well organized, they are smart, and they are hungry, all right? So it's not like uh, in cybersecurity where you can afford to t t take uh, one week off, enjoy some vacation, so on. They are doing very serious business. Law enforcement, what are they doing? I'd say they're trying their best. However, they're frequently underpaid, or probably I would even say they're always underpaid, all right? And compared to uh, different companies who can afford to hire best cybersecurity people, law enforcement cannot afford to hire them, okay? They're continuously understaffed, okay? And last but not least, frequently they have no jurisdiction to prosecute a crime because today, when we have, let's say, a gang coming from China, uh, we cannot do much, unfortunately, okay? And let's have a look also about global economy that we have today. Uh, we have a growing global poverty. It's a very big risk because many talented people in developing countries cannot find a decent job and therefore they say, all right, uh, why should I receive $200 per month if I can make 60000 per month? I don't care. A global political crisis, this is a very important uh, uh, detail because let's say five years ago, we could imagine that a uh, European country could easily call country like Russia and ask for assistance in investigating a cyber crime. Today, it's practically speaking impossible, okay? We have so many conflicts, United States, China, Europe, Russia, that practically speaking, there is no cooperation in investigating of cyber crime. And uh, most important one, probably, cryptocurrencies. It's a gift for cyber criminals because a decade ago they had to find a way how to get paid, how to get their money into their pockets. Today, with cryptocurrencies, you have no risk. They cannot trace you. You do whatever you want. And you can spend it, you can purchase yachts, you can purchase Lamborghinis. Uh, you don't care. It's almost zero risk. All right. So this is a very big problem and very big facilitator of cyber crime. So let's have a look how attacks are going on these days. So uh, as I just m m mentioned, cybercrime is about rapid and result-oriented business. So uh, cyber criminals will not try to attack your, your, your castle if they know that some of your data, it can be backup, it can be your advisors, it can be your lawyer, right? who has the same data and who is less secure. So they will always try to find several organizations or individuals who have access to the same data. For example, if they are looking for a particular document, they will carefully think who may own this document, all right? It can be your partners, it can be your suppliers, it can be your clients, it can be your banker, whoever they are, okay? They'll find the weakest link 
and they will attack this particular organization. All right. So frequently, a lawyer is a perfect target because usually a uh, legal industry doesn't really care about uh, paying secure, thinking that if we'll be hacked, well, certainly file a lawsuit. And at the end of the day, uh, at our experience, very few low comp uh, companies have a decent cyber security protection. So, Another thing to summarize, many law firms will prefer not to disclose the incident, all right? Even if GDPR may, may oblige them, you know, uh, today uh, many companies construe GDPR very broadly and uh, uh, at the end of the day, they find a way how not to report, how not to disclose because they don't need negative publicity, all right? So uh, compared to some financial institutions, law firms are perfect targets because some financial institutions, they have fanatical prosecution team. Uh, what will happen if uh, you will hug them? They'll hang you on the tree. They have teams, they have legal professionals, they have law enforcement connections that will uh, pr prosecute you towards the successful end because they want to give an example that people who hack us will go to jail, okay? They want uh, to demonstrate that you don't need to touch us, okay? So they don't care about time, they don't care about money. Well, law firms, they'll probably say, well, we don't need this scandal, we'll not spend money on, you know, time-consuming investigation, we don't really care, you know, uh, we settled with customers who've been impacted, so. So, how to survive? A very important point, maintain an up-to-date inventory of your digital assets, software, hardware, data, and users. Okay, very important one. Because if you don't know about a particular system, the attackers will, and they will probably start their attack from this forgotten system. Conduct holistic risk assessment. All right, so you have to think who may attack you, who will attack you, and what are the tangible risks, all right? Keep all your software up to date. It sounds very simple, but you'll be surprised. I don't know any organization that has all its software up to date. Okay, never seen. I know that it may be challenging, it may be time consuming, but it's one of the biggest challenges that we have today. And last but not least, set up continuous monitoring. You have to make sure that you detect any anomalies in your network, on your mobile device, in your cloud. Make sure that you continuously monitor what's going on. Uh, there are also several interesting resources, for example, National uh, Cyber Security Center provides a guidance for law firms how to stay secure. Okay. I can also recommend you to have a look on a program also implemented by National Cyber Security Center that is called Cyber Essentials. It's a simple common sense framework that tells you how you can structure your data, your security, and it can really help, okay, if you don't know how to start. Uh, for those who deal with the United States, you can also have a look with ZABA. They have a lot of interesting pieces telling how to deal with data breaches if you're a low firm, how to respond, how to prosecute, how to notify your customers, and so on. Okay. How we can help at ImmuniWeb, uh, I'm not going to sell you anything. This is something that we offer for free for the community. So we offer a free online website test, okay? So you can check your GDPR compliance, you can check your PCI DSS compliance. You don't need to sign up, you just go and test, okay? Simple and easy. We also offer free mobile application security tests. You can also check your mobile apps, their privacy, what they do with data, and so on. It's also something that can be interesting for you. You can also check how good or how bad your HTTPS encryption is, all right? And you can also 
test how many phishing, cyber squatting, type of squatting them hates try to imitate your trademarks or digital identity. Okay, so all this is online and free. So if you'd like to see how good or how bad your mobile application security is, website security is, you can have a look there. So thank you for your time. I'm staying here for the lunch. So if you have any technical questions, I'll be excited to answer them. And uh, at this moment, I'd like to say, enjoy your meal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The risk of having a tour like that before lunch is it kind of puts you off your food, right? You lose your appetite. Um, Ilya, that, that was uh, sensational. I'll just make one quick observation. Um, keeping software up to date is uh, not as simple as it seems. Uh, there's some very well-publicized attacks that used uh, mechanisms designed to ensure that software was kept up to date actually to create a cyber attack. So you've got to be careful how well you trust even software that you have and whether you do want to keep it as up to date as the person who's taken control of it would like you to. Uh, enjoy your lunch. Uh, please try to have lunch with somebody that you don't know or at least shake hands with somebody at the coffee machine. For myself, I'm going to see Jonathan Mars in the back. Uh, J Jonathan, I'm, I'm very struck by the fact that your surname now uh, has, has now actually can mean something. Something as a service. What does the M stand for? Ah, very good. Okay, I'll see you at lunch, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone. Okay, take your seats. If there was a Michael Grupp in the room, could he make himself known to the stage? He's here. <laughs> Splendid, so our speaker to kick off this afternoon's proceedings is Michael Grupp of Brighter. Michael, over to you. Hello. Great. Oh, fantastic. So, thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, from Germany, so please forgive my accent and my weird way of speaking and writing. I will not bore you with a lot of text since you just had lunch. Um, I will tell you about a trend, as I wrote uh, cheekingly in the uh, papers, that you have that you don't know and that will maybe change the world or is changing the world for every other industry, but not for the regulatory one yet. And then I will show you how that is different for our industry and how we're creative snowflakes and how everything is different for lawyers. And then, and then I will obviously show you a little bit of Brighter because they paid for that slot. But um, I'm really not going to bore you, so um, I want to show you something. Everybody talks about AI, right? And, and machine learning and AI is all the talk and this is going to change us and put us out of our work and robo-lawyers come soon. So this is revenues from artificial intelligence or machine learning estimated uh, in 2019 uh, for the next uh, decade, you could almost say. And we are around uh, 10 billion turnover globally. Yeah? This, this is the volume of all the machine learning applications generated in the world. So it looks incredible and it looks like it's growing a lot as well. And if you uh, take automation next to this, it looks really boring, right? Automation, it kind of doesn't change a lot. It grows a little bit to 2020, but nothing is happening. It's not that exponential super growth. And if you look at it and you think like, automation is boring, then you have to look closer because if you put these in relation, this is the truth, right? So everybody's talking about ML and machine learning and artificial intelligence. Well, everybody's buying automation. 
All the bigger companies have bought automation like crazy in the last five years. All the industries have ramped up automation. Not many people have bought machine learning, or if they have, they're all small, small packages. So the joke about automation is that it's very boring. Nobody has a really interesting story about automation. People have really interesting stories about machine learning and how you know it's mystic and works. So there's a wave coming of automation, and, and we don't really know what to make of it. I, I make an example. So you know, in the past years, um, there was backend automation. It was always there. It's in the bottom. It's you know invisible. You don't see it. It doesn't really change anything for you. But then uh, RPA came, and I don't know if you heard of RPA. Does anybody heard of RPA yet? Or well, some people did at least. So it was a uh, something that that came a couple of years ago and facilitated backend automation. Then some generic layers appeared on top of this, and now we are very close to have domain-specific layers. And uh, I give you an example of RPA, how that grows. There was a small company that was in Romania. It was 10 people in 2014. It's called UiPath. Who knows UiPath? Some people do now. It's great, but not many. I'd say maybe five or six. Um, so UiPath was in Romania. You've never heard of UiPath, I guess, like five half. And it's a small team, 10 people, 2014. Then uh, uh, some investors came in and gave them a little bit of money. And uh, Ernst & Young helped their technology to be rolled out in the world. That was 2015. They grew from 2015 to 2018, three years, into an $8 billion company. And they're still growing. And the reason for this is that they just invented something fantastic, a little bit of tech that works for every company. So it's the perfect product. It's something you can sell to everyone. It's the digital component of WD-40, you could say, or duct tape, because it's something that glues software together. This is what they're selling. It's back-end automation that does iterations on LinkedIn and automatically copy-pastes. Fantastic. Everybody buys it. And Ernst & Young rolls it out and helps you implement it. So good for everybody. You have a consultant that takes a tech, brings it to its clients, implements it, and then consults in running it. So thinking about this as a law firm, this should really interest you because you're looking for something that is a tech that you can roll out, implement, and then consult on top of it. And this would really change the world because for the people running it, this really facilitated stuff. So this was UiPath, but this is just one example. Actually, there are so many of these companies and you have never heard of them. So there's a company that's going from 10 people to 8 billion valuation company in three years and you don't know it. That should scare you because this automation is boring. These are all automation companies and they're all doing no code. Um, I want to show you some of them. Um, Mendix got bought by Siemens for 700 million. Uh, Appian has a billion dollar valuation. OutSystems got a 500 million funding from SoftBank and uh, a competitor of KKR and Goldman Sachs and Soho is a billion dollar company. You have never heard of them. So, why haven't we heard of them? Because we are not living, we're not living in a digitized world, right? We live in this little village of asterisks. Everybody around us is digital but we're working manually, right? No, this is us, this is Snowflakes, we do complicated stuff, you can't automate that. And you're right, you can't automate that. But people working in corporate legal, they get repetitive stuff, they get stuff that comes in every day and all the digital processes come to a halt, right? It's digital, digital, guns in there, stop, nothing happens. You have to do that by hand, that's annoying. If you look at it, you have the manual stuff, we can automate that nowadays, it's really easy. And then you have the handwork, you have the decision making, you have the application of rules, and this is where it gets really complicated. So I like to write about this, why it's complicated, and that you cannot use machine learning for this. You, people who know me know that, that I'm very critical in terms of machine learning. But it works if you have formalized data, right? If you have formalized data, this is fantastic. If you have a lot of it, you can train machine learning algorithms, you can train models, you can run them. Fantastic. Thing is, normally you don't have them. And just look at the anti-money laundering directive. If you want to apply that, you don't have the model yet. So you have to do it by hand. And now is the time to do something with the automation. So I'll give you an example. Simple question. This is our problem because we're creative snowflakes, right? This is our problem. So um, simple question. Are there any tax lawyers in the room? Tax lawyers? Um, I'm selling software in the EU. What about the VAT? So if you're a tax lawyer now, you're, you're, you find this very boring. It's a very, very simple question, right? You can answer it easily because you can say, well, uh, it depends, right? Um, wh why does it depend? I mean, it's an easy question. You can answer it, right? Because you're a tax lawyer. Well, you can't answer it because you don't have all the facts. If you had the facts, you could answer it. So let's think about it. This is how you think, right? You think, um, OK, uh, you're selling to a company. You are a company. Or you're selling to an individual. Then it's a B2B sale or it's a B2C sale. Then are you registered in the company register? Yes or no? 
Is that a tool you use for your private life or is it something you use for your business? Um, do you apply for that? This is the, the reasoning you take in your head and this is the, the structure you have in your mind. What you have as a lawyer, however, and if you're a tax consultant, this is most of the stuff that you have, this is how you model it. So most of our clients, they just have that. They want to model this. So there's not just decision trees, but it's also registers and databases that you use, but basically to make this question and the answer to the question to a product, you will need a tool that allows you to go from this to something digital. That's the problem. And it's more complex because if you, so there are some words in German, I must apologize for that. If, if you look at, if you look at um, machine learning database, right? You have, a, you have a database that make cat pictures, and we, we love cat pictures a lot. And, and if you Google on Instagram now for cat pictures, you will find 140 million cat pictures. And I know that because I tried it, so go ahead. Maybe you have more in, in UK than in Germany, but it's around that. So what's good about 164 cat pictures is not the fact that you have 164 cat pictures. It's the fact that there were 164 million people who know what a cat looks like, who looked at that image that shows a cat, and then labeled it hashtag cat. So what you have in that database is not 146 data cat. You have a connection between an image that has some specification that it looks like a cat, and you have the know-how of 164 million people that have labeled it cat. This is what you have and what you need to understand what the model of a cat looks like, right? You can train it. So obviously I don't want to say anything bad about all the vendors that sell document analytic software because what they have works. The problem is it only works for specific cases and it only works if you have sufficient number of documents. And if you don't have them, you have to train them more, which will cost you more money. So that's a problem with our world because if I ask you that question about the very, very simple tax situation, you will obviously say it depends. And you say that because you have world knowledge in your head, you know what the EU is, you know what VAT is, so you have a structure, you have an ontology, you have a legal ontology, and on top, you have a structure of legal reasoning that you have to apply there. So if you want to do this, it's a lot more complex than finding the correlation between a structure of an image, which is formalized data, and the hashtag CAD. So that's really complex, and we can't really work with this. So, second problem, we don't have those. These are products. So, so if we want to talk about Formalization, we don't have products. We can't really scale. We can't really do a lot of this. Um, you know, um, this should be interactive now, but it's a PDF, so it's probably not. Um, uh, if you look at the turnover, if you have a service firm, you can only bill, I don't know, 30 hours a day, and then have uh, 500 pounds an hour, and this is your maximal turnover. If you have a product, you can scale, and you, you can use what you earned for innovation, building something better. And if you look at the numbers of you know, law firms, with this problem of not being able to build products and that problem of not being able to formalize your questions into products, we have a strong correlation of the costs of fee earners, the number of fee earners working, and the number in the turnovers. So this is constantly growing and it doesn't really help you in earning more money. Um, the market for M&A transaction went up. So there were more and more M&A transactions in the last couple of years, but the lawyers, at least in Germany, and some in the UK couldn't benefit from that. So, if you think about these two things, so there's an industry that benefits from automation. We have seen that, that all the other tools have uh, changed industries now or are in the, in the process of changing them. And in the legal world, we don't have the formalization. We can bring this together. And uh, the easiest way to do this would be if you lower the ROI for an app, right? If the expert that was asked about the tax question would be able to put his know-how into an app, he could lower the ROI for this. He, the development for this app is really costly, so he will be asked uh, to show a business case on it. If you want to build an app in your law firm, you will have to show a business case for it. You need a client who requests it. It will take some time. If you have somebody who knows how to code, the person will probably ask money for it as well or will take some time building it. So you need something to lower the ROI there. You need a tool set to do that. And um, there are many tool sets around. They're just not for us. So think about the architects in the 70s. Um, if you Google for them, it's called Life Before AutoCAD. AutoCAD is the, the digital tool that enables architects nowadays to draw their stuff. And it's really simple for them to do that. But before, they had to manually do that. They drew that, and they sold that, and had to copy it, and had to you know, copy it again for a machine. So today you can just go digital and sell it and scale it and replicate it. 
for the lawyers, this is a bit more bright at us. So um, it's a platform that just works like AutoCAD for lawyers. You take your reasoning and just use some little Lego bricks and turn them into a visible structure of a code, and then you run it. So it's a no-code platform. It's very simple to use. Some people use it. Actually, um, we already have some, some shiny logos of some people using it. Um, uh, ING is not on it, although they're here. I've seen them, so they're, they're playing around with it as well. Um, and the reason why people use it is because it brings the tech know-how to the people who don't have the tech know-how but have the tax know-how. So going back to our example of the person who wants to build something in, for, as a tax consultant, this person has a know-how, has not the tech skills, gets the tech skills, and can really get ready to work. I'll make you an example. This is actually one from uh, the day before yesterday. Um, Norton Rose Fulbright um, creates a master program, uh, University of York Law School, and that master program is for computer science students and for law students. So the good thing about computer science students is they can code really fast. The good thing about law students is they know law. Problem with law students is they can't code. Problem with computer science students is if they code, it's really slow because they never have to do it manually. So um, in that program, we use Brighter as a platform. So computer science students can build something really powerful fast. Law students don't have to code, and they can work together. So this is done with a Brighter software. Um, I have a number of use cases for that if you're interested. But um, for now, I will just uh, invite you to come over and uh, have a look at it. There's um, there's um, a, a website where you can get a free demo, so you just log into it and register, and somebody from Customer Success will reach out to you and actually show it to you for free. Um, thank you for your attention. so fast that I didn't have time to um, take a picture. Oh, that sounds good. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have something a little bit different. We have um, a different format. Natasha from uh, Alan over and Jeremy from Norton Rose Worldwide. I've got the right way around, yeah. Um, they're going to conduct their session slightly differently. They're going to sit down and talk to each other. Um, and we want you to think carefully about the kinds of questions that you want to ask them whilst they are going through their dialectical process over the next, how long? Half an hour. It's all about legal design. Gentlemen, if you'd like to come up and take your places, the stage is ready for you. So yeah, think carefully about questions you want to ask the guys. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Jeremy Coleman. I'm Natisha Padia. Uh, and I think before we get started, what I'd like to do is just ask by a show of hands, how many people here are familiar with the concept of design thinking, legal design? OK. Keep your hands up. <laughs> Next question, then. Keep, keep them high so we can see. Um, Who's doing design thinking in their current sort of operations, field of work? Fewer people. And who reckons they're actually using design thinking to have an impact, a beneficial impact, on their organization? So fewer still. So sort of pairing back, I guess, the people that know about it, are using it, and are confident using it. Um, I mean, what we'll try to do today is give you a little bit of a sense for those of you who don't know what it is, um, the key principles, and, and for those of you who do, relate a couple of war stories um, about how it's been used. Uh, but maybe before, before we start, a bit of an introduction. So maybe, Jeremy, you want to take us through um, your story and, and sort of how you got here. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. So um, as you can probably tell from the accent, not from here. I uh, came to the UK about eight years ago. Uh, and before that, worked in, in tech startups. Uh, so I have a, a slightly different path into the law, um, perhaps than most. Um, I trained and qualified at Norton Rose Fulbright and very promptly moved into 
what was, I suppose, at the time considered to be um, a startup, uh, which is our Newcastle hub. It's now um, about 80 people in total. We've got about 45 fee earners, and it was purposely set up and run like a startup. Um, I suppose my background coming from tech startups gave me a bit of insight into design. Uh, one of the companies I worked for was um, responsible for making, I suppose, what is considered to be one of the first smartwatches. But to see how it came about um, originally as, as uh, uh, an item that was meant to be um, attached to a video game console and then vi eventually became a watch, um, to see how that design process happened and then to go into uh, a law firm. Um, I think the first time it really kind of hit me that design was not part of the everyday kind of toolkit was on a very large due diligence exercise. And I was thinking, as a trainee, my customer, my end user, the person I'm actually doing this stuff for mm -hmm. is the associate who's supervising me. And that chain went on and on and on. But the work that I was doing, assembling all of the comments into a single document, that was only one part of a much larger chain that I had no visibility of. And I think it was at that point that I realized that there were a lot of things that we could be doing differently. And I was very lucky to be working for a, um, uh, a partner who had kind of an open mind. And I said, well, could, could we not be doing this differently? And they said, well, this is kind of how we've always done it. But there are some people in our firm that are looking at how things uh, could be done differently. And that's kind of how my career took quite a, a left turn, but returning back to almost the tech. Brilliant. Um, and I guess a, a little bit about me then. Um, so I'm a litigator by background. I spent quite a lot of my early career um, at A&O investigating bankers um, and, and dealing with mis-selling cases. So everything from FX LIBOR to sort of post Lehman Brothers um, cases in, in the commercial court. But over the course of the last year and over the course of the last few years, I started to feel like there were ways of doing, like Jeremy said, doing things differently and more efficiently. Um, as, as a sort of sideline, I spent a decade being a trustee for a development charity using principles of co-design to allow for sustainable change in developing nations and, and developing communities. I wanted to try to marry up that experience and the stuff that I'd seen really work on the ground with my legal experience and effectively fuse those into a way of delivering legal services in a different way. Um, so I land and lend up in the innovation team at a and uh, within our legal technology group, trying to do just that, taking ideas from across our network, um, regardless of seniority, whether they come from a partner or someone that's worked at the firm for a couple of days, um, understanding the rationale behind them, getting to know the area in which the FIENA or the member of support staff works, taking that idea through a sort of business case process and ultimately using elements of design thinking methodology to challenge assumptions, to build out um, the concept, getting to the situation where we build a prototype to prove value, to take it out to clients, to take it out to internal stakeholders. Um, and, and ultimately, that's the start for me of the innovation process. Mm. Excellent. Um, I've got a question for you. Oh, here we go. Um, totally unrehearsed, by the way. Uh, given that there was quite a few people in the audience that um, have uh, a, not, not a full familiarity with the, the concept of design and how it might be used in law, um, what are some of the kind of key points or, or areas to kind of keep a, um, or to, I guess to introduce people to the concept? Mm. And I think a lot of it is a lot of it's theory and, and, and lots of books, whether it's the idea philosophy or anything else have been written and, and people might be familiar with the names, but a lot of it's also sort of what is in practice um, important and then what's in practice important at a law firm. So first key principle I'd say would be user centricity. Um, the crucial part of building any product, as, as I'm sure everyone appreciates, but maybe doesn't necessarily put into practice or can't, because of the systems in which they operate, is making sure the product is fit for purpose at the end, for the end user. That's about empathizing and thinking through what that end user goes through on a day-to-day -day basis 
I'm lucky enough to have been a lawyer in a previous career and therefore I have a sense at least of what it meant to do you know, huge due diligence exercises, what I would have wanted, whether or not I would have wanted a button in a certain place. That's one of the key elements of it. The second for me that, that I've seen is incredibly important is this ability to iterate and to prototype a solution, to resist the loyally temptation of, I've always done it this way, I'm gonna do it this way, precedent, um, or to resist the, I'm more senior or I know what I'm doing, let's go and do it this way. And actually taking an approach, seeing whether or not it actually works, um, and sort of trying to measure, almost scientifically, whether or not it has value. That prototyping, I think, really changes the value proposition for all of the law firms who are starting to use this method of design thinking. Mm. The third sort of portion is actually making people enjoy themselves and enabling them to have a bit of a laugh while they are creating a product or a service or just a different process. And the number of times that I've run sessions where people have come out and just said, thank you, that was really refreshing. It wasn't another meeting about a meeting. We had a bit of fun, we had some color, we had some Sharpies, we, we messed around a bit. But through that sort of fun and bringing out what people are really interested in doing, you bring forth some different perspectives. And I guess that triggers a little question for you, I think, Jeremy. Um, where have you seen this methodology used to look at something from a different perspective or to change the way that you or one of your team or clients have looked at a problem and where that's ended up for the solution? Um, that's a good question. The, I mean, it, you, you were talking a lot about product and, and, and certainly I think the design process is, if you look at it and it's in, in kind of its own area by itself, not applied to law, it's very much associated with product. And it's only been relatively recently that the same concepts of design, or at least the methodologies, have been applied to service mm. and, and actual service design. And they're, um, you know, I think it's probably really important to say that um, although this is what we do now for a job, this is something we've moved into, and there are whole you know, very, very well-known, renowned universities around um, all over the world that people are, are, are going to to study this as their career, something that we've come to, and, and there are certainly people in this room who have been doing it for a lot longer than us um, in the service design area. Um, so I guess to answer your question, um, we've seen it used both externally and internally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the... One, one really good example, I suppose, is, is it's not so much about changing, change, wholeheartedly changing people's minds or perspectives, but um, it's sometimes about reframing, helping people to reframe the problem. Right. Right? So often when you talk to lawyers about, you know, what is the problem that you're trying to solve, it's the question that the client has asked them, mm. you know, and that, that's fine, but often the it's not just one question, there's a broader issue there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what, there's one example I think where, um, where we were involved with one of the partners who had been asked by um, his client to, to look at this particular um, issue or set of issues. Um, and it, because it came through the GC and because it came through the partner, it was certainly framed as uh, a, a very a legal problem. It did it touched on the court system, and and that process was very much, you know, obviously a, on the surface a legal problem. But actually, once you started to look at the problem and reframe it in terms of, well, not not our client's problem, but but actually their customer. How does the our client's customer view this? we very quickly realized that it's not actually a legal problem at all, it's a customer service problem. Mm -hmm. And once we reframed it in that way, it actually ended up being operations and our innovation team working together with very, very little lawyer input at all. Um, and I think that is kind of a, an example of, of how you can change perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, earlier you touched on this concept of, of prototyping, which I think is uh, it's, it's, it's certainly foreign to 
um, I think a lot of people that haven't had an opportunity to work in, in product development. Mm. Um, how do you see that, or prototyping in, you know, in practice? How do you see it working? I, I think it, it really very much depends on your audience because you have, and you'll all be familiar with, a mentality where lawyers or partners or senior leadership want something and they want it built out. They don't want something that they can test. They don't want a wireframe. No one wants to put something that is slightly ready, some sort of MVP in front of anyone. Mm -hmm. Because that's just not what lawyers are used to doing. You don't give a half a piece of advice and say, would you like me to continue? That's just not the mentality that you're bred with. So prototyping, on one hand, allows you to sort of explore those opportunities, but on the other hand, brings with it lots of sort of cultural um, and mindset challenges. I can you know, very easily count on, my, on, on one hand the amount of times that sort of lawyers have come and said, we're very, at the start at least of this issue, so okay, we're very happy to prototype, we're happy for you to build a little bit of something and go out. More often than not, you sort of contend with that pressure to build something completely and then get it out of the door. But what we're starting to do, almost prototyping, prototyping, is to get people to understand the value that you can have, the way that you can tinker with the end product, the way in which you can really design something and iterate, add a search bar here, add this thing here, actually this doesn't work or this flow doesn't work, let's test it with this person, let's talk to the user. Ultimately you get an end user, whether that's the internal client, an external client, or as Jerry's mentioned, sort of the, the client's client, getting a product that really does work and is fit for purpose on day one. Um, and that's the real challenge, sort of convincing people that prototyping is a way of not necessarily putting all your eggs in one basket, um, about getting what's best for the product and for the service and, and ultimately focusing on that problem that you had rather than solutionizing and running away with one platform or one idea at the start. Yeah, that, that, that's really interesting. Because I think, what, especially when you start to see, so let, put yourself in the, in the shoes of, of a, a very senior lawyer who wants to be able to deliver that, that you know, beautiful, shiny object, product, whatever it is. Um, they have a pretty good idea of who they think the customer is. Right. Um, but I think often what you find is when you, when you go and show, this is kind of what we're working on, you're, you're being a little bit humble mm. and saying, this is kind of something we think you'd be interested in. Yeah. You get to also engage at that point in relationship building, which mm -hmm. is, I think for us, at least when we talk about prototyping, trying to get over that, that idea that it's not a finished product. Um, certainly for us, when we're communicating internally, that um, relationship building angle has been a really, um, uh, that, that's, I think, a, a been a, a turning point or a tipping point hmm. when we're trying to describe the, the overall process, so. Yeah. 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 And, and I think co-design works. And we often don't take the time to sit down, whether it's in workshops or other things, people barrel ahead with assumptions. And that's what, coming back to the sort of topic of this talk, design thinking methodology is, is, is there to do. Um, as Jeremy said, it's been used across multiple industries and for multiple sort of reasons. But what I think it holds for the legal industry is giving you the facility, the methods, the resources to be able to step back from the go, go, go mentality that is that sort of frenzy that law firms generally operate under. And it gives you the chance really to take that step back, really query the problem, really query whether or not a solution is needed in the first place. And then you're already starting out on a path where you're much more likely to succeed at solving your particular problem rather than getting to a solution six months, you know, 12 months down the line that isn't fit for purpose, doesn't really sit with the client. And as sometimes is the case with all law firms is sort of buried under some committee and then you go again and you do the same thing again and again and again. The other side of it is it has the opportunity to engage so many more people than having one standard little innovation committee that sits in the corner and does some work. Because ultimately all of us want our businesses to be innovation free zones where you do not have one innovation team doing it. You have everyone who are contributing ideas, solutions. They might need the support in the environment, fine. 
but everyone's got the ideas and all of those ideas are ultimately respected. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the way in which to do that, I think, in a law firm is to take parallels with the way that lawyers run their client services and to show them that elements of design thinking are doing the same thing. Whether in a legal memo you're challenging those assumptions, you're, you know, you're adding caveats, you're really understanding who you're advising, who is your client. Well, let's do the same thing in the world of um, design. Who is your end user? What are you actually trying to do? What assumptions are you carrying over because you've got one view, whereas six or seven stakeholders in a, view, in a room are going to give you a completely different perspective mm -hmm. um, on things? Yeah. And I guess having said all of that, for, for both of us, the, the question is, so what? And that's what I'm going to ask Jeremy to answer, actually. <laughs> um, so, so, so what? Uh, it's a, uh, certainly, we anticipated somebody asking that question, so we're going to cut that one off. The, 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 to be brutally honest, I think when you look at the landscape right now, of um, uh, especially from the large law firm, and, and I think the same thing applies to, to many law firms across the entire sector, it is very rare that your clients ask you to a meeting for you to justify your legal skills or acumen. Mm. Um, a lot of the big, uh, a lot of our big clients have panels. Most of them, in fact, have panels. The the fact that we're being invited to that panel pitch is not to prove that we have good lawyers. That's why we've been invited. They already know that. I think the so what is, they want to see us be able to deliver the knowledge and expertise that we have in a different way, in a way that's more digestible, in a way that's more usable. And part of the way that you can do that, um, there are lots of different uh, ways you can apply design thinking, but certainly if you're thinking about how they're going to use the information and the advice that you give them, um, that is a direct application of um, design thinking. So I see that we've got 10 minutes left. Yeah, you have 10 minutes left, and I've agreed to um, chaperone the questions. So. Uh, Fantastically thought-provoking presentation and discussion, guys. Who wants to lead off with a first question? Yes, sir. Is this the microphone you need? No. Name's Tim Travers. Just picking up on that last point, and it's um, uh, kind of provocative, but in a humorous way. Um, why do law firms list all their credentials as opposed to the innovative things that they did within those credentials? And are any law firms out there actually really telling their clients why they're different and why they're innovative? So anyone potentially can do a project finance in the middle of a continent, but not everyone can do something very, very creative and special and that's surely the thing that the client wants to know, not that you've done 10, 50, or even 1,000 of them. Do you want to take off the back of that? I would agree, absolutely. Uh, I think part of it has to do with the, um, I think a lot of law firms view their, the way that they're delivering right now as their, uh, is, as what makes them unique, as what sets them apart. And so if law firms are going to pitch on big pieces of work, they should be focusing on that. And certainly we've seen uh, in a lot, of, a lot of large RFPs, uh, a, good, a good deal, or, or in fact probably the majority of the document now is asking about how, not what. Mm. Uh, and so that, in one sense, is an opportunity for you to explain and, and actually demonstrate that you know not just what to do, but how you're going to deliver it in a way that makes sense. Um, as for the you know, advertising part, I think it might, we're getting to that, I think. And, and I think you'll get to a situation where, at the moment, you've got a plethora of legal tech companies, you've got a plethora of law firms sort of saying what they're doing. It will be easier and easier to weed out the companies that are you know, buying licenses so they can talk about it for PR terms versus companies that are actually putting their money where their mouth is and working with their clients, designing products or designing solutions and services, because those clients will keep coming back and those law firms will keep growing. And it's very easy to tell when you're looking at things on matter 
where firms have been bigging up their credentials and actually don't really understand what's going on, um, or firms that are taking their clients with them, educating them, showing them how to use different perspectives, and working with them, as Jeremy said, to build that relationship, which is tech-enabled, and then both parties are winning. Can I just take a follow-up on that? Uh, Jeremy, you talked about um, clients or customers, as I'm starting to try to call them, um, being interested in the how uh, you're going to do stuff as opposed to the what. That's quite a surprising thing, isn't it, really? Because when you buy something, I'm thinking myself as a, a CIO, when I, when I buy services from, I don't know, someone who's going to maintain my PCs or something, I don't really give a monkey's how they do it. I want to know that they're going to do it to the right standard and to the right price and in the right time scale. So why are they asking about the how? Is it because that's a proxy for are you an innovative law firm that I'd like to be associated with? Or is it because it's a way of uncovering a better quality of output from somebody doing the how differently from someone else? Or is it for another reason? Ooh, that's, a, that's a good question. I, from, from what I've seen, I think that the, a lot of clients are asking how because they want to get under the hood. Yes. In many cases, they are part of an organization that is you know, many decades ahead of where the legal sector was a few years ago. And so, you know, to your point earlier, it's one thing to say that you got a license for something. It's another entirely to demonstrate how you're going to use it. And it's about how you're going to use it, but how that use also demonstrates value for your end customer, yeah. so to speak. Um, yeah, I mean, just as you were thinking, I realized that, in fact, there are circumstances where I, when I want to know the, the, the how, um, whenever I enter into a global support contract with, I don't know, a printer manufacturer or something, 10 years ago, I would just accept what they said in the RFP that they operated globally. Now I want them to show me, OK, so how are you operating globally to make sure I get the same service everywhere? So mm -hmm. it, yeah. it, it is a qualification process, isn't mm -hmm. it, to dig into the, the, the quality. Thank you. Another question. A lady at the back, conveniently close to the mic. <laughs> Carol Aldridge, Burgess Salmon. I just wondered, based on your experience, how much is legal design dependent on innovation and technology, and how much is it dependent on change in behaviours? It, it, it's very much, they, they very much go, go hand in hand. I think that the nature of what you're trying to do and, and the problem that you're trying to solve doesn't always have a tech solution. And I think if you go into a situation thinking about tech 100% of the time, you're going to forget about the process, you're going to forget about what you ultimately want out of it, which is a solution. That might be a change in people and the way that they work, it might be a change in sort of the team structure, it might be a change in enabling and a, a piece of technology. What I think design thinking allows you to do is to facilitate that culture change from within because you are, one, I've said it before, bringing people with you and you are making them very much part of the testing group, the stakeholder group. So if you've got 200 lawyers who are going to be using this piece of tech, if 50 of them have helped design it, they are stakeholders, they are champions in your groups, they are then going to be able to sort of trickle that down. And that's the real important part of it. If you are doing this for the user or for the idea owner, you've got a problem. You're doing it with them. Yeah, I, I think when we started on this journey um, as a firm, we we were, I think, partially by accident, but partially also very lucky that we started off looking at process first, uh, and that that was why we opened the Newcastle Hub, and that's now become kind of our our center for innovation, um, which now looks at technology. Uh, but the, the kind of design process that we started off on was, if we're going to be doing work with Newcastle and London, we should probably have a process in place. And often we found there wasn't one, so we had to build one. Uh, and then only when we were able to iron out and make sure that we had a process in place, that's kind of when we started to look at tech. And so we, we really started with the very basics and we've built up from there. Um, I think, you know, as you're saying, 
Absolutely, the, the the technology is is always going to be a part of it. If you want to, say, you're gonna you're gonna get a get to a certain level where people just can't do it anymore. Um, but it's that kind of human face that's the most important part. So, thank you, James. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, if no one else wants to put it, I'll put it. <laughs> uh, James, to what extent do you think optionality? Uh, plays a significant role in adoption of technology-enabled innovation. Here's what I mean. Um, we tend in law firms to put out computer systems much like we put out consumer products. We chuck them out on the buffet and if people want to use them, they use them and if they don't want to use them, they don't use them. Um, and therefore we create a much higher acceptability and desirability hurdle for ourselves that could perhaps be overcome by just saying, you're in the army now, use that. I think there's a, there's a halfway house to that, isn't there? It's understanding what your team of lawyers want and having been in that environment or, or, or talking to a number of stakeholders and giving yourself the best shot to understand that whatever you are bringing in is actually going to be fit for purpose for the type of deals being done um, or, or for the type of transactions or, or, or litigation matters that you have. Because without that, you end up, yes, you're in the army. Yes, you've foisted something on everyone, but it doesn't bloody work. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to use it, and you're back to square one anyway. Yeah. Um, so if you, can, if you can remember that it is the human element that's the most important, mm -hmm. then you're starting to get you're already halfway there towards adoption and sustainable change, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and, and just uh, adding to that, I, I think a big factor is the opposite of the not invented here syndrome. Uh, the invented here syndrome is a massive motivator. Mm -hmm. We have lawyers in DWF who have invented tools, admittedly based on things like HiQ, that are, you know, place quite a low technical and process burden. But even in connection with our IPO, our lawyers invented a tool which would make our IPO go better. Mm -hmm. And when you've invented something yourself, you will live with quite a lot more compromise and imperfection than, than if you've not. It's understandable for all of us. We're timed out. Superb conversation between these two gentlemen. Thank you very much. So I'm hoping that Nick from, he is indeed, looking suitably Silicon Valley, I must say, Nick. Um, uh, I manage Raven. Come and talk to us. Thank you. Okay. So, um, hopefully, we've got 15 minutes. 27 slides in 15 minutes. Is it possible? Can I keep you awake? Can I not bore you in that time? Um, so just a quick introduction to me. I'm uh, Nick Thompson. I'm the GM of I Manage Raven. I've been at uh, Raven since August. Um, and one of the tasks I was given by Neil Arugio, the, the, um, the CEO of I Manage, was to look at Raven, work out where it's sat in the market. And first of all, look at obviously what's been happening historically, both with Raven and other, other AI products. And first of all, address this question, you know, where does it live in the world and is it just getting started or is it losing its luster? And I think probably to the point that was just made there, I think the sheer fact that we have slides and we talk about AI, we're talking about the how rather than the what. I think that's one of the first problems with the, it might as well stand up here and say, um, is Java losing its luster? Is .NET losing its luster? Really? Who cares about the AI part of this story? I think probably one of the first things um, to think about though, when I was reviewing the market, it was that a lot of people have started with AI being this massive reinvention. There's either fear of AI and it's going to take my job, or there's um, setting too ambitious goals for AI. I mean, I inherited 70-odd projects um, at Raven, some of which were wonderful concepts, but probably three or four years from reality and actually delivering business value. And then there was others of the 70, probably 15 of them were really tangible in terms of what they could deliver for the business. And when you look across the, 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 the market and you look for successful applications of AI, they all started with redefinition. That thermostat is AI, but the Nest thermostat still turns your boiler on and off. It's not suddenly come up with a new way of heating your house. The car, Tesla, I know the guy makes rockets, but he's not reinvented transport. It's still a car, but the ownership experience of, um, of owning a car is completely transformed when it's electric like that. Um, and again, over-the-air updates, new features are appearing overnight in your car and not having to buy a new vehicle takes away the pain. 
And that for me is fundamental to the premise. When we're using AI, our focus should be on redefinition, not reinvention, because that's where the most success uh, will come. And we'll touch on the analogy as we go through, because I see lots of parallels with, um, with the likes of Spotify, because Spotify is AI driven. And it's, but it's fundamentally, who knew there was a problem with music um, way back in the day? We all accepted it as a pain of music. We just thought this was the way it worked. You rolled up to the record store, you stood at the entrance, you had access to all these racks and racks and racks of beautifully organized CDs, but you had to know where to go, right? You had to know whereabouts in that, that store was your, the song or the, indeed the album, the genre. Across the wall was posters and posters of people trying to influence you to buy a certain musical type. You had to then go and rifle through, find a CD, take it to the counter, buy that CD, take it home, put it into your device, listen to it, to only then realise there was only two songs you actually really liked on that whole album. That's actually a really poor experience. Suddenly, you could search for the exact song that you were wanting, and probably most of us in this room haven't bought a CD in 12, 18 months, two years. Fundamentally changed your practice. And I bet if you speak to lawyers, they'll say the same thing. These people who don't change their habits, don't change their behaviours, have all changed their behaviours with something as emotive as music. And that's because of that moment when they searched for something. They found what they were looking for. And I see huge parallels in legal practice. An associate rolls up to your firm, and we obviously, I manage DMS world, beautifully racked documents, arguably, inside folders, but do I know which one to open? Do I have, how many do I have to open to find actually the clause or the, the negotiated position that, that a counterparty takes? It's a lot of work and effort. And so I'll, I'll touch on it shortly, but search was one of the key things that, that we believe needs redefined. And you use AI to do that, okay? But we'll come to it in a second. Whether it's transactional and it's due diligence and you're looking to search through a thousand documents to find risk, whether you're trying to search through 100 million uh, work product documents to try and find the most recent form of clause drafting, they are search problems. And search, we believe, needed completely redefined. But um, one of the things that we noticed and other, par other parts that we'd seen was that you know, AI is something that has to be trained. You have to use public documents. You have to train the engines. They are n typically narrowly fitted to a particular problem. And we saw people trying to apply AI to wrong problems probably because vendors are promising the world and then under-delivering and trying to apply it to different things and finding their feet. But that causes people to be unhappy with it. Just about accuracy, we're going to touch on this in a, in a lot more detail. There is an obsession with accuracy, an absolute obsession that detriments and slows down the redefinition of service delivery because accuracy, actually at the bottom of it, easily manipulated by the vendors and also isn't a precursor for successful transformation of a process. It's just a marker. We'll touch on that in a lot of detail in a second. Just machine learning. If, if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Not everything needs machine learning. Machine learning requires power. Some, certain, most cases we've seen, probably 80% with really powerful search can solve that problem. AI is augmentation. Machine learning is augmentation to a search problem. It is not the be all and end all. Uh, only out of the box. Probably the thing that, again, hit with a load of that, how many of you got out of the box? It's a real kind of vendor measuring exercise. Again, not really the driver. Certainly when you're looking for internal work product or you're trying to apply it to a process that there's no publicly available documents for. So if you want to try and deploy an AI solution into the Netherlands for a particular niche of legal service delivery, you're not going to have publicly trained documents available for it. So you're going to have to train it on your own. So it's not about just buying something off the shelf. If you can buy it, your competitor can buy it. There's no differentiation there. All there is is price erosion. So it's about understanding how you apply the tools. Is it difficult to train? Sure, it's difficult to train, but so is a human being. And it's only as difficult as a human being. It should be easy to train, but it requires the rigor of what do you want to train it on. That's the hard part. It's not the software that's hard to train typically. It's not having the definitions of what you want to train it on. It's akin to applying or hiring 100 lawyers and having no training program for them. Restricted by security, you have this whole issue around about um, one, data sovereignty obviously for the contracts, but then what happens with the models and how do they get trained? And if you have multiple solutions, how do you, we're seeing the SRA saying you have to audit the technologies now. So audit the algorithms and why they make their decisions. If you go out and buy seven point solution, different AI technologies for different seven different problems, you're gonna have seven different solutions you're gonna to have to audit and report on. Very painful. So there's lots of misunderstood. It's not necessary though. There's other ways around those problems. So one of the things that we see that causes um, disillusionment is this. 
human beings can read that dead easy. You know, it's immediately obvious that that date is the date of the lease. But for a machine, it's slightly harder. So lawyers get frustrated when the machine makes a mistake or can't interpret that because there's not enough contextual language around about it. Other areas we see concern, uh, uh, problems, if you just use machine learning, here's an example of an assignment clause. So there it is, beautifully written. Um, now, a lot of machine technology can get down to the clause, but again, if you ask the fee earners, they're not really looking just for the clause. They want to understand, I mean, this is an assignment clause, is consent required? Well, yes, it is. But then, actually, this is dirtily drafted because there's another part in here which is actually it requires it's double consent or it's got dual consent, fully permitted in certain cases, consent required in others. So you can't just do that with machine learning. That requires some logic and some machine, but it also determines on your, how you set that up to train it to look for that content. So again, people expecting some of this stuff to come out of the box is realistic, but there's inevitably there'll be, this is a simple example, but there is other cases where there's more interpreted meaning required. And you're for how your firm reads and interprets agreements and determines risk, that's unique to you and should be unique to you. And it's part of the training program. Now, I promise to come back and just quickly talk about the, the thing about accuracy. On the one end, always 100% human. We're manually flipping through contracts, looking for risk, preparing a due diligence report. On the other end, everyone's aiming for automation. And inevitably, because people fear, sometimes fear AI, they set the bar up here. I want this completely automated or it's not worth doing at all. But we know, oh, you can't see because of the color, the time taken reduces as you get towards the end. You don't have to go all that way to then increase your throughput and your quality. Because if I can save time on this process, I can then increase the, the amount of time spent by the humans. So let's just take a search problem. Yes, we want to OCR all technology, all documents that appear in, the, in a system or a due diligence review. Of course you do. Text, being able to text search it. But you're still not really automating the process. Document classification, well, that changes it. Now, now I know all the SPAs in this document set, not just ones that have the keywords share purchase agreement in them. When you get up to clause and entity ex uh, extraction, suddenly dates become start dates and end dates, numbers become company numbers and uh, acquisition prices. They go from being the sort of, you've got to try and interpret it as a human to the machine knows. Now you're searching knowledge. Now you're searching insight. Now, now you can trigger a whole load of automation off the back of that. But you still need the humans at the end of this process. In a redefined process, your humans are up here adding value, not down here doing the non-value add stuff. But ultimately, it's not about accuracy. Accuracy just determines how far along this continuum you can go. And the reality is, in a contract with 25 different data points, each one of those data points will have a different accuracy figure. What probably means is, depending on the situation, a human being will have to review them to double check them to get them to 100% confidence so that you can make a determination. Because every legal decision is based on confidence, not accuracy. How confident is the fee earner in the data they're reading in order to give them the detail. So where do we think AI should be used? We think it should be at the heart of the firm's knowledge strategy, whether that's pointed at internal documents or whether that's pointed at transactional documents provided by clients or any content. Firms are trading on the back of this. Going back to our musical analogy, it's like the record store. I've got to know which book to go to. But realistically, what we should be able to do is we should be able to stream that knowledge and insight into other users' hands so that you can drive change. Okay? By taking, taking any form of content, using AI, machine learning, rules, indexation, all the tooling that's necessary, can we unlock knowledge and insight from inside those agreements? Which will help us redefine search. You no longer have to rely on uh, experience for people to know where to go, where to search, where to find. But it should be more like something like Spotify. Somebody should be able to see knowledge streaming to them. I should be able to get information wherever I want it. It should always be current. I shouldn't have to rely on a clause bank that goes out of date the moment it's been published because now markets are changing. It should be easy for me to share knowledge around the firm. It should be a thing that's timeless. It should be something that anybody should be able to look at a contract and do a first pass review because a machine can be trained to do a first pass review and highlight risk. Should help by recommending content. Well, why can't I get recommended clauses that my peer that I trust is using? Why do I have to rely just on precedence or a best practice document when it might be that somebody else is equipped who's working in practice doing it as they go? Make sure client confidentiality is maintained throughout. Some information is walled off. You're not allowed to have access to it. But of course, 
if you've got access to the right systems, you can work that out. Because what people are searching for are not documents. They're searching for the insides of documents, beyond the document. What's the warranty provisions? How is it drafted? Who are the parties that non-compete? What does this counterparty normally agree to in a negotiation on a lease length? All that data exists inside your businesses today, neatly racked, but inaccessible. So just as the last couple of minutes, let's play it out from a persona perspective. Who in the sort of musical analogy do we think is the artist in the, inside the law firm? Lawyers, producing content. We know that some lawyers are better than others and have a following, some don't. Some are more experienced, but they will get a, a trusted artist. There is a DJ in the tale. Does anybody know who the DJ is? Knowledge management and PSL teams. They're the ones reviewing the contracts, trying to find the best practice, publishing it around the firms. They're the person who's, who's trying to curate that content, but it's very human related. But realistically, everybody is a curator because we're all using content. I listen to music, you listen to music. If I like you and I like your musical taste, I probably want to know what you're working on. Incidental curation is where the future lies of unlocking knowledge. There is always a secret listener. You know, you put it on private listening and you turn on the Spice Girls or something like that. That, of course, is the same. If I'm working on a privileged case, I don't want you being able to see that I'm drafting something or what that position is. But that exists in your systems today, permissions and logic. But because ultimately we're all fans, right? Everybody inside the firm is a fan. They're just looking for the information that they want, that they need, and they need it there and then. And that's how you redefine and, re and transform practice turning knowledge into something that can stream into people's hands. And there is precedent for this. Because when you try and go from a glitter ball to the predicting the future, look to other areas. We believe that legal practice acceleration is what's coming. Daniel posed the question about, is it optionality for tooling or is it forced tools that you have to use? I think the world of forced tools has kind of evolved and moving away. If you look at something like, let's take Salesforce the world's leading sales CRM, but there is not a salesperson on the planet that will tell you that, that Salesforce is a tool they like or it's a tool that they use to help drive business for them. It's a tool their manager uses to monitor their behavior. And a sales rep, an enterprise sales rep who sells 10 deals a year is completely different to a sales rep who does 100 deals a year, but they share the same job title, but two different jobs, very similar to the practice of law. And what's happening is Salesforce is your platform, and that's where we see iManage, sitting there being the custodian of your customer records, confidentiality, security, all being maintained. Raven is a layer that unlocks the data, that unlocks the insight, that you can then build the tools on top. And when you look to the parallel with Salesforce, there's new tools now coming out, and they're sitting on top of that data. They're new user experiences that mean that you don't have to, from an IT perspective, have to worry about all the underlying security and maintenance and AI and all the other technologies underneath. You just focus on deploying tools that your users learn. Sales Loft is a tool just for inside sales reps. It's growing at 15,000% year over year because there's a big market for people who want that functionality and it unlocks the power of inside sales. I think that's gonna be the same for legal practice. You're gonna see tools come out that are unique that need to sit on top of a set layer because your knowledge is being streamed into them but presented differently for your different users and their needs and requirements. So key takeaways, AI starts with redefinition and not reinvention. Open up a swear jar if people are saying AI, slap them around the head and say, what problem are you actually solving? So for us, we're redefining search. Um, it does need to be something that's part of your infrastructure, something that's built in and we're, we're generating these, then how we're doing this is creating this thing called a knowledge index. And knowledge index is an index that knows the difference between a date and turning a date into a start date and an end date. I have that example of numbers becoming company numbers, acquisition prices, lease durations, cash balances. And it's a discipline you need across your organization. It's not something you should be buying just out of the box and turning it on because there, there lies no differentiation. There lies no ability to apply to your private work product that nobody else sees. Thank you for your time. And I'll be around and can answer any questions afterwards. Thank you very much. That's an interesting new take. I like that. Thank you. Um, I was a little bit fearful that the DJ, I don't know if we can see the DJ slide again. Should we go back to the DJ slide? Anyway, I thought the DJ slide was a, a rear shot of Nigel Farage at one of his rallies. Um, but I don't think it was. Assure me, Nick. Uh, okay, so it's 2.15. It's actually 2.17.
uh, coffee, etc., for one hour now. But at 2.30, Brochet have a training session in the innovation stage, which is out just to the left as you leave the room. Uh, that's at 2.30, so you've got time to get a cup of tea and go and sit down for that. Back in here, 3.15, please, prompt. Thanks. Hi everybody, good afternoon. A slight attrition rate. Um, fewer people here than earlier, there's a few late uh, returners. Right, given that it's post lunch and post coffee, uh, I, I am gonna make you do just one little thing. Stand up, find someone you don't know and tell them your claim to fame, okay? Or a little secret thing about yourself. Come on, go. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. <laughs> cool, so I'll tell you mine. <laughs> It's actually worked quite well. Mm. It's actually getting people talking, isn't it? Yeah, you've been very laughing at the fresh fields. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Adam and Isabel, but Adam is kind of like the, C the CTO of the project, um, Chief Legal Innovation Officer, but kind of the overall, you know, the project we're working on, My Matters. Did you hear about it? Yeah. So he was kind of overall responsibility for that. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know what's happening with it. I don't know, you probably know more than me. They just got rid of everything uh, in London. I sent, I sent Joe the um, press release from the lawyer last week. Mm. The one around. Okay, okay, that's, that's I fine. I think he's in town oh, today, actually. Um, and and said, I see it's going So at well. first you didn't want to do it, and now you don't want to stop it's doing it. It's just another project. But I'm going to try and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're all over. Yeah. Did any of you hear anything that was so appalling or so entertaining that you would like to share it with the room? No, how disappointing. Uh, okay, I'll share my claim to fame. I think one or two people might know this already. Um, I'm old, and I wonder if any of you have heard of the TV quiz program called Ask the Family, which was on, chaired by Robert Robinson in the 1970s and 80s, a few nods in the room. Uh, okay, so uh, aged 12, uh, I was, in fact, on Ask the Family with my mother and father and my sister. Uh, we reached the final, and we were defeated by the Colby family from Doncaster. Uh, and, you know, I've never really enjoyed visiting Doncaster since then. So um, there was a much longer version of this story, uh, but for reasons which we don't have time for me to elaborate, there is, in fact, a very high-quality video recording of the, <laughs> one of the episodes on YouTube... And if you want to see something that makes me look like a complete knob, just Google or YouTube, BBC, Ask the Family, 1978. You can put Pollock in if that helps. And you will have a few minutes of pleasure, I assure you. Okay, so um, why did I do that? Right, uh, <laughs> it's quarter past three. We now have the panel chaired by the eminent Mr. James Quinn. We have Sean Curran, Emma Wright, and Michael Kennedy. This is going to be a great session. Over to you guys. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. So, um, can you all hear me, by the way, for the, for the back? Great. Okay. So, well done for making it this far. Um, we wanted to keep this this discussion. So, the, the topic is uh, don't buy legal tech to impress, buy to use and improve instead. So, we wanted to uh, spend this time with this panel making things um, as practical as we possibly can. So, the, the panel members have many years of experience in developing, choosing, implementing replacing um, and advising on, on legal technology. So there's a, there's a great deal of experience.
experience in our in our panel members here. So um, that should really really help. And we've got a, a mix of, of positions and skills as well. So hopefully to see some um, some different views as we go along. So if I if I start by introducing um, my my panel members. So we've got Sean Curran on the far side there, who joins us from Travis Smith. Sean is head of legal technology, um, and. Uh, in your past role, you won a won a prize, didn't you, for um, your yeah. global legal hackathon? Yeah, I, won it, I, I wasn't sure which prize. I won a couple, but um, <laughs> the, yeah, the global legal hackathon, <laughs> where we developed uh, terms and conditions app. I think a few people are actually here uh, saw us win that. It was a very very cool product. Essentially, the idea was that you take terms and conditions and then you apply some math to them. So if you have favourable terms versus unfavourable terms, uh, the more unfavourable terms are kind of ranked at the bottom and the favourable terms are ranked at the top. So if you've got like car rental companies, for example, if you want to, if you care about cancellation flexibility and cancellation flexibility is three, three hours instead of three days, then you'll get the company that has the, the more favourable um, uh, cancellation flexibility policy. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, That's great. Yeah, so. <laughs> cool. cool. And, and I'll, I'll just move on to, to Emma. So Emma Wright joins us from Kemp Little. So um, for those of you who don't know already, Kemp Little uh, both develop their own technology. Uh, they advise on uh, cutting-edge technology, so right at the cutting edge, including um, initial coin offerings um, and other innovative um, advisory areas, and also is a purchaser of legal technology as well. So, so you're in the right place. Um, today, and then next next to Emma, next to me, um, is Mike Kennedy, and joins us from Alishaw Goddard. And Mike is a um, a new and rare breed in that um, you're an innovation um, and legal technology trainee within the firm, and your perspective will be great because beyond the you know the glossy brochures that tech companies um, like ours produce, you'll know the implementation challenges and, and pains in actually putting these um, technologies into practice. Um, what, what I think would hopefully be useful to everyone here today, but also um, uh, interesting to me, is, is that you all have very different roles, um, and it would be great um, to, to, to hear about that, you know, what you do day to day and what your role entails um, in your, in your organisations. And perhaps if we start with you, Sean, because you're the, you're the very first um, head, of, head of legal technology at, at Travers. Um, yeah. So to hear about that would be, would be great. Sure. So I've um, been at Travis Smith now for about seven weeks. I joined the old CTO, Oliver Bethel, who was at Freshfields for a few years. Um, he was the head of strategy and architecture. I was an architect. He moved to Travis Smith and he recognised that there was a little bit of a gap around the legal tech capability. There was some pockets of um, innovation legal tech across the firm, but it wasn't quite joined up. And uh, he formed a view that he needed somebody to come in who was quite strategic and knew quite a lot about the market, but could kind of sit under him and get a hand of all of these kind of startups that were starting to kind of roll into the organisation so that we could articulate back to the partnership what was a sort of good product that we could use, what wasn't a good product, etc. So I've only been there for seven weeks now, but we've actually rolled out a couple of really interesting and basic and simple tools that are really changing the way that lawyers work on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'll talk to some of those in a bit. Great, thanks. And Emma, could you, could you share as well? Sure. So I'm one of the partners in the commercial technology team at Kemp Little. Um, so uh, my day job is advising tech companies or those looking to digitally, digitally transform on the terms and conditions and we've worked with a couple of legal tech companies and also kind of consultants that are helping law firms on that, in that space. But I also then speak to the clients and take both third party solutions and things that we've developed in house and incorporate them into some of the processes or delivering the solutions that the clients are asking for. Um, we at Kent Little have now got a chief digital officer. He's taking a, taking a step back and looking at the processes. And when we're looking to incorporate tech, it's just one of the processes that, you know, that's how the decision is made. So we're involved in that. I mean, do you say you're more of a lawyer or a technologist or a bit of a mix of both? Um, so what does that mean? So <laughs> what does that mean? Because I'm a lawyer but I've been practicing technology you know, all my life um, for 20 years. So I'm a telecoms lawyer by, by kind of really dating that back, mm. but equally know how fiber optic cables work, have always been involved in the tech. So, and, and, and that's a common theme throughout the CT team at Kemp Little. So the, the solutions that we develop by the lawyers and just, you know, it's standard practice for people just to kind of hack a solution to something. And having that knowledge of both really, really helps both sides. Yeah, 
Because yeah. you can have a conversation with the technology companies, but you can also explain the technology to very, in very simple terms. Okay, and great. And, and Mike, perhaps you can help us assume, assume no knowledge, as it were, of innovation trainees, which is, which is um, true in my case. So if you yeah, could maybe tell us a little bit about you know, what is an innovation trainee and what you do day to day, that would be really great. Yeah, sure. Um, so to start, it's probably a guinea pig. Um, so I, me and two of the, the other people in my team are sort of the first three trainees. So instead of doing the traditional route, we've moved towards doing an in, like working within the innovation legal tech team um, at Otto Shores. And it's a massive mix of different roles. Um, there's like a there's like a bit of a lawyer role, a bit of a consultancy role, a bit of like a legal ops role, um, and then there's like the technologies role of similar to, to Emma. Like it's being aware of technology, being able to explain it, being able to work with lawyers and find out what problems they face, and then be able to work, <coughs> be able to work with tech companies and find out what solutions they have, and then actually merge them together. So it's not. Um, so different than jobs that a lot of other people do. I think it's more, I sort of joined the firm four and a bit years ago now and got my training contract as, as usual with the intention to become a lawyer and just didn't really feel like I wanted to do that route and started to do more and more technology and more and more like thinking about things differently and sort of having suggestions and started to, uh, the team was set up and there was like a couple of us in the team and then instead of moving into the rest of the firm to my training contract. We um, figured it out so I could actually do it like this and it's been, it's been really good. And I think day to day it's, it's a massive, it's like the proper cliche of saying every day is different. But um, it really sort of is like I do a lot of pitch and proposal work. I do a lot of communication with suppliers. I do a lot of internal um, like comms with, with people, lawyers throughout the firm to sort of find out what they're struggling with and find out what they actually want. And we get a lot of um, feedback from lawyers saying, oh, this really, I really don't like this or I don't want to do this. <coughs> that, and so can I not? And then it's sort of a bit like, okay, we'll come back in a week and we'll, we'll think about it. And it's a lot of like focus group stuff in a way where you sit and talk to people and then go out and find a solution and then use the lawyer to actually bring that back in. Um, so it's a lot of engagement and then there's a lot of like graft as well, but yeah, it's it's pretty good. Okay, and we we were talking a bit earlier, weren't we, about the 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 routes from innovation trainee forward, and you you it leads to qualification in the traditional sense, doesn't it? And so yeah. you you've you've got the all all of the options in front of you, and you're very heavy, heavily tech focused at the moment, but you'll still acquire yeah. all the skills you need to qualify, and and you can you can choose later which way you want to go. Then yeah, yeah, and one of the a big part of my role is making sure that it's like the normal SRA regulated route for being a trainee, I have to do all that same stuff. So I have to do my different areas of law, I have to do my contentious elements, I have to do, I can't remember, there's like eight or nine um, sections. Um, and that's all coming to an end in September. But that's all been going quite well. It's just a, yes, yeah, it's, it's figuring out how to fit that in mm -hmm. alongside an innovation role. Okay, great, great. So that's a kind of like an overview of what, what everybody does on there. Um, or what panellists do. And, and I suppose, just getting back to our topic now, so the, the, the topic we can split into two kind of core elements. Uh, first um, uh, statement is don't buy legal tech to impress. So perhaps if we, if we talk about that a little bit first. Um, now, I suppose the assumption there is that law firms are just buying legal technology to impress in some, in some cases um, for, for market perception or to impress their clients. So, um, uh, Perhaps Sean, you could you could uh, uh, help us out here by yeah. by the the assumption of the question is that law firms are actually doing this. They're buying technology just to impress in some cases. Do you think that's do you think that's true? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, law firms are required to do this because uh, there's a lot of RFPs just now about what you're doing on digital and innovation. So firms are getting pressured to make sure they get a tick in that box. My view is that. Um, it's all very subjective and you've got different clients at different levels of digital and innovation maturity. I was presenting to a client in Italy when I was at Freshfields and I had kind of seven innovations lined up, the first being the least innovative and the seven being this is going to completely cannibalise the legal market, it's unbelievable. And I walked into the room, the first innovation was document automation, and I walked into the room thinking that everybody in the room would, would be you know, not bothered about document automation, it's not that innovative. And the 25 in-house lawyers were just looking like this is unbelievable, this is only a year ago. 
This is unbelievable. You can answer questions on a document, on a web form, and it creates a document. So I had these other six innovations that I was thinking probably shouldn't talk about these because I've already kind of got that tick in the box. And the point I was trying to make is it's really important that everybody in the room and everybody in LawTech understands the maturity inside the client organisation because you might not have to try and invest all that money to get to innovation number seven when all your client is really looking for is a simple way to self-serve um, documents through document automation. So um, I think there is a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of kind of hype in the market and people are trying to address that by just going out and buying legal tech, but really understand what your client needs and then buy, buy or build legal tech based on that. Okay. And, and Emma, just picking up on the, on the client requirements and the, the RFPs. So a, cl a client sends an RFP and says, tell us how innovative you are, tell us what you're doing in the legal tech space. And you know, you've got to put something in that box and you will have lots of things, especially at your firm, to, to, to say there. Do you think that clients are buying based on innovation? Because if we, you know, if we have a if we have a fictional scenario and we say um, you're pitching against, you know, a n other firm, the, the quality is not an issue. Let's say you're both going to be have a high quality um, uh, um, advice for this client. I pitch hundred pounds. You pitch hundred pounds, but you you are going to use innovation in the delivery of that service. Do you think that clients are actually attaching weight to to innovation, or do you think that um, actually it's it's a um, it's it's a factor they want to hear about? What's their you know why is that question there? So, and I probably I don't know whether it came up yesterday, but I think it's more around the value question. <coughs> so I don't think that the incorporation of tech will. Lots of clients want to see it as a tick in a box, but I don't think it will be the determining factor in any RFP. If you turn around and say, well, we're going to do it through tech and this will allow you for this amount of management information, which will give you cost savings or greater allocation of work or greater visibility on diversity of our teams, absolutely, that's an enabler. The tech is an enabler for you to provide different val you know, value and different benefits. Mm -hmm. I think that's when the conversation then becomes something that is a USP. It, it's, we see tech as one of our tools, but we're, we're also at the stage now where we're quite comfortable in pushing back on a client and saying, well, no, we're actually not using a piece of tech here because we've used three, we've trialled three, and we're more efficient or we get a better output if we use it in a different way. And, and what, we're, what we're finding ourselves more and more is being called into meetings and conversation, having conversations with clients where we're ha actually having a discussion where they've heard about a new piece of tech, we've trialled it, we've tried it, and giving our view on whether it's working or not. Okay. I suppose it comes into its own when you have a conversation with a, with a client where they say, we used to pay you 100 for this, now we want to pay you 90. Yeah. You know, we, we don't expect you to just take it on the chin. How are yeah. you going to deliver that saving? And then the, the legal tech conversation becomes completely different. Absolutely. Um, a, a couple of conversations with... Um, uh, with with in-house teams that I've had recently, and and some lawyers, uh, the other the other two answers they 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 brought out to that question was, one is they want to use the tech themselves. So if we if law firms such as yours and and Travel Smith and Adelshaws are are very far ahead of of the average, not not every, um, but in-house teams generally, and actually a lot of the time. As, as you were saying, Sean, you're demonstrating to the in-house teams and, and sometimes they're quite far behind the curve of the law firms. Um, and we thought lawyers were behind the curve as well. Um, so, uh, but it's, it's um, sometimes they want to use the tech themselves. So if they're working with an innovative firm that's got loads of cool legal tech, they can maybe adopt that legal tech and, and learn from the firms and that will make them internally more efficient and be able to handle certain things themselves. And then the, uh, the other perspective is that um, the in-house teams don't want um, the lawyers there at two in the morning just cranking out endless documents for them. They would much prefer that the service delivery was, um, was delivered through technology rather than just through brute force um, by, by the firms. I'm sure you have some great examples of clients who don't have that perspective, but um, some of them certainly do out there. So, um, so that's great. So um, clients then, I suppose, just, just um, maybe my, your, your perception on the, in terms of the, the um, projects you've been in, involved in. Um, clients are impressed by this technology when you when you expose it to them, and when you when you um, are, are working in projects in AI and and and, um, um, and other similar technologies. Is that is that a fair statement? 
Yeah, I think they're, they're impressed by what it delivers rather than if we just said, oh, we use this, they wouldn't be necessarily impressed straight away. Um, but they are impressed when we say, we use this in this way to deliver this output. Um, there's definitely really positive feedback from that. Okay. Well, I wonder how many, you know, there's a lot of legal tech in the market, um, specifically around, around contract review, and there's been a lot of noise around that in the last sort of few years. But my experience is that it's not used in anger within organisations, and you end up with sort of 5 or 10% of your M&A transactions actually using it. But people often try and default back to just doing it manually. Um, I don't know if you guys have the same sort of experience, but I've, so I've not I, seen it. I, I think use it for data breach. To okay. set, um, so I agree with you, that was that, but that's when it does get used in anger, when you're trying to work out kind of on contracts that have been amended, amended, amended. Mm. Um, because kind of my fee earning role is cyber I lead the cybersecurity and the digital infrastructure piece. So then you're able to get a very clear position quickly on your contractual positions and your yeah. information security. But I agree with you, it's, that was because it was just the quickest way of doing it. Mm. Um, yeah. but, but actually, for the M&A, people can have conversations around, well, actually, it doesn't work. It's not, it's not fit for purpose for every scenario. Yeah, and you can deploy simpler solutions that more lawyers use and have yeah. a bigger impact if the engagement is bigger. So we just rolled out a very simple I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here, do you? No, no, go for it. Go for we just rolled out a very simple email prediction filing tool where instead of dragging and dropping emails and it taking six, six seconds, years. it's just one second and you click a yeah. button and it's gone. Transforms your yeah, life. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Have you got it? Every <laughs> yeah, yeah. single lawyer ends this like, this is unbelievable, Sean, you've just changed their life and I've only been there seven weeks. We rolled out DocuSign a couple of years ago. Yeah. To, you know, the idea that we have our engagement letters, all si can, people can sign them on, our, yeah. on your mobile phone and we have a central repository. It's... That, that transformed in a way that some of the contracts, yeah, exactly. kind of the review tools, no, nah, not. I think it's a bit very important to be smart about the legal technology that you use and don't be scared to just be doing stuff around email or documents because actually <laughs> lawyers use that on a day-to-day -day basis and it yeah. is their bread and butter. We've got lawyers who get 500 emails a day. If you take a filing action from six seconds down to one second and you run the numbers on that over the year and do a business case, it's unbelievable, the numbers. And you can, that will never compare. To, not to say that you shouldn't invest in contract review technologies, but that will never really compare at this point in time with some of the ROI that you'd expect to get on, on contract review stuff. And I think that's probably a state of where we are as well, that actually kind of a lot, the, the tech solutions are so advanced, but actually you're assuming that law firms are really advanced exactly. and they're just... Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. we, are, we consider ourselves to be ahead of the curve, um, rightly or wrongly, but actually some of the very basic process, which is why we've taken the approach of a kind of a chief digital officer, which is look, they're looking at our most time consuming processes, whether they're client or internal, yeah. and just breaking it down like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. And not buying the tech, because otherwise the tech drives a different yeah. process yeah, or outcome, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And there's, a real, there's a real difference, isn't there, um, between those technologies which have kind of practical application today and those uh, those which are you know coming into their own or are going to have a practical application later and and Sean and I were talking outside earlier about what's legal tech and what's not and I was really struggling um, to define one versus the other and it's all technology and if it helps we should have it and if it doesn't help we shouldn't we shouldn't have it yeah um, but it, the, the categories of technology if we going back to our question about buying technology to impress or buying it to you know get a return on investment let's say to you to use and, and, and adopt um, there's certain technologies out there which are more used to impress, and there are other technologies out there which are, which are um, of, of practical application today. So, um, uh, I suppose we we can ask, and I would say just just interrupt us with questions as we as we go along. But um, um, my my view um, on uh, uh, smart chain and and you know if I've got an artificially intelligent um, smart chain. blockchain, blockchain. <laughs> smart contract. Is this project. another one I've not heard of? Yeah. <laughs> then you know I will I will get lots of press in the in the in the marketplace. But um, is it fair to say that certain categories of technology are solely out there to, to to crystal ball gaze or to just look fantastic in the marketplace that you are at the cutting edge or or actually is that unfair and are, are firms looking to get a return on their investment from those those nascent technologies today? I mean, I think there's a lot, there's a lot of hype in the market now, and clients have kind of rode the the wave with everybody over the last few years. And the the play that I'm certainly making at the moment with our clients is, 
Um, keep it simple. Go back to basics. What can you do around email management, document management, um, to make that pre process more efficient? Not to say that we've not got a view in terms of the, the medium term and long term disruption to the industry. Um, mm -hmm. My thought around sort of web based negotiation. Um, there's a few products in the market, uh, Scribestar, um, Smashdocs, um, Avoca. Mm -hmm. You know that's got the potential to really disrupt the way that people negotiate and actually make it a lot more simple than actually having Word documents and emails. Um, so we've definitely got a view of that but uh, and we're tracking it, but right now it's probably too much of a change for lawyers to kind of pivot to use that type of technology unless they're kind of taken on a journey through, as we talked about earlier, taken on that journey through some other form of bigger technology in the market, like one of your legacy document management systems or VDR systems. Um, that, that's my view. But so for those who don't know, we're, we're talking about um, collaboration internally on a document, so lots of people editing a document at the same time, but also externally, so that you don't have version one, two, three, four, or five of a particular document. You're all working on the same document, um, probably not at the same time, because um, that'd be a bit unmanageable, but essentially one side works on the document communally, and then and then you release it, and it's just one document in the middle, and, and um, that leads to some very, um, very interesting places. Yeah. So I suppose on the one hand, in, in, we're, we're talking about, you know, I, I'm, I'm yet to find examples where blockchain and smart contracts is, is providing a return on, on firms' in investment. Um, and on the other side, we get down to the really, the, the kind of the mundane, as it were, although still saving lots of time, the kind of document management systems and email filing and things like that through to um, document automation, which is, which is what we do, and workflow and those kind of traditional technologies. And there's a blurred line. And if we got all of the, the, the press coverage over the last, let's say, um, six months, then I'm sure there would be a disproportionate amount of um, uh, column inches which which would be um, spent on the latest technologies because they're more interesting I, I suppose is, is what I'd say in their their cutting edge rather than the things which are uh, the technologies which are pe people are applying day to day so so moving on to the kind of the the, the current tech that um, everybody on the on the panels using so if if we think of the I mean, selecting a technology is just the, the first step to getting a return on your investment. And I was talking a bit about this um, um, <coughs> yesterday at the, at the start of the conference. So um, you've, got to, you've got to select it, license it, implement it. You've got to get the users to adopt it. Um, and then you might get a return on investment. Um, and, and I suppose we can, we can talk about some of the difficulties there. Perhaps, perhaps Mike, you can talk about the, the, the best way from when you're implementing these these projects to get the end users, because you're using these technologies every day, to buy into the process and at what stage they should be in, engaged in the tech buying process. I think um, from experience of trying to bring things into, well, not just the business, so like a law firm, um, they need to be involved at the very beginning. They need to be consulted at the, at the very start of any any sort of process to think, to think we've done some research and development <clears throat> or we've had some suppliers come in, we've seen a couple of tools that we like the look of, and they seem to fit a, uh, a solution that we think will solve one of your problems. Do you agree with that? And then that's when you start to, to get them involved. Um, and you actually want your lawyers to come in and be like, no, I don't think I would ever use that, or yeah, I would really use that, or, or maybe if it had this and that, and then you can feed that back and you can actually join them with like, actually get them to meet the tech suppliers and speak to tech suppliers and, We've got quite um, a good team of like knowledge lawyers as well within the sort of PSLs in the firm, um, and then they're really useful resources for people like me in, in a team like mine to actually be able to go and speak to and say, well, you're the one who knows how it's supposed to work in this team. Does it actually work like that? Like I've got the process of what everyone should be doing, and I've got what the lawyers should be doing. What actually work happens in practice? Because if I think about a way of making um, a solution that fits a specific problem that one lawyer has, they probably it could be the case that they shouldn't have that problem because they're just doing something wrong. Or that everyone has that problem even though that no one thinks that they have a problem like that. Um, and it's quite hard to do all that in your own little silo as an innovation team. You have to make sure that you really bring lawyers on board and there's, that's got its own challenges in that the lawyers in a firm are lawyers and they, that's what they do. That their full-time job. Um, is to fear and, and there's the pressure of that added on top of me ringing someone up every day being like I need to come on you said you'd meet me um, and it's that cultural aspect of changing that attitude by lawyers and there's, there's a lot of people lawyers within our firm that are really good at that and then there's some that maybe aren't, aren't as good but that's getting them involved as early as possible is 
key, I think. So, so yeah, we um, just on that point, we spent, I spent two years um, at Freshfields, I don't know if this is on, uh, I spent two years at Freshfields working on a technology where we did absolutely everything right, building a system from the ground up, getting clients involved, doing client workshops, getting lawyers involved, building what was a fantastic product, anyone knows what it is, um, and uh, we rolled it out to the lawyers, lawyers who said, if you had this, I would use it, and then you roll it out to them, and they're so bloody busy that there's no way for them to pivot onto it. They're like, yes, this would save me some time, but actually I've got a client breathing down my neck to do a document, and I can't figure out how to use this new system. So they just went back to, to the old ways of working. Um, and it was really tricky to get engagement. I think that's really key. And the point I was making earlier to James, it's kind of like the BBC website 10 years ago where you'd log in and it would just completely change and you'd be like, oh, I don't know where anything is. It's really important from a business change perspective to give a solution to lawyers and then to kind of slowly and incrementally take them on a journey because the minute you've got a big jump from the way that they work right now to what they need to do in the future, it's just not going to work and they're going to constantly go back to the way that they know is safe to create and generate these documents because the client needs it. Yeah, there is a, a massive change management aspect to, to bringing that sort of stuff in. Yeah. So per perhaps um, if anyone's got a good example of how it, you know, a, a process like that which has really worked for, you were talking earlier about your, your email filing, but there's either a process that's really worked for your either current or past firms in terms of implementation of, of projects where you've done it all, all right and then you have the adoption at the end because that can be a real that can be a real challenge. I mean, my view is that you'll never get 100% adoption. Yeah. Even document management systems right now in every law firm, they're not adopted 100%. The only technology in a law firm that's adopted 100% is email. Um, and that's been around for a Once. very long time. So and time so it, recording And time recording, well, ish. If you don't get your secretary to do it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, anything that you can do around making the process of sending emails, receiving emails, filing emails, organising emails, dealing with emails, anything you can do around that, it's going to be a no-brainer for, for me. And sometimes, I, we um, have been doing a lot in the collab space, and sometimes it's the things that you aren't expecting. So we developed a solution around um, how we were going to work with a client on the documents but actually from their information security policies just prevented them from being able to upload things into the solution we'd selected, which we, d we hadn't, even though we'd worked with a legal team, they were happy with it. And so, we've, so they were having to go through their Gmail account to upload documents. Some of the basic things that you aren't anticipating, that automatically sends everyone back to the old way of working. Oh, we'll just share it on email. Sure, it's, yeah. And when it, you're busy, it's super easy to just say, look, I know what yeah. I'm doing. And that, so it's not just the buy-in of the law firm and the change, but and, and the legal team where the client is, the legal team then has to get the buy-in from yeah. their tech or their information security to allow you to, the processes to change at their end as well. And you end up with these big clients who have got like 50 panel law firms. And all these 50 panel law firms are all talking about collaboration portals. Log into our collaboration portal and we can collaborate with you. But the in-house teams at these big firms yeah. don't want to log into to 50 portals. No. They only want to log into one. And that's where email starts to look really interesting again because they can communicate with everybody in one place. So I think that's a kind of trend. That we've got a few clients at Travers where it's a kind of one-to-one -one relationship and we do all the work for them. So collaboration portals is going to make complete sense. Mm -hmm. But where you've got these big FTSE 100 companies <coughs> who have got 50 panel law firms, we're all selling them the same tech. We're all skinning the same tech that's in the market and putting our logo in front of it and saying, use our platform to share data, use our platform to collaborate on. Um, and the clients are just getting a bit sick of it. And I think that's now why we're seeing a little bit of an intermediary market coming out with things like Aperio, where they're kind of centralising that so the client can log into one place but get all of their billing data from all of the firms that they work for. Um, and I think that will continue. I think my view is it will end up with a jumping ahead a bit slightly, but a, a kind of intermediary market for other things other than just kind of practice management and billing data. And it is yeah. just, it's the practical things. I mean, if, if, if email didn't exist and we tried to sell email to firms these days, they'd, they'd laugh you out of the room, you know. It's mostly insecure, lots of duplication of documents, highly inefficient, you know, what do you think? And they'll say, no, you know, no chance. But, but actually it's what we're used to using and so it's, you know, tech is only one aspect of the whole journey to getting a return on investment and it's, um, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, there, there's lots of opportunity for efficiency gains, I'd say, in, in, um, in, in most firms. But um, um, I mean, what, what's day to day, because you're all, you're all imp implementing this technology, what, what do you say are the, are the, are the biggest frustrations you, you have um, in your in your in your day to day lives for 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 the lawyers adopting um, all of this technology, which you you see the benefit in. I think that um, sort of feed, like on a common theme, it is 
the engagement and it is making sure that as a firm, you need to approach that. We're, we're trying to approach it as a firm rather than it coming out of the innovation team and sort of forcing lawyers to do stuff. We're trying to say, as a firm, have some space as a lawyer to actually think about this sort of stuff, to actually work with the guys in my team and to actually think about engaging with the technology. And I think that that's still one of my key frustrations is that like we're so time poor as, as, as people in a law firm. Um, and it's just trying to get that little bit of space, a little bit of breathing space to just think, actually, yeah, this, this is better. This is a better way of working and this is, and once, once you, and I work with like lawyers across every single division in our firm and when they get it and they would start using stuff, they're suddenly like, oh yeah, this, this, is lo this is loads better. This is so much easier. And then that passes and goes through to other people okay, um, you in say their teams. You say I told you that 12 months ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you can't say I told you so to everyone. Cause yeah. <laughs> the lawyers. Yeah, but I suppose yeah, one yeah. of the ways that firms can, can improve that is, um, you know, making space in their diary by, by changing the way that they, um, um, their billing targets and the way they bill, and that's a... Um, but, but actually, if they're motivated to just hit their numbers in a, in a traditional way, then um, it, they're effectively doing it on their own, on their own time. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I don't know whether anyone's got any question for, for questions for any of the, any of the panel members um, before, we, before we just wrap up. So, Karen at the back there. It's not on. We can we can hear you up here. Yeah. Okay, I'll try again. All this better. Um, okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about tech incubators, which some of the larger firms are mm. setting up, and I, re I appreciate that might be difficult if you're involved in one. But just generally, do you think those um, from, from the law firm perspective are they those more to impress clients, or are they actually currently delivering a return on value? Because there seems to be a lot of investment in lots of technologies, uh, rather than just focusing on you know, specific ones for those firms that are that are doing that? So, so I could probably talk to um, Freshfields because they've just announced that they've launched one this week um, and I was heavily involved in that before I left and joined Travis Smith and I must say that it is a fantastic space that they have. It's um, it's kind of like in the kind of shoreditch of Berlin. Um, there's all these huge companies there and they've got all their innovation hubs in the same in the same building and then they've got the, the Freshfields Innovation Hub and you're literally having a coffee listening to somebody talking about how they're going to disrupt Volkswagen's business model. So it very much fits what you're trying to do in legal. Um, I think in terms of uh, bringing in companies and then kind of helping them develop a product and then getting exclusivity out of the back of that and stuff. I, I, I'm not a big fan of that, but I think in terms of getting clients into an innovative space and starting to talk about like some problems that they have, understanding their innovation maturity, if it's kind of document automation or something really innovative, and then taking that back and either looking at off-the-shelf products or looking to build stuff, I think there's, there's a lot of value in that, definitely. And from our from a kind of tech provider perspective, um, some of you might know that we're part of the Slaughter and May Collaborate. Um, I'm not sure you call it an incubator. I don't think I did, I'm, I'm not sure what they what they'd call it, but it's a it's a collaboration. Um, and there's a group of clients. There's obviously this, the Slaughter and May team, and then there's a there's a few tech providers. Um, what what we're finding really useful there is that. You know, we need to listen as tech providers. We can't develop this technology in a vacuum. And although we have um, lots of lots of lawyers in the in the Claralist team, we actually need to see what practical barriers there are between us and these clients of Slaughter May and Slaughter May themselves are adopting our technology. So the the example we had earlier about the fact that you have to go back to Gmail and upload the documents, let's say individually or whatever, those kind of th gems come out of those conversations. And so in terms of guiding you so that you have a really applicable solution, um, it's really great. I, I think one of, the, one of the key reasons firmed, it's not to make money, but to look good is a, is a, is a, a um, I'd say uh, um, a dominant reason for, for firms to, to, to launch these incubators because it does make them look as though they're at the, at the cutting edge of the marketplace. And, and most of them that are doing, doing the incubators are, to, to be fair. Um, we're so not. So Kemp Little aren't. We have our own technology company. Um, and we're over at Plexel, where we in the space, which is kind of a broad tech startup um, accelerator. So that's how we approach it. Um, and that's 
through choice, but we've found that a lot of the things we've developed in-house um, because of issues with, with third parties not quite hitting the mark of what we needed it to do. So it's a lot easier to, to, to develop the technology within how, you know, and understand the processes and how we work and how our clients work and do it that way. And out of shores also, we don't have anything that's sort of like an incubator. I think we work with a lot of different providers, but um, I, my opinion is that it's, it is big on marketing. It's really, really beneficial to have that as a marketing ploy. Um, for a law firm, it does make you look really, really innovative, but I think there is a benefit in working alongside, like for people like me, I'd love to work alongside these like tech companies and be in a room with them and actually work with them. But then I also wonder, for the lawyers sat in the divisions, how much contact do they actually have with the tech companies and the incubators and how much does it flow through to the people sat at their desks? Great, okay, so is, is there, just conscious of time, is there any more quick questions before we, before we wrap up? Um, okay, so I, I think in terms of the, 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 the subject matter, you know, uh, our firm's buying, buying technology to impress Yes, it's it's working in most cases, um, but also that you know that's quite short-lived in terms of, of its effect um, and the, the the practical uses of this technology. Whether we categorise it as law tech or just just technology, um, there's some great examples out there of, of, of firms making some real progress in the space. So, thanks very much to our to our panel members for sparing their sparing their time today. Thanks a lot. observations. Firstly, on the point about uh, law firms and incubators and doing it just to look good. Um, <clears throat> certainly, in the last six months, for obvious reasons, we've been quite big customers of legal services. And you learn a lot being a law firm, being a client of a law firm. And I've got to say, there was literally zero evidence of technology-enabled legal services going on in our IPO by our outside providers. So that was a real striking thing. And in the end, we did a load of it in-house ourselves and empowered ourselves to apply technology to certain things. But uh, you know, from that one anecdote, um, I, I would draw one lesson. Uh, the point about email is such a good one. How many times have we said that we've been looking for the killer app in legal? And of course, the killer app is email and it's been killing us for 20 years now and it will continue to do so I think. When I was at DLA we <clears throat> we thought it's time to start looking for life after email, let's invent something and we invented a thing called Grapevine which was a kind of Twitter-like ambient news feed that was intended to replace some email communication. We had a lot of fun, we got some traction but I, I don't see any way of dislodging email as the primary place in which people live, uh, certainly before I retire. I think it's, it's with us for another 20, 25 years. I can't see a way, a way out. It is the treadmill that people go to every minute of every day. And I, I think we have to live with it, not via having a thousand add-ins, I hope. Um, and then just a final comment about um, behavioral change, which I think, Sean, you, you picked on. Um, Jonathan Patterson and myself, Jonathan Patterson is the head of DWF Ventures, which is our incubator VCE thing. Uh, and we developed a really simple Boston box to help us to evaluate whether we should undertake a piece of legal tech, I suppose. And the Boston box had the two axes of uh, how much benefit is it going to create, low or high, stick that along one axis, axis, and how much behavioral demand does it impose on the end user? from low to high. And if you've got a low business benefit, high behavioral demand tech innovation, you might as well just forget it. The ones you're really looking for are high benefit, low behavioral demand. High benefit, low behavioral demand. I think Skype kind of falls into that category a little bit. It doesn't really demand too much change. Massively transformative to product productivity, although you might not believe it. Um, CRM, knowledge management, practice management systems, ERP, they're all in potentially high benefit, but very, very high behavioral demand. So we call those marriages. Uh, so we, we, um, we, we uh, came up with a name for each box, which maybe I'll share in another, another setting. But certainly for us, the mapping of behavioral demand against uh, the benefit is a key way of looking at 
whether it's worth bothering to try to make that change. Just one final observation. I don't know if our speakers are ready for... Uh, are we ready? Yeah, okay. So just one final observation. Um, just it, it, it's so difficult to imagine how you would get people out of email uh, that I wonder whether what we should actually be trying to do is drive significant innovation inside email. If you actually look at the email client, it has not changed since, well, does any, do any of you remember IBM Profs, which was a mainframe uh, email system? Then there was Microsoft Mail, there was WP Mail. The UI is exactly the same now as it was 35 years ago. And maybe the real evolution is gonna be somebody, and it would have to be Microsoft, being brave enough to evolve what happens in Outlook. But of course, we all remember what happened when Google tried to do away with folders. Anyone remember that in Gmail? Google tried to do away with folders and email. Said, you don't need folders and email. Uh, you're just gonna search for stuff. And they had to reverse that because Gmail users hated it. Anyway, that's just my 10 penworth. Okay, thank you very much, panel. Okay, we have another panel discussion now. If you could all make your way to the front, please, and I will speak slowly enough to allow you to make that short walk. We have Alistair, Ellen, and in a change from the Luminance attendee, we have Priya Baines. Priya, I hope you're in the room. I heard a whispered yes there. Maybe she put her hand up as well. Uh, and we have Fraser Matcham as well. So uh, over to you guys. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so, I guess I'd like to introduce a few panellists that we have just now. Um, Fraser, if you'd like to briefly introduce yourself first. So, uh, yeah, um, we're a different sort of type of um, legal technology type, we're actually sort of law tech, so we're consumer orientated opposed to saying to law firms, which is something rather different. Um, I've been working the last two years um, with a university on developing a ML-based search engine for consumers so they can type in whatever they want and we can diagnose their problem. Um, so it's a simple NLP engine um, supported with a bit of triage, uh, which we're launching later this year. And Priya? Um, yeah, so my name is Priya. Oops, let's do that. I head up the product team at Luminance, so recently we've been, uh, well, first and foremost, Luminance is a machine learning company. Um, we have researchers based in Cambridge. We serve lots of practice areas for a number of law firms' in-house teams across due diligence, Luminance discovery, compliance, and uh, well, our most recent product which we've launched, which is to aid the contract negotiation uh, process from start to finish. Hi, I'm Ellen Catherall. I'm an associate at Adelshaw Goddard, um, corporate lawyer by background. I now work um, in our innovation and legal technology team, the same, same team as, as Mike Kennedy, who was just on the panel before. Um, I sit in that team with a corporate and commercial hat on, so I basically am the translator between the lawyers and our corporate and commercial clients, and also between the lawyers again and our legal technologists. So we develop tools and technologies in-house and configure them. And I also go out and speak to clients and explain how we can work better together and more collaboratively. So my name's Alistair Wye. Um, very similar role to, to Ellen um, at Latham Watkins. Um, but before doing this type of role, I uh, was a leverage finance lawyer at Latham, at Ashurst, and, and briefly at Deutsche Bank as well. Uh, and in between time, I worked at a then startup called Raven. Who are now I manage Raven, and I believe probably many of you saw the, the session earlier by them. So uh, yeah, largely do the sorts of things that, that, that Ellen does. Bridging that gap really, I think, is the key the key thing to sum it up. 
Um, so that's us. I think I want to kind of keep things a little bit interactive as it's sort of the end, getting to the end of the day. Um, we've got a slightly controversial panel topic. I think the question is, do, do lawyers understand AI and machine learning? I think we, we just agreed as a panel that maybe a, 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 a way of flipping that question is, do lawyers need to understand AI and machine learning? And I guess it would just be good to get a show of hands if you think that they do need to uh, understand AI and ML. So who, who thinks that they do need to understand it? So, it's hard to say how, how much of the room that was. And who thinks they don't need to understand it? Okay. Who, I'm not sure who won the show of hands. Maybe the former, I'm not sure. But um, I, think it's a, I think we think it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. And I guess from that kind of show of hands, um, what do you all think? How much do they, do they need to know? And if they do, how much do they need to know, perhaps? So, should we start, so just starting with the, um, the sort of almost where are we now question, I thought sort of, so coming on to do, you know, do lawyers need to understand AI in a second? But I guess going backwards a bit, there's the first question of what do we mean by understand? And I know that's sort of deconstructing it a little bit. But if we mean by understand, if we mean the algorithms themselves and how they actually how they're coded, how they actually work, um, I, I'd say no. Um, no, lawyers don't need to understand the nuts and bolts. They don't need to understand under the hood. Um, although I know that there are hybrid lawyers here today who, who do. But I think if we mean understand as in understand how to use the tool, how to use AI as a, as a part of our toolbox with which to advise our clients, which at the end of the day is, is what we're there for, then like any other tool, I think the un it's yes and increasingly more so. So take, taking a, um, an example or analogy with, say, Microsoft Word, I wouldn't say that any lawyer needs to understand the nuts and bolts of how Microsoft Word itself is coded, but we do need to understand enough to be able to, to use it, and particularly in the context of, say, track changes, you know, the, the good one, why they're not, a, you know, what, what is the problem about the metadata, et cetera, why we would use that or not. So I think it comes back to what we mean by understand, I say. Priya? Mm. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I think this question also comes about from well, what's happened in the past couple of years in that there's been a huge investment in legacy solutions, which I think has caused some disillusionment in what to expect from the so-called AI and machine learning tools. And I think a part of this is part of the question that's being asked is because, understandably, people are trying to cut through the hype and trying to understand, OK, what actually is going to help us rather than the buzzword of artificial intelligence? So I think if you use that perspective, then yes, of course, it's natural for people to want to know what they are buying as a consequence of that. And I agree with Ellen in the sense that I don't think a lawyer needs to know exactly how that, um, uh, that concept learns in the process of the entire their system and the, you know, the feedback of the learning. But what I think is important is they understand how to use it. And I think, first of all, there's, there's a different approach for different vendors which I do um, agree with. And I think in the past, if legacy solutions are very kind of rules-based, there's lots of training required. And therefore, I guess that does um, beg the question, yeah, OK, fine, they, should, they do need to know that because that's not easy to use. But that's what we should be striving towards is a tool that doesn't disrupt the, the lawyer's review process. It's something that learns as they interact with the documents. Um, so in which case, no, they don't need to know exactly how that works, but they need to know enough to make sure that they're using that, um, well, they're getting the most out of the tool that well, they're, they're using in their document review. Fraser, you, you work with consumers. Do you think there's a different angle in terms of what consumers need to know to the extent they interface with a, an artificial intelligence or an ML product in legal? Yeah, I mean, as, as I was saying in the, um, in, in the, in the room earlier, uh, it's a complete different side of things. It's not a professional trying to endorse a platform which then they're ultimately going to use and they have to deliver value. Um, lawyers always talk about value uh, in legal tech, um, whereas we in law tech talk about impact. And you know, to be able to deliver impact, you have to provide positive results to consumers. And consumers validate a law tech solution via a successful outcome, getting what they paid for effectively, and then that ultimately builds trust. Um, and being able to get there, consumers actually 
from, from our study, they don't care about whether it has AI in it or not. What they care about is getting what they paid for uh, and getting it a good quality and when they want it. Um, so I think there's definitely a big differentiator there uh, between uh, you know, a professional service provider and a, in particular a lawyer endorsing a platform and a law tech company providing a platform to a consumer. And I guess moving on to what, would, what do we think the, the risks and obstacles are to getting AI and machine learning systems adopted into a legal offering, whether that's a consumer or business space? Um, I think the question that I get asked a lot is mostly centred around accountability, um, which I think is, can sometimes be perceived as a risk in that uh, there might be an expectation where a customer might think that you know, a luminance or any, any tool will be making decisions for them. And I think that's where we need to, that's where lawyers do need to understand how AI and machine learning works in order to gain a realistic perspective. So, and I think we have the other end of the spectrum, which is what we've had, which is basically, you know, um, a load of rules-based system. And then you have something that, you know, you want, do you really want to have a tool that makes decisions for your business? I don't think so. I don't think that's what we should be doing at all. Um, what, you know, as Ellen said um, earlier, they need to be regarded as a tool to augment the lawyer, make them better, to accelerate them rather than replace them, which is also kind of links into this, you know, the hype that we have in the media around the robot lawyer. In essence, it shouldn't, you know, there is no such thing. Um, a, a human is not code. There are many decisions that make that go into um, reviewing documents, especially in industry where so much is open to interpretation. I think also there's, there's a change management piece, really, and that comes back to um, I guess the understanding and the transparency about the tool, the tool that we're using. So we've found that um, people are much more willing and able to use the tool when they understand the ins and outs and they understand how it, how it works. Um, if they don't understand what it can do, and also more importantly, I guess what it can't do, then they're much more, um, they're much less willing to use it. Um, so it comes down to confidence and trust and, and that um, product not being a complete black box that is sort of impenetrable, I guess. I guess, I guess one thing like historically, and I think even today rules-based systems have, have a value, particularly when, usually when they're combined with some sort of machine learning. Machine learning can get you to kind of the, the ballpark and then sometimes you need a little set of rules to get you to the ball. Do you think there's a, a difference in terms of the explainability of the rules part, if that's part or the whole of the system, and the machine learning part that, in terms of the lawyer's ability to understand, audit, and explain how that system reaches outcome A versus B, do you think there's a difference between the level of understanding required for one system versus the other, um, and whether it matters, I guess? I think, it, I think it depends, actually, to some extent, what you're using AI for. So I think, in a way, AI is a confusing concept because it's, it underpins a lot of different tools. Mm. So just looking at it in the context of, say, um, uh, intelligent workflow, for example, it's a very different sort of use of AI to um, analysing what's in a document review um, context or pick, extracting terms from a document. Um, so I think... Being able to really understand how how the machine has made a decision in terms of a workflow piece or something similar to it is a very different thing to um, being able to see how it's cho why it's chosen to extract that information from a document review. And at the end of the day, if you want to check on a document review, you can to some extent, you know, manually manually look into it. Um, whereas if you're relying on it to decide on the next task in a process. Um, to some extent, you need to, you, you have to rely on it. So I think it, it depends on the um, a bit on the context. I would agree with that because you know if you've got a rules based system, um, generally they are harder to use. So if it's the lawyer that's using that, um, then they do need to understand the difference between those systems because that does impact how you use it, um, just on a base level. So, for example, if, I've, um, if I'm having to input a, a series of queries to obtain the information that um, I want, I mean, of course that's going to be hard to implement because, I mean, if it was me, why would I 
do, uh, I want to take 20 more minutes for me to do something when I've got a deadline of a review that needs to be handed in tomorrow. No wonder it's so hard to implement those kind of tools. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting point. I mean, somebody, I've been working with my team exactly on this. I mean, we have a component which is entirely segregated as an MLware decision. Uh, but then that triggers a certain point where you then follow through a simple triage. Um, and we have to do that because we can't get down to the real important stuff for a consumer um, without presetting certain areas. Um, but interestingly, we can get to a trigger point using pure ML. Um, and, and that's what I, well, I'm always fascinated by what I'm doing because I'm doing it. But I mean, um, it, it's a really interesting point uh, with triage because I guess people say it's not true AI, for instance, um, but that's not the point. It's not the point of whether you know, we're using a certain technology or not. The point is, do we get to an outcome that we want and do we get to an outcome that we can stand our name by? Um, and that's the reason why I went with that route. And how easy do you think it is to, to really kind of get, get across to, to legal users, whether they're a lawyer or a consumer, how best to adopt this technology, how to build confidence in the way that they're using the system? Because um, I guess, depending on the, the type of methodology that the system uses, there's different ways to interact with that system. Um, I would guess with, with rules, there is a certain level of control that you can kind of define the rules, but obviously they're brittle to sight unseen changes in documents or process. And then the flip side of that is with machine learning, it's largely dependent on garbage in, garbage out. And if the, say it's the attorneys training it, sorry, lawyers, um, they need to understand what they're training and what impact that has on the system. In the latter case, is that sometimes a barrier to adoption that has to be overcome? And if so, how do you overcome it to get people using it, adopting it, and, and delivering that value for, for clients, whoever they are? I think from, um, from what we've seen, actually the best way of getting something to be adopted by, by lawyers, or by, frankly by anyone, is to give it a go and see that it works. Now, the barrier to entry there is time. Yeah, it would be great if everyone had enough time to sit down and give, give it a go, um, but that's not not that realistic. So what we do is um, we have our innovation and legal tech team and then we work very closely with our lawyers to show um, show how it works. And we've, we often spend time on things like proof of concept for, very, for small, smaller data sets and say, right, give it a go. Mm -hmm. um, see what comes out as well. See what, whether the output looks good and um, what doesn't look good. Um, so I think trying it, <laughs> is it, it if time permits, um, having said that, it's got to be trained in order for the output to be good enough it's, and, and valuable, it's got to be trained well. Um, again, that goes back to time and the, we found the best people to make sure that the training is done correctly is our lawyers on the ground. So um, I agree with your um, garbage in, garbage out, mm. it's, a, it's an important point. Yeah, I mean, I think just to, I guess, play devil's advocate here as well. So if you were using a more active learning approach whereby it's not disrupting your normal workflow and you're just reviewing the documents as you normally would, I mean, showing an example can be as simple as click a button. This is the text. This is the clause as your normal, you know, your normal workflow. So actually, in that sense, that training can just be, can just consist of what do I click? It doesn't necessarily need to be a, you know, um, so this clause must contain X, Y, Z in order for it to be tagged as uh, whatever label you would like. And I think, you know, uh, an example might be assignment, assignment to whatever. You, I think it will always depend on the approach that you're taking with the solutions that you choose. Um, and that will generally be governed by the technology that they use. So maybe from a consumer perspective, that might not be so important. But I do think that from in the context of document review, I, I do think that's important. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of adoption of consumers, uh, again, it, there is actually 
some similarities there mm -hmm. uh, between you know, both selling points is that you have to build trust, you have to build um, a knowledge base around what is it that this particular tool or service actually does, um, what are the outcomes and um, that sort of thing. But in terms of you know me on my law tech camp peering into the legal tech camp, um, you know, in terms of adoption, I, I really think there's a lack of vision and creativity in legal technology. There, there's, there's so much of the same being sold as a repackage. And I think it's because you know, we've had so many lawyers leave law firms to then create these companies, um, and they all end up creating the same thing, uh, which is ironic. Um, so I think you know, for there to be great adoption, there needs to be a greater spectrum of innovation. I think we need to see more innovation, and the only way we're going to do that is by um, educating people on, on what's possible, uh, yeah, and particularly generating and opening up more data for, for ML to be developed. And Fraser, do you think that also requires a different group of people in the room? Absolutely. Not just lawyers in an echo yeah. chamber or technologists in an echo chamber? Yeah. I mean, in, in the development of what too. we've been doing, I've tried to keep as many lawyers in the back room as possible and, and get more people who know absolutely nothing about law um, you know, the point is is to get a whole spectrum of people in the room um, because they bring different perspectives and you actually start to break down these barriers and um, get new insights and new ideas and that's where creativity flows, that's where new innovation develops um, and you need that. From the, also from the sort of day-to-day -day sort of lawyer perspective, there is also the question of interconnectivity of the other systems that we've got. So I think um, many law firms, their data is not in um, completely structured, it's not completely um, in some cases whole and actually one of the first things that you sometimes have to do is look at that data and start to clean up that data but yes, it, but again that, that takes a bit of time so that is an obstacle to adoption but I think um, the more that the tech or the, the product buying in can, can connect or be um, part of the existing systems and work with what's already there, um, the better for, for adoption and quick adoption on the ground. I think there is a big expectation gap. I think, I think Michael from uh, Brighter mentioned it earlier with the cat, cat photo thing. You know, People see on the internet that when I upload photos to Facebook, it can tag Alistair, Ellen, Priya, Fraser, provided I've tagged them before and it's learnt who these people are in the context of what I'm doing. And there's lots and lots of granular data that is captured on the fly. Everyone in this room is training machine learning systems all day. You've probably, since you woke up, opened your phone, begun training a system in some, some way, shape or form. And I guess one of the limitations to your, to your point, Ellen, I think is that there is not that level of tagging and enrichment of the data down to the really valuable parts that are the, the clause and the intra-clause variables. What, what does this clause mean? Okay, it's a transfer clause or an assignment clause, but actually the thing that definitely I as an attorney would want um, is actually what is that, is there a, a, short, a short tag for that piece of information? Is it transfer without consent or transfer without consent but on notice or something like that? And I think, I just feel free to just disagree, a lot of users come to the table thinking that the systems are already there and they might be but they need the data to be, to be there first I guess. Yeah. Do you disagree or agree? No, I'd agree. I'd agree. I think it comes all oh, that comes back to the education piece of making sure that people are aware, the people who are using it and are using it to help them advise their clients know the limitations of it. So, what it does, it does very well. Um, and it's, yes, it's it's also our job to look to the future. But um, but let's so what we actually have in in store at the moment um, and understand its limitations. Mm. But definitely. I mean, I would just. Uh, constantly disagreeing, but uh, I would disagree with that. I think that technology has advanced um, since those tools just because, and I think it's somewhere, it's meeting in the middle. It's kind of understanding that this clause means X, and then it's understanding whether I like that or not, uh, essentially the interpretation. So if I, for example, if I've got, um, let's, okay, I'll just, I'll use Luminance. So what Luminance can do is it understands patterns and language. It does that unsupervised. So essentially it can do that across clauses even though the substantive document itself is different, of course, if, if it's been drafted by different people, different templates, whatever. Um, so what you're able to do is actually understand the similarities and differences and model terms of those clauses um, 
at least showing you, uh, well, okay, these look like this, these look like that, and they can be part of the same clause. Um, now, whether that's something that is a problem to the client or the firm or the company, that I think always needs to remain in the lawyers with the lawyer's control. I mean, that's what they're that's what they're there to do. I don't think it should be there to replace that judgment aspect of it. I think that's I think that's a good point. That I had a discussion in the break about. I think there is a little bit of a gulf between the technology conversation, which is let's boil the ocean and return a bunch of stuff that is statistically similar than less similar. For instance, if you're trying to find a clause, but just, just for the fact that that clause is in a document in my document management system at Latham Watkins, it doesn't mean that it's a gold standard for that, that clause or even that document or even that type of transaction. And I guess that, that's the human layer that I think would really really adds value is the ability to then somehow curate that information to that level to say that this is a really good uh, transfer provision for mm -hmm. this type of deal in this type of market, perhaps even where we act opposite a particular law firm or a particular client. I think it's that sort of just-in-time information point. And again, I think that's where a lot of users think things are right now and that there's no effort involved in the journey from A to B. Would you, would you, would you agree that that's sort of preconception people have? that? Yeah, um, yeah. I think there's a lot. There's a lot of hype around what it, you know, what it can do, and, I, and we spend a lot of time saying, um, actually, what it does do very well is extract the relevant information in order for you to collect that data set and then analyze it, put your lawyer hat on top of it, and make an ad, you know, advise your client. Um, and I think it is important to understand that it doesn't answer the so what questions. Maybe yet. Maybe, maybe that. Maybe that's coming very soon. But. Um, but that that is the element that we still need a human a human to do with all that with the experience of um, of background of you know, legal training, but um, but yeah I do I think it's yeah. And Fraser, I guess in a different context. So I guess Ellen and I come from a, a law firm context where the users of these systems are typically lawyers to some or legal professionals you know experienced this. But if you're dealing with consumers that are interfacing with such systems, do you think they expect more in terms of what that system can deliver to them um, than say a legal user would where you kind of can join the dots with your legal knowledge? Yeah, I think consumers, well, it depends on what you're delivering to be honest, but I mean, when you're trying to create the actual platform itself, you know, thinking about you know, what is it the end user wants and how do we get there in the appropriate way, um, it's, it's very much the same. Uh, I mean, we're now moving to a point on the legal tech side of things where we're trying to retrain whilst in use. So lawyers will, will use the platform and in, the, in that use it will automatically retrain. Um, it's exactly the same in, in, in my world. Um, it's logical to do that. Um, and that's the whole point of using AI in the first place. It's the fact that you want to keep training it to build its proficiency to then get a better result. And that's, that's the longevity of the whole actual idea. We, we adopt AI because we want to, in the future, uh, run this autonomously. Um, and the whole point of us even using the technology is because we see ourselves in two, three years time not needing to um, manually enter any more information or manually review any more information because the system does it itself. Um, so I think the, the main takeaway is to, to not think about right now in terms of having to click that button all the time to retrain something. It's about what is it going to be like in three years' time um, when you've finished clicking that button and now the system does it on its own. Because um, you know, technology, has, as you said, has come a long way. Unfortunately, adoption hasn't because we still need to build on that proficiency. I mean, you know, look at autonomous cars. They've had billions thrown into that sector. Um, but for, for that particular type of delivery, yes, you've got all the regulation problem, but in terms of a decision-making platform uh, that underlines that software, you've got to have something that's 99.999% accurate for it to even be worthwhile. Getting to that level of proficiency takes years of training, um, and it's exactly the same for, for our types of systems. Just, just conscious of time, I think we've got, got five more minutes. Um, Throwing out to the audiences some questions, I think, I think that's a really good point that Fraser's underlined there, that back to the expectation management issue, that 
I think people take for granted that Google has been around for a long while now, Amazon's been long, around for a long while now. They've had the benefit of, I don't know whether it's in the trillions, but certainly in the billions of clicks and searches, and that's why it's so good now. I, mean, I think if you can think back to when Google first came out, it was great, it was better than the kind of clunky keyword searching of Alta Vista and that, but it had to take time and it's continued to improve over time. I think there is an investment angle in terms of the thinking that goes behind this, whether this is a long-term or short-term win you want to get to. So with that, are there any questions for the panel about what we talked about this afternoon? Thanks, Alistair. Um, just on that, at that point you make about Google and Facebook, etc., talking about AI and some of the things that they're trying to solve at the moment and failing, so things like um, you know, harmful content on Facebook, etc., and when you dig underneath that, there's a lot of humans trying to solve that problem, as in, and it's kind of an interesting one of kind of how are you seeing the balance between using the tools and the number of humans and how much supervised pieces that need to go into that rather than this kind of 100% AI piece that's going on. So kind of back to kind of slightly countering your point about Facebook and Google because they're struggling with exactly this problem at the moment. I think, I think that raises a good point. I think for, I think, I think there, there, there is that kind of blurring that it's great that Google has good type ahead search and that I can start typing for, I don't know, future, and then it probably knows the next word is lawyer because I'll probably search for the website to download the agenda. Um, and I think people kind of make a leap between being able to do that, which is pretty much automated um, through people's clicks and interactions, through to the more semantic level of interaction, which is the moderation. You know, if, how, how do I know, for instance, if I'm on Facebook spouting something that I'm making an ironic joke versus actually I'm a bigot? Um, unless you know me, you probably wouldn't be able to tell. Uh, and indeed, I, you know, I've made some ironic comments on, online. I made one the other week about um, Nigel Farage getting uh, trapped in a bus uh, by milkshake wielding people. And someone I know on Facebook said that I was justifying um, left-wing right violence against right-wing. I said, no, this is just, it's, I've said it's incredible in the sense of it's astonishing that this is the state of affairs that we have in our <laughs> politics and our reporting. But I guess that's probably a good, a good example. Out of context, that's quite hard for a machine to figure out. For people, that's quite hard to figure out. This person was actually my maths teacher from school and should know better that I'm making a joke, but didn't. And I think that is the challenge. I think getting to that really human level of uh, nuance about the data, and I think legal is a, is a really hard example because there's so many layers of meaning. Um, I, th I think Mike, Michael from Bright has got a really good diagram somewhere with like a pyramid of different layers of in interpretation intuition. And I think one of the questions I used to get asked at Raven was, can this tell if it's a high risk or a low risk provision? And I used to say, well, OK, of this panel, we're all, assume we're all lawyers. We could have a conversation. I could say it's B, interpretation. Ellen could say, sorry, I could say A, you could say B, you could say C, you could say D. And actually, after talking it through, we might agree it's F. And that might mean, that might be because there's extra facts that we need to consider that sit outside of that piece of text, um, or it might not. And I think, I think that's where these systems kind of reach a wall right now. I don't know if that answers, answers the question. But you've also then got to put, put the client perspective in, in there as well and say, well, what's the, what's the risk appetite of that client? And that's the X factor, I guess, that there is no pass through into the tech at the moment. So you're, that's, that's still the lawyer's job to advise based on the knowledge of the risk appetite of the client and the, the matter in question. What does all this mean for them? And I think that, that subjective element of a, of a data set yeah. is, is the lawyer's bit as well. Yeah, because it will mean one thing to one client, one thing to yeah. another. I guess that makes sense. Any more questions? Um, hi, it's Vicky Abbotton at From Council. Um, I was just wondering what your view was in terms of the traditional sort of law firm partner enumeration model of profits per partner based on fees brought in that year and how that impacts on when you talk about systems that have some form of benefit in three to five years. I personally think it goes some way to explaining why often law firms are somewhat behind on, on the technology side of things, but I don't know what your view is on how that provides a hurdle or if it's no longer a hurdle. Multi-million or billion dollar question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Literally. 
I think so. I mean, I think there's two elements to that. I think there's one thing about, oh, this is going to be beneficial to me in three years. And I think, and it's just, it's not. It, was, it will provide immediate um, benefits to you, which you know, means nothing when I say it, but uh, I'm trying to think of an anecdote. So, okay, so recently we had a top 100 global law firm use Luminance to review 200,000 German employment contracts. So manually, a similar review, I believe, took them 10 lawyers, two weeks, to actually only review 10% of the documents. I mean, understandably, there's 200,000. Um, but what we did is we said, OK, fine, let's run this in Luminance. So I, this is, I think, starting, well, oh, it's ironic that I'm about to say start small, but we started on 200,000. But I, what I mean is start on one project, because that will then provide a nice case study and a, 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 you know, a really proof of value there to then pitch that going forward. But essentially, that review took two lawyers in the same amount of time reviewing 100% um, of the documentation. But I think the important thing there is you're able to see more, not less. Um, obviously, they're in German, so you know we didn't have you didn't train anything. It's the system needs to understand those patterns without any prior knowledge. And I think you do that with more confidence because you've had, you've negated basically outsourcing and sampling in order to do that. You've got more control over your review, not less, in an immediate time frame. Mm. And, and no one's trying to present that they are. Yeah. So by the combination of people and training and data and information, you're just not going to see an immediate impact. And it is really the best thing in the future. Sorry, I couldn't really hear that from the back. Sorry, I'll run over again. I think that's a really obvious kind of example of maybe where you immediately see a mm -hmm. result, whereas there are a lot of legal tech solutions, I think, that are by a combination of, and, and, and the people putting those forward and not trying to pretend anything different, yeah. by a combination of people, upskilling people, you know, the culture and data and, and so on, a combination of all those things mean that it, it is an investment for the future. And sometimes I think that can be quite tricky for a, a partnership to look at and say, okay, that's all right, I'll put my money in now, mm. knowing I might not necessarily see that personally you know, rewarded to me, my investment. And I, I sometimes wonder if that's a bit of a blocker on a personal level, not that you oh, know, right, the partnership would say it as a whole. <laughs> I think, I mean, it can be just simply because, well, first of all, you know, when you've got the partnership is one, one matter just convincing one partner, you've then got hundreds of others that also need to, you need to kind of cut through. And I think that does pose as a, um, an obstacle to, um, adoption, um, but I guess I, I, I'm seeing the time out section. But I can we can talk about it after about you know certain things that we've done to kind of tackle that as well. Can I just put the client point out there? When clients ask for it and when they're and demanding it, and we see, um, I'd say every RFP um, mentions it, um, it doesn't become that difficult to sell. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Right, well, I think we'll wrap that up. I think we're a bit over. Thank you. <laughs> okay, mercifully, it's time for a bit of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's actually sex, drugs, and lateral recruiting. Howard is going to be addressing us for 15 minutes. Then you will have a well deserved break. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. So I'm I, know, I realize I'm standing between you and the next break, so I will be brief, and then we can hopefully throw it into questions. Um, I am the former Washington, D.C. office, and also spent about 15 years working for Berwyn Leighton Paisner, now Brian Cave Leighton Paisner, in a variety of roles. And so my background is really on the strategy and business development side of the business. And I was always, again, on, in both of those roles, I was, I've always been asked by numerous partners about when it came to lateral recruiting in terms of individuals, teams, or groups, Howard, what do you think of the opportunity that's in, that's in front of us? 
And I was always left kind of scratching my head as a kind of a commercial person. I had uh, all the interview notes of all every, every kind of partner, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I had the pro forma CFO uh, uh, from the CFO in terms of the financials. I had all the CVs from the recruiters. And I'm still left scratching my head is, what's the quality of the book of business? And more importantly, what are those, those client relationships going to be like long term? And I thought there had to be a better way for to get a, a make better for the firm to make better decisions because the firm, firm it's not just those two firms but the the industry average is about one at fifty percent success rate so rolling the dice one every two kind of succeed over the course of five years that's a that's a huge attrition rate in this industry and it hasn't changed in the last twenty five years um, we thought that something had to change. And, the, and Decipher was born about three years ago to address that very need in the industry. So Decipher, what it does, what we do, is we do deep dive intelligence on lateral hire partners before they get hired. The idea is that if you have, if you have better intelligence, more complete intelligence, you will make, be making a better series of decisions around the board table. So in terms of the industry, everyone's doing a lot of recruiting. It's almost like the Hunger Games out there, a lot of managing partners say. Um, what's interesting is that more than half of all AMLA 200 firms, and this translates to kind of the UK market as well, on average, they're doing about six laterals per year, each and every year. That's the equivalent of a mini merger that's happening every single year in terms of sourcing, integration, payment, onboarding. It's a huge endeavor and firms seem to be struggling with that whole process. Again, as I mentioned, the attrition rate, the churn rate, um, and this is what's fascinating, you spend, firms spend all this energy recruiting, no matter where they are in the world, and at the end of the day, when you tally up the, the wins and losses, at the end of five years, it's roughly half. Half of the, half, half the people that they employ are successful, for whatever reason, maybe they didn't bring in the book of business, maybe they just have sharp elbows and can't work culturally within the firm, but the stats are amazing. And also what's amazing is that this is a people-based people industry. The assets walk out the door every night, yet we have a lot of conversations about technology, about marketing, about finance, yet the core assets of the firm are people, and that's the best that we can do. There's, there's got to be, that has to change going forward. So again, I, I apologize to some of the kids in the audience because I'm about to say some pretty uh, uh, <laughs> pretty outrageous things because these are these are actually headlines that were have been in the press the last 12 months. Um, Mayor Brown partner resigns after allegations of inappropriate conduct services above the law. Latham and Watkins head steps down over sexual communications. Quinn Emanuel sacks London partner for inappropriate behavior. Hughes Hubbard partner accused of masturbating at the gym. Baker McKenzie regrets shortcomings in sexual misconduct investigation. Hogan Lovell's partner suspended for watching porn at work. It goes on and on and on. And it used to be that you'd find some of these headlines once in a blue moon. They are happening very, very frequently. These have come, these have happened the last six months alone. There's been a step change in the industry because the press is getting a hold of this in terms of this inappropriate behavior. It's no longer being tolerated. The Me Too campaign is in a full swing and law firms still need a step change in the way that they vet and, and, and do deep dive research before they ask them to join the partnership, I think. As I mentioned, we do um, we do the we actually do the investigations on on lateral partners worldwide, and I've I've got four examples of this is the this is the type of commentary that we're able to get when our analysts get on the phone and talk to a variety of people, whether they are clients, former colleagues, market peers, opposing counsel. This these are the kind of conversations that we have on the phone. These nuggets of information, this, these nuggets of source commentary, go into a report, go back to a client within 10 days. This is what the board of a lot of law firms are reading, courtesy of Decipher. So, the first one. 
This is at a, this was this was from a partner of a magic circle firm who said to us, "Okay, here it goes. Run away from him as fast as you possibly can. We were at firm X together. Long pause. He was a complete and total disaster. I'm talking professionally. I'm talking personally. The works. This is not a cool guy at all. Let's see. He's a yeller. He's got a real short fuse. I know women who felt very intimidated by him, and I'm not talking professionally. I mean, they were uncomfortable around him. Phenomenal. Partner at an Amlaw 50 firm. Oh, I remember this guy. I was an associate at the time. Let's just say he was not my favorite guy. He was extremely impolite extremely disrespectful, astoundingly rude to me, and I was his co-counsel. He is one of the reasons I don't do as much IP work. I think IP attorneys are generally oddballs. This guy takes the cake. At one point, he insulted the genetic makeup of the plaintiff's counsels of children. I wish I could remember the actual line, but I just remember when he said it, I wanted to crawl under the table. I was so embarrassed to be next to him. When I tell people stories of the worst experience I've ever had in law, I talk about this guy. Another Amlaw 10 partner. Um, I know this person. Is this off the record? I would absolutely never ask his opinion on anything. He's an embarrassment to the legal community. He's just all talk. He's merely a flamethrower in the courtroom, and everyone knows it. He's not at all respected in the New York space, and he's certainly not thoughtful as a thought leader in any shape, way, or form. And the last one, which is, which is one of my favorites. Well, how honest do you want me to be? He had possibly the worst people skills I have ever come across. He believed that shouting was an acceptable way to communicate with his juniors. I mean, the man was borderline psychotic. Now, it wouldn't be, f I mean, uh, while these quotes are entertaining, this is the reality of what's in people's pipelines and across the AMWA 200, Magic Circle, and Silver Circle firms that we are engaged with. This is after they have come through whatever interview process has kind of weeded them out and whatever internal due diligence the firms have uncovered themselves. We go far deeper than they will go, but this is the information that we have found after it comes through kind of whatever filtration system is already in place. Whether that's frustrating or amazing or enlightening, I don't know, but that's the reality of what we're dealing with in terms of the, 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 the people's pipeline. And on that note, happy to take any questions. Hi, Quinn. Um, quick, one question. In terms of collecting the data to gather all of this, um, I understand you use um, sort of human power, if you like. Um, where do you see the role of technology in, in sort of gathering this kind of business intelligence? It's a great question. Um, we're probably the most untechnology driven firm that exists, probably in the legal space. Um, the core team of analysts that we have employed uh, were 20 full-time analysts. Um, they get, well, there's, a, there's an intense research phase that maps out a candidate across 100 to 150 contacts that either know or have worked with the candidate. That's all done with the various databases that we have access to and some that, you, that people probably don't because we're licensed. Uh, LinkedIn is a good source for connections as well. But the real power of doing what we're doing is actually getting on the phone. So the, our technology is the phone. We make hundreds and hundreds of telephone calls on an assignment across those four main buckets of people that will know you, clients, former colleagues, market peers, opposing counsel, and get that raw commentary. And we do it in such a way where we do it on a, what's called a double blind basis, that we never mention our client's name on the phone, and we never mention the candidate in isolation. We surround that target candidate with a cohort of seven, eight, nine, ten 10 other people 
So when we're on the phone with a thought leader, um, we are talking about the market, we're talking about their amazing kind of presence in the market, and towards the end of the conversation, we say, please stop me if any of these names sound familiar. So we're getting independent kind of qualitative information on that target candidate who might be number three or number four, but really we're using the telephone as the best way of, uh, of, of on the ground intelligence and most up to date intelligence before these reports go back to a client before they make their decision. So one day we will probably work out the analytics and the data that sits behind this, create an amazing algorithm and then be into kind of predicting coding on how people might perform in their new role at their new firm. Just the same way that you have maybe a uh, uh, a FICO credit score, or you have a, an Uber rating if you travel a lot. We hope that one day you will have a Decipher rating index score if you're a high-performing partner at a law firm. I've got a, I've got a question. So um, is that precisely only evaluation of the personality of the individual, or is there like any professional evaluation as it, well? It's two main strands. It's, it's obviously what they're like as a person, and how do they manage their team, both up and down, how they're perceived in the marketplace. But the other side of the equation, why clients hire us, is getting to resolve around that book of business aspect. How much business will they actually come with, and then how are they gonna integrate with the firm? So it's, it's two strands that go back in terms of a narrative in these reports that go back to a client. So there's precisely a relationship evaluation as well, yes. as in like how much business would that individual bring along with them? Which and sometimes more the easy. firms use this information to negotiate a better level of compensation more favorable to the firm as opposed to the candidate. So again, as, as, as opposed to the candidate wanting X, now that the firm has better intelligence, they're, they're out being offered Y. There's a, there's a delta between the two. Not every, not every partner is being hired for the book of business. Sometimes it's about a potential leadership role. Sometimes it's about a safe pair of hands. So it does vary from assignment to assignment. It's time to have it. Thank you. So Howard, I think we have a lot of mutual contacts. Um, <laughs> A few of these people, uh, I think, have been my internal customers at one time, so uh, it's, it's great to hear those uh, anecdotes. Um, just one, perhaps, counterintuitive thought. Maybe 50% is not so bad. Maybe if you go into, look, I'm not condoning any of the comments, of course, but maybe if you go into an investment strategy thinking that half of the investments you make are going to succeed and half are going to fail, maybe that's okay. Uh, I can certainly say that from my own experience over a long period of time, your numbers seem correct to me. Um, uh, a bit like investments in technology though. It doesn't seem to put us off, does it, the failure rate? Anyway, we have 40 minutes now, everybody. Final break to network, visit the suppliers. Uh, back in here for the final session at 5.30. Thank you very much.
and then we can get. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. I thought I'd done my bit by telling you all to sit at the front and uh, gather around the fireside. Uh, so um, th that person is definitely not uh, Nicholas Pryor, to my knowledge. I'm not, I believe I'm not. it may be somebody called Peter. Yes. So Peter, thank you for chairing without telling me. Um, April and Rachel are also with us. I will leave you all to introduce yourselves and to conduct the session. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, as Joanna kindly pointed out, I'm a substitute for another man <laughs> in this session. <laughs> I think I'm the third choice to chair this one. Um, what I thought we'd do is just introduce ourselves up here, um, and then we'll dive into some questions. But what I'm hoping, because you guys are the survivors, you might be able to help us with some of the, the content for this discussion and just fire some questions at us. And also, we'd love to hear your experience as well because I'm figuring that if you're here to talk about data at this stage, then, then you, you've no doubt got some good experiences yourselves. So, so what I'll do then, I think maybe if I ask my fellow panel members to introduce themselves first, I'll do that, and then I'll ask you guys some questions. Okay. So, April, uh, so I'm April Brousseau. I'm the head of innovation and new business at Simmons & Simmons. Um, I'm on this panel because I have a background uh, which lends itself to data. So I started out in information science, then I did uh, law and I practiced for a while, then I did knowledge management for a while, then I did information architecture for a while, and now I do legal tech and innovation. So, I still can't follow that. <laughs> Hello everybody uh, and well done for staying all the way to the end. Um, so I'm Rachel Manser, I am the Global Head of Knowledge and Learning at Linklaters and I'm also one of our co-heads and founders of our Innovation Efficiency World too. Um, my day job is very varied, I look after all of our knowledge technologies, um, I look after our information and research teams, our learning and development offering, our client knowledge and learning and also now latterly innovation and uh, broadly our PSL population too. <coughs> Um, and I think the reason I'm here is because as part of the um, innovation world, um, I've spearheaded the inclusion of data as, as a key aspect of that. Um, and most recently, and we'll talk about it as we go through the launch of our, our flagship project this year, which is Matter Explorer. And I'm going to come on to explaining what that is. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, my name is Peter Lee. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Wavelength Law. We're a regulated firm of legal engineers. Um, and my background into law is, is a little different. I was a marine biologist to begin with, so I've always been very interested in analytics um, to build hypothesis, uh, hypotheses. And uh, then I became a soldier, I was an army officer, and then I retrained as a technology lawyer in the city and worked for Bird and Bird. And about three years ago, um, with my co-founder Drew Winlaw, we um, developed an idea that we thought was interesting, and that was to try and get people with different skill sets to solve some of the biggest problems in law. And so to that end, we've built Wavelength, which currently is about 30 people and growing. And we are a blend of data scientists, lawyers, design thinkers, and technologists. And our underlying principle, really, is that law is a data and design business, which brings some barristers out in hives. But we think that when we think about law in those terms, suddenly you start unlocking some really interesting potential both in terms of accessing knowledge, greater insights, and new revenue streams. So with that, I'm just going to ask the guys up here if you've got any ideas or any experiences of really bad data projects. Well, so um, <laughs> I, I thought it might be interesting to talk about why data is important and sort of a horror story, and I will encourage you to volunteer yours afterwards as well. <laughs> Um, but um, one of my first sort of data horror stories was uh, implementing a search platform. And because some of the data was tagged incorrectly, one of the top hits when you ran a star search, like a wildcard search, was uh, one of the partner's divorce matters, like their own personal divorce. 
so I knew exactly how much his ex-wife got, like everything was in the file um, because it hadn't been flagged as confidential. You didn't even have to search divorce. It was just coming up. Uh, so it helped to, well, first of all, it created a lot of chaos. Some people said the search engine doesn't work. And I said, it's not the search engine, it's the data. Uh, so that's my horror story. Very good. <laughs> And what about a good one? Rachel, have you, tell us you've got a good one. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I mentioned that we've recently rolled out our Matter Explorer project, which is a significant piece of work, multi-year piece of work that we've done at Link Natives. Um, and um, what we like about it is it's about combining our different data sets. So it's combining for the first time at Link Natives, and perhaps other firms have done this, and I would be keen to know if you have. Uh, combining all of our financial and matter and people information together with our data sets on um, how we've categorized the matters over, over the years, all of our credentials, and also the eBible collection as well. So we've suddenly taken things that were in buckets of data's, data and brought them together such that they're now very, very easily accessible. And the whole point of that and the point of the session is to talk about productivity and how that can really make a difference to a lawyer's everyday life, because that's fundamentally why we do what we do. We want to make the service to the client ever better, whether that's more efficient or even better in terms of quality. Um, right. Can I call upon one of the, you know, ask the audience? <laughs> so just to, to give you an example of why, why does it make people more pr productive, Shilpa is our new uh, head of innovation and, and always wows me with a story. <laughs> Okay, um, so I used to be a lawyer at Linklater's many years ago, and as a fourth seat trainee, um, I was staffed on, a, a, on the Bangalore Airport project deal in India, which was like the first private project, private sector airport project in India. And I was asked to go find the president from another deal, from the head of projects who was on holiday, um, just try and find the concession agreement. Like, like, that's literally all I had to do. Couldn't find the partner. Asked the secretary, secretary was on holiday, got the substitute secretary, give me a list of all the people who worked on that deal. She gave me a list, four people were still in the firm, two had left, couldn't, f I think she spelled their name wrong, couldn't find those people. I, I, without exaggeration, it must have been three weeks, 40 emails, I don't know how many sort of going around trying to find a copy of that concession agreement. And of course I liked, checked in all our various document folders and all the rest of it. And then when Matter Explorer, we were testing it. And this is why I think Rachel makes me tell, because I just get so excited. Um, and I got on and I just searched XYZ Airport. And I got everything. I got all the list of documents. I got all the refinancing documents. I got a list of all the people who'd ever worked on it, including names of people who are still in the firm tag separately. I got um, all the financial information that I would need, so how much we build, when we build, um, recovery information. And then, yeah, then I got a bit excited and then went down a rabbit hole with all the other airport project deals. But it was amazing. I mean, it literally took three weeks. And I kid you not, I don't know how many emails and phone calls and walking around like various people's offices. And this was 30 seconds. Thank you, Shilpa. That's, that's great. It's a, such a good example of enterprise knowledge mapping, actually. How do you get different systems talking to each other and thinking about how the data flows? Um, guys, so April and Rachel, it's really interesting to me that you are both knowledge managers, or that's your, that's your brief. And I'm interested, and I think the audience will be, to understand how you took up the data mandate at your firms and what your thoughts are on analytics, data analytics as well. So should we start with April to start to begin with? Sure. Um, so my route to it was a bit, uh, as my career it sort of started and moved around quite a bit, uh, it ended up being that I, because I was in a knowledge function at my other firms, findability was key. And so in order to find the documents you had to have and the, the data, it had to be categorized and organized correctly. So I spent a lot of time on that. Um, so there was sort of this findability need. Um, and then I, I kind of transitioned roles and there was a lot of LPM work in what I was doing. And so there was also client pressure for insights. And again, it came down to uh, the data. So I then transitioned into an information architecture role for a few years because I had been so frustrated in my experience on both the findability and sort of the insight piece. 
Um, and now uh, in my role in product development, I look at it a little bit differently where I'm not focused so much on leveraging our internal data for findability, knowledge, or insights. There are other people who do that. But I look at ways to reuse it, uh, to sell it, to create products from it. And to that extent, um, I'm, I'm still quite close to the data. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think there's a really close link with KM. If you think about it, data has always been part of KM. If you think about the, the triangle of you've got data, you've got information, you've got knowledge, and you've got wisdom, and it all builds together. And certainly my past life as a lawyer and then a PSL, I spent quite a lot of time with metadata and keyword trees in, in old school days. And so I kind of always instinctively knew the uh, value it, of it. But I was really lucky in my career to meet two people who've been very influential and have educated me. And I guess that's a lesson for us all is to take the time to meet with people who you wouldn't ordinarily. Um, and those are, um, first of all, Orlando Cornetta, who's now at Pinsons. He was at Lynx for a while, and he has some crazy ideas about when document automation was first starting out, about how you might use ontologies and concepts to be able to create new uh, works of what seemed to me magic. Yep. So I learned a lot from him many, many, many years ago, not least because my brain was hurting when I spoke to him. And then secondly, your former colleague, Ben Gardner, um, Ben was with us at Linklaters as a data scientist stuck somewhere in our technology teams um, and he brought his background in science and actually talking to him and him explaining to me how they used data within Pfizer, his previous company, to create the new insights, to, to, to spot the patterns and me explaining to him how we work in law and, and being able to then bring that together so that he taught me about linked data as was well and now which became enterprise knowledge search and he was a big part as Wavelength as part of the, um, the Master Explorer project that we eventually delivered with iManage Raven. Um, so it's about learning. It's also about recognizing how little you, I know. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a lawyer. I don't have as much background as you do. So um, what I've done most recently is to hire somebody into the firm because I think this is really clear. This is a huge area for every organization. And we now have a dedicated senior data, data manager at the firm whose job it will be to look after our data. That's really cool. And yeah. Uh, Dr. Ben Gardner, some of you might, may know him, he was our chief scientific officer for a while. And I, he was really helpful for me as well as a founder, just thinking about law as a data business. And one of the things he used to say to me was, you know, Pete, for 2,000 years, people who are skilled in the law have been really good at assimilating unstructured data in their minds, structuring it in some way, augmenting it with other bits of data, and then delivering advice. The real challenge for the legal sector is how do you scale that now? How do you get it out of people's heads as, as, as we get into an ever more complex world? Mm. And um, you know, it's a great example of someone coming from another sector into the legal space um, and, uh, and, 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 and bringing some of those learnings. He's actually gone back now to AstraZeneca to work with big data sets in pharma again. But, um, and, and the last point on that actually is at Wavelength, we're always looking out on the lookout for new data scientists. And we found a really rich seam of talent. And our lead data architect comes from the publishing sector. And again, publishers, data scientists in the publishing space deal with very large quantities of textual data. And so they have a very good understanding of um, syntax and use of ML tools and, and the like to, to, to read large bodies of textual data, which is interesting. Do we ask the audience on this one? Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in how roles evolve in law firms. Um, have you got people whose, whose roles are dedicated to data in your firms or your organisations? Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, we do. Um, I'm at DWF now, mm -hmm. and one of the striking differences between DLA Piper and DWF is that DWF has got lots and lots of quite similar matters that have got data on them. So it actually feels like, my God, we're in a real business here. Mm. Uh, we can do some analytics. And one of the things that we do at DWF, which I claim no credit, by the way, I, I encountered it and obviously pass it off. But um, we have done so many insurance defense cases that we are able to provide and have monetized a fraud analytics service for our clients because we can spot postcodes, mobile phone numbers, addresses, registration numbers of vehicles, we can connect things together that 
other people perhaps can't. So it's an absolute delight to have some real data. And sorry, just to go on for a moment more. So we do have data scientists. We, we use a product called i2, among other things, for um, large-scale data analytics. And we have a knowledge transfer partnership with Manchester University where we have a PhD data scientist working with us at the moment. And she's developing with us a product which we hope will advise case handlers whether to settle a case. Fantastic. Was there someone else as well? Does that work? Um, I have a much more succinct and I think much less informative answer, but I was going to say only that at Clifford Chance we have some dedicated data scientists. Um, I'm a lawyer by background, and I think one thing that I have found interesting about today is to look at the different professional competences that are now within a law firm. Mm. And I think the challenge for us remains to understand the wishes of clients and what their needs are, and then make sure that the right people internally are involved in something, bearing in mind there can be, dare I say it, a reluctance of partners to give time over to this sort of thing until it's proven. I think that is a theme to which we've come back today, how to get people interested. But we also have um, data science capability within our firm. I think it's in its infancy. Yeah. Um, the big challenge for us, and again, this is something that we've spoken about in different um, conversations today, is confidentiality still. So will we get to the holy grail of get, being able to get to the top of the ladder and look over without bumping up against client terms? And I'm, I'm not persuaded that we've yet cracked that, but if others have, um, I'll buy you a pint in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question and something actually we're going to come on to very shortly. Um, access to talent, I think, is important. And what, I don't know what you guys think, but one of the attractive things for, for me about um, lawyers, especially in the, this jurisdiction, England and Wales, is that you can come to law having done another degree or worked elsewhere. And so my experience recruiting legal engineers and legal designers who have been lawyers is that a lot of them have those innate skills and those desires and passions. They might be very creative or they might be very analytical. And it's just a matter of unlocking that. They've come to the law through the GDL or another route. Um, so most firms will have people with those raw skills um, in, the, in them, which I think is interesting. So did you want to contribute as well? Sorry, we, I, I was... Someone else? Sorry. No, maybe. No. Okay. And I think actually there's a, there's a point on there to build on in terms of looking at the skills our future lawyers need to have. So on tapping, yes. but one of the roles that um, the data manager in our firm is going to have is really identifying well, what sort of data literacy do we need our lawyers and our pe people in our business to be having so that they can be mm. better at their job. And I think that is also a, sh a, a shift and a change. Yeah, I think that's true. So, so moving on to another point, I think, um, you know, arguably, you, you could argue that data analytics has become a more hot topic recently, partly because of the rise of machine learning and AI-based tools um, to extract data or analyze data in different ways. And I'm just wondering in what, what you guys think about that and how much um, those types of tools play into your strategies at work. Uh, shall we start with you this time, Rachel? Um, so our journey on data started well before the AI tools were coming through, but um, I think what's powerful now is to be able to combine, and certainly we, as we've done in the Matter Explorer space, um, technology which combines different data sets, so in our case that's Raven Connect, with technologies that extract data so that you can get some structured data out of the unstructured. Mm. And so for us, the, the power is in combination of different technologies. Um, I think as you were just saying about creating, I think there's definitely a whole new um, stream of work for law firms to consider as to how could they open new revenue opportunities by using tools like this to be able to get to data that they didn't realize they had to start helping clients in new ways. Yep. Um, so I think it's not just about the new technologies, but they're certainly very helpful. And they also raise awareness of what's possible, which is just useful. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I would, I think a lot of us have probably had the example where a client comes to you and says, got a very large document review extraction and remediation exercise. Can you not just AI it? And this sort of assumption that AI is a verb, which it is not, but that you can apply technology to magically resolve 
a, a dirty data set. And it doesn't matter sort of where, what technology you're using, taxonomies and governance are still relevant. So you need to have a search taxonomy to understand what you're trying to find. Um, you need to know, you have to have effective clustering. The tools can't work if the data isn't there um, in, in the way that you know what you're looking for. And so um, that's sort of how it's most recently come up to me, but it's always this misperception or misunderstanding of how much effort is actually involved of a person, particularly up front, they never understand that. That's really helpful. And I, I think, so it, it's clear that, you know, when you're thinking about inputs mm. and outputs, the kind of junk in, junk out analogy applies. And I think this is, this is sometimes overlooked when we talk about data and technologies, but behavioral change and working out how humans interact with these new systems is absolutely critical for project success. And it, this might be something that Shilpa has a view on as well with um, the example you gave earlier. But how have you guys, um, what's your experience, um, maybe good and bad, around behavioral change and ensuring that people uh, interface with these solutions in the right way and make sure that they tag data in the right manner or input it in the right way and at what stage of a matter. Um, April, do you want to go first this time? Yeah, and I don't have sort of a golden answer. So um, at the varying firms that I've worked at, we've tried different solutions. So we've tried, um, you know, making the forms and the taxonomies as simple as possible in order to facilitate easier tagging. Um, I have, I didn't work at this firm, but at home in Canada, there is actually a firm that um, penalizes partners who don't tag their matters monetarily. So if you haven't tagged your matter within 30 days, money comes off the top of your actual take home. Um, now that's a pretty big stick. Um, I have seen um, gamification of matter tagging at some of the US firms where they, you know, who's, you know, classified so many matters, they get a prize and there's a visual and you can see. Um, but I've, my experience, it just tends to be the people who want the data the most are most likely to invest in making sure it's the right data. So I, I, I could, and just to warn you, we're going to ask you whether you've got any great, great ideas about this in a moment, so be thinking. <laughs> um, I don't think there is a magic answer. It comes back to the same principles of, as we've always had within knowledge management, of it's just difficult to get people to do things. The question, how much do you need people to do things now, but which can you in, now use technology to help you? Sort of behavioural change, I think, as you said, visibility of data mm. really helps clean it up. Um, making it easy. So in terms of our Matter Explorer project, we've just built on an existing process. So we haven't changed what people are doing because they were filling in what we call deal announcements forms anyway. Um, but what we have done is make it more relevant and more useful. So the technology now um, is sensitive enough to know it's this type of matter, so these are the kinds of questions, this is the kind of data I want to get out of you in relation to that kind of a matter. We're just evolving and building on what people do anyway, which I think helps. Um, I do like the idea of whether we can have some sort of reward based on data quality. I, I think it was yesterday, um, I don't know if many of you are here, but one of the clients was saying that they penalise their law firms if the, the data they're getting in relation to billing isn't up to speed. So I thought that's actually quite an interesting incentive. Mm. Um, and then back to data governance, I suppose, by putting this, this new role in the firm, being really clear what the master data sets are, who owns them, what lifecycle management looks like. So you're kind of getting it from a structural and policy perspective as well as trying to incentivize. I don't think there is a perfect answer, but I'm sure that one of you will tell us that there's something good that you can recommend or things to avoid. Any ideas? Yeah, I wonder if, we, if, if there's anyone in the audience that's got any immediate thoughts about that around behavioral change. And um, to, me it's a, to me, it's about legal design. But yeah, Daniel. I'll, I'll, offer, I'll offer two. They, again, come from our insurance practice. Well, no, one comes from our insurance practice, the other one doesn't. Um, we win and lose clients based on whether we provide the right... MI is such a horrible term, but mm. it's still called that in the insurance industry. Uh, so we know that we're going to lose a client if our MI is not good enough, and we win clients on the basis of it being good. Fortunately, insurance companies' hurdles for good enough are quite low still. Um, that has... As we all know, if a client wants something, it happens in the law firm. Unless a client wants it, it very rarely does. So the client demanding it is uh, a key thing. Another one is just a little bit of gamification and exposure outside of insurance. It's not really to do with data, but it's the same principle. 
we're a big document automation shop. We have a product called DDRF Draft, which mm-hmm. is based on one of the well-known products. Um, for every document type that has been automated, um, a report is run each month to identify which documents of this type have been prepared and have they used the automated template. And there is a league table published of transgressors, uh, which is read by senior people in the firm and does have a pleasing impact on compliance, shall we say. <laughs> we, we have a league table the opposite way of people who have filled in the two hours. Well. <laughs> but still. A shorter list, I guess. <laughs> was, was there someone else back there that wanted to... Yep. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, Ian Rogers from I Manage Raven. Um, oh, okay. I'm very. Ha- I've never actually heard that story before. So, um, mm-hmm. thank you very much. Uh, you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna um, make a lot of people um, very happy. Um, and I can also, I suppose, answer something across the data, data scientist side mm. because I see a little bit more of the market, and. A lot of firms now do have have data scientists. I'm coming into contact with them more and more. I guess there's a my my background is I was an associate at A and O for five years, um, and so I come from a kind of fee earning background. Mm-hmm. I feel there's a little bit of a cultural change needed around seeing support data scientists those type of um, roles as you know I, I can't think of a of a better phrase than second class citizens. I think there's a lot of, yeah. uh, there's a kind of a, a view that the fee earners are, 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 are the first class citizens and everyone else kind of s- sits behind that. And in a world in which you need cross-functional collaboration, you need to bring together more um, roles than were previously mm. uh, necessary. And I think behavioral change 101 is to kind of change that, that view internally. Yeah, and I, I think the last the last point on that for me is we we've done like maybe three or four projects in the last twelve months with big blue chip in house teams, uh, redesigning front legal front doors and workflows for them. And the, when I mentioned earlier, for me, although at the core of it is a technology and it's that you could say it's a data project, actually the success or not of it is all around legal design or design, frankly, um, and. Uh, Especially when you can, if you can incentivize people to input data in the right way because they see the benefits, not just in the legal team, but also on the business side as well. So if your salespeople are requesting legal work to an in-house legal department and they're at the point of request, they're putting in the, the deal value, the jurisdiction, the product type, all that sort of information, and that's captured in a sympathetic way, and they see the value of that because it speeds it up in the legal department, they get their answer back quicker. That's immensely powerful. And it just builds into the data strategy across those, those corporate departments. And the rise of clock and legal operations is, is driving that in our world. So, yeah. So anyway, I wanna go back to a point that was raised earlier, which is around um, confidentiality. Because I think this is really interesting. Um, and it's, it's a really a question I don't think there is a hard and fast answer to this, but I want to raise it as a point, point of discussion. But do you guys have an established position around how you balance data-driven insights against clients' natural reluctance to offer up their data for the greater good? Um, and yeah, Rachel, do you want to go first on this one? I don't think there is an easy answer. It's, it's always going to be a tension there. Um, the, the simple answer is that risk is my best friend. <laughs> we work really closely with our risk department all the way through, so anything that we're doing we are totally aligned on. Um, it may mean that things take a little bit longer, it may mean that we, it's more cost involved, but I would rather be on the right side of that than not. Um, certainly when we're looking at our data governance approach, it's a, a joint initiative between our, us within the knowledge and learning world and our, our, our risk colleagues. Um, and every step in terms of the projects that we do is completely built into all the security systems that we have. So everything is, is aligned and joined up. And I think that's just the world we're, we're in. And we're trying to future proof so when we build them, if, you know, if things become more closed down, that we can switch if, as needed. Um, and you'd like to think that as technology gets better, that those sorts of things might go away a little bit because the more you can mask client information or confident any information that possibly shouldn't be out there it just gets straight to a particular clause so be it we're not I don't think there yet mm-hmm. um, 
but then balance that against context being so very important and making sure that you still have that context. As I said, there isn't an easy answer, but um, risk yeah. the best friend. Um, yeah, I, and I, I don't have a better example. So in my last role as an information architect, I reported jointly to the CTO and to the global head of risk and compliance because I was dealing with large data sets across the Swiss Verein. Um, I would say that one thing I, I do, did find really helpful was having a legal background. So um, being able to understand what is privilege and you know what is confidential. Um, and what does that mean it, from a legal perspective when analyzing data? It was much easier to have a sensible conversation. Um, I find that sometimes if you end up with a compliance lawyer talking to a very technical data science, they cannot understand each other because they don't appreciate, you know, on the one hand, why it's so difficult to hide the data and on the other, or, you know, mask the data, and on the other hand, why you need to, like, why can't you share it? So. Um, having that sort of bridge is helpful, but never figured out the e an easy way to do it. Is there any is there any thoughts from the from the audience on this this one? Because this is a really nutty topic. I don't know how Clifford Chance uh, have been thinking about it. Clearly, been giving it some thoughts. So on, great, thank you. Um, so we started to grapple with this uh, good two years ago, if not earlier, um, quite a similar approach uh, to the one that Rachel has outlined. You have to collaborate and get on side risk, otherwise you don't get very far. Yeah. It is a frustration, part of the reason why clients come to you is because you see whole of market on jobs, and at the same time you will find in their client terms a restriction that says you have to, I mean I understand it, um, an observation may be, ultimately you have to trust your lawyers who have professional training and professional obligations and trust that they know what they are doing. But that said, we have to have, I think a lot of firms have now taken uh, demonstrable steps to show to clients when they come in and audit, this stuff is locked down and these are the people and only these people can get to it. And if that slows things down, so be it. That is now the world in which we live. But again, no... It's interesting to hear people say AI is going to fix this. My perception is that it has not. And at the moment, it actually possibly cannot. But that may be a um, slightly provocative way to end. I think, I think uh, so a quick observation for me is that when you work with, is, you know, when you work a business like ours, you work with law firms and in-house teams or corporates. When you're inside a corporate, you can have a different risk view on your data sometimes. And um, you know the classic question that, that often comes up is, we want to create a data lake based on the data that we've been collecting under these contracts for 30 years because we can squeeze some more revenue and build some new models out of it. Question to the head of legal, can we do this under the contracts that we've got in place over the last 30 odd years? That's a really hard question for the head of legal because there might be hundreds of thousands of contracts there. But um, you know the way the way that some of them do it is to look at trends at a higher level of abstraction rather than um, you know if you were to, if you were to look at what's you know the classic question what's market for an indemnity clause maybe raising it up to a different level of abstraction and looking for, for for trends across the market and the reason I say that is because I think that this is one area where you the new the new law companies and the alternative legal service providers um, might steal the march on traditional law firms because they might have a different level of risk. Even if all types of all these organisations you, you'd assume would be approaching this in a legally in a legal way, I think that for the same reasons that some client partners feel very uncomfortable about asking their client if they can if a firm can use its logo in marketing or name drop a case study. Um, it's, it's not that's not illegal and it's sometimes it's not a problem with client confidentiality it's just a cultural thing and a, and a nervousness and f well-funded international businesses that aren't regulated in the same way or have a different mindset might still I think may steal the march in this in this area potentially I don't know what you guys think no I'm not. maybe who knows? Who knows? What I think, yeah. Holds. And I mean, I think for a law firm, that's one thing. Uh, it's extra bad if you breach data, like if you breach client confidentiality as you are a legal firm advising on, you know, these things. So if you actually get in trouble, it's extra bad. Yeah. 
Yes. Sorry, I'm not as far into data as the rest of you, but these conversations have been happening around knowledge management for quite a while, haven't exactly. they? So um, I think this whole business about access, um, there's a couple of sessions coming up. I think one... I'm not sure it's on. Thanks. Um, one with the Society for Computers and Law mm -hmm. um, coming up on the 18th of June. And I think Three Kites Consulting are going to carry on the conversation. So this is all around knowledge management, but I suspect the conversation is going to be the same around data. So we have a starting point whereby we're regulated law firms, most of us. So we have our SRA duties. We raise awareness of confidentiality. We train everybody because it's not just the lawyers in our firms, is it? It's everyone. So I think we've kind of got our heads around the fact that confidentiality is an issue. Um, we feel quite strongly that for our clients' sake, as well as our own, we need to be able to rely on the firm's knowledge. It's, it's our intellectual capital. I mean, why would you pay over £400 an hour for advice if someone was reinventing the wheel? I mean, why would you? So we have that conversation with our clients. Um, we have a starting point in our engagement letter. The clients are clear in the engagement letters that we are going to use a certain amount of knowledge and data. And effectively, they're being asked to opt out. Now, if they, ask, if they do want to opt out, we will talk to them. We'll talk to them about consequences and the bigger picture. But clearly, there are requirements for some clients, market sensitivity and defence. Obviously, I mean, we all understand that. But I don't think it's in anyone's interest to mark, master that conversation with the clients. We, we need to have a brave conversation about um, the benefits that they will find if we can share and use knowledge and data within reason. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I was going to mention is that we did our ISO 27001 information security um, certification last year and uh, talked quite a lot to the consultants and to the auditor about what they thought about lockdown. Um, they laughed quite a lot at the idea that any degree of lockdown within a law firm could do anything in terms of our cyber risk. It can't. If we're hacked, we're in trouble. It doesn't matter what access limitations we've got. Um, and they were really quite clear with us that if we could show that we were managing our risk around confidentiality, around data and knowledge by doing other things, and in our case it's awareness raising, it's vetting, re-vetting people, that sort of thing, then that was a fair position to be taking. So I don't want to kind of jump down the um, alley of everything being locked down. I had quite a few words at the iManage conference the week before last about the idea that all UK firms are locking down because I don't think that has been a decision we've made yet, but it's absolutely as relevant to the data questions as it is to knowledge and I think we should all engage fairly vigorously. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. I think we're nearly out of time. Any questions? So yeah, if, finally, if there's, if there's any final questions, yes sir. In the middle. Thank you. Um, by the way, uh, a, a very, very great and informative two days, and this has been particularly useful at the very end. Um, I don't have the answers to this, but I, I, I speak with a lot of very interesting experiences. Um, at the end of the day, um, everyone is in the business to survive. You need willing buyers and willing sellers and there's lots of things happening. And I think everyone would agree that the legal market is incredibly disrupted at the moment or capable of being disrupted. And many people will go out of business. Other people will survive and get stronger. <coughs> but just the premise of this, having stuff on premise, everyone I think would agree is expensive because you need people and real estate, which are your two biggest costs. And there's an extra will move to the cloud. Um, would it be fair to say that the strongest players, whoever they may be, are in the long run, even if they don't realise it now, trying to get to a point where there is effectively one highly secure cloud, um, for example, I manage, but it could be a range of people, and what we may end up getting to is a point where, in fact, you can't actually provide legal services unless you use that cloud because all the big law f all the big firms whoever they are and all the big clients will demand that, that everything is in one or two three clouds if that is the case it's both interesting but it also has all sorts of implications for competition and the like and i would put it to various people around there that there's a lot of very interesting stuff happening so if i give you an example We've got our two law firms here, 
um, acting for a, so we've got a lender and a buyer, two major law firms, and we've got two clients. Who, for example, owns the document? Arguably, only one of you. Does that mean that the other three of you can't actually use the document to data mine and do all these wonderful things? And there's lots of very interesting questions around, can we actually do any of this at all? But I'd put it to a lot of people that, that we may end up getting to a situation where an awful lot of people are actually um, not able to compete because they aren't able to be part of a highly secure cloud because that's actually where we're going. And I think many of these big firms are doing some really, really clever things, even if they may not realize they're doing it. And this is about survival. It's not about necessarily, um, you know, the here and now. Um, but those are just thoughts of 30 odd years of being in and around law. I don't know whether others would agree. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, I, th I think I think I mean we're out of time, but my view is that um, consolidation is is pretty inevitable. I mean, you look at the big infrastructure as a service providers like AWS and others. Um, you know. I, th I think I think that's inevitable, and I think the the trick is how the likes of iManage and others compartmentalise their offering in such a way that it complies. Yeah, please. What, what percent of your knowledge base is sequestered and not available? Would you say? Sequestered in terms of not available to the rest of the firm, or? Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's locked down as the word the verb you've been using, not sequestered, but you know, it's considered because confidential or privileged. Or confidential, it's, it's, yeah. So it's. That's okay, it's available to three people, but it's not available to the firm as know-how and knowledge. What percent of that? Differentiated question, because there's, so there's various parts of the firm that can't access all of our matter folders anyway, so it's sort of split already between people who are who need to be able to access them and those who don't, so that's kind of already. And in terms of what's available through this new system, again, it's a subset thereof that is searchable. Um, so it's probably a differentiated answer to your yeah. question. <laughs> Similar experience, so uh, this firm and the last firm had a very similar approach. So the people who needed to access it tended to be the lawyers. Certain business services staff didn't need access to it, don't have access to it. So that was our version of lockdown. And then, you know, after that, it was just walls. April and Rachel, thank you very much for your insights. And thank you for participating, everybody. That was a Thanks I for really sticking around. That. Thank, thank you for stopping. Over, over to you, Danny. <laughs> So everybody, we're now into the final phase of the day. This is the closing keynote speech from me, which will be approximately 45 minutes in length. <laughs> uh, I've spent weeks preparing it, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Uh, if you could just reset all the train time searches that you've been doing to 7.30, that would be great. <laughs> um, no, clearly, I'm not going to make any comments at all. I'm going to get you out of here. Um, one, one thing that Cosmonauts did not actually publicize before this was that um, they are following the example of uh, a, a news story that you may have seen earlier this week where an American billionaire was invited to give the commencement address, which of course is the opposite of what it sounds like. It's the graduation address, I believe, it might not be, uh, to a, a graduating class at a, uh, an American college of undergrads. And he, in fact, declared in his commencement address that he would be paying off the student loans of all of the individuals who attended the commencement address. Now, cosmonauts have agreed to pay off everybody's credit card bills who've <laughs> remained until this stage. So if you just provide the information to <laughs> Timo, he will be delighted to help you. If you don't have a big enough credit card bill, come and talk to me. I can find one. Um, anyway, no, that's it. Um, get out of here. How the hell you've lasted the day, I don't know. I think it's been a fantastic day, uh, a wonderful conference, third day of the conference. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you wish to give yourselves a round of applause, please do so. Otherwise, pack up and go. Thank you very much. <laughs>